Thank you, everybody. Sorry for just a short break, but uh, still got a full afternoon. Recording in progress. Okay, with that, then uh, we'll bring the board back into session and I'll turn to the clerk to uh, hold the roll to establish a quorum and we'll go to our next item. Okay, um, Supervisors Frost. Here. Kennedy. Here. Desmond. Here. Cerna. Here. Natoli. Here. And you have a quorum. Great. Okay, for your first item uh, back, this is item 56. This is the 2022 federal and state legislative priorities. Okay. I think there's going to be, I don't know if Ann's going to make any comments, but uh, I know Natasha Drain's going to be carrying this item, so I'll turn to either one or both of them. So. Hey, Supervisor, this is Natasha. Go ahead. Good Excellent. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. I'm Natasha Drain, your governmental relations and legislative officer. As part of this workshop, I've invited our state lobbyist, Audrey Ratajczyk, with Crew Strategies, to provide a presentation on our achievements last year to touch on what we see coming in 2022 and to know any late breaking information for you. Following Audrey's presentation, I also have a PowerPoint uh, that will touch on the high points of the legislative priorities. And after my presentation, of course, I hope to hear from you. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Audrey. I see my PowerPoint flow. Could you change it to the other PowerPoint? My apologies for the confusion. Metro Cable, can you please change the PowerPoint? Perfect, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? We can, go ahead, Audrey. Oh, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I don't see my video on, but if it's able to turn on, I am here, but otherwise um, via voice. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, Audrey Ratajczyk from Cruise Strategies, the county state lobbyist. Um, we had a very busy 2021 legislative session um, last year that resulted in a number of wins for the county that we were really excited about. Um, so in this quick presentation, I wanted to outline some of the major policy and budget issues that were addressed by the legislature in general last year. Um, second, I wanted to highlight the specific county priorities and successes that we had. And then lastly, provide a brief overview into the issues we're already seeing come up in the 2022 session, although only a weekend, but a lot's already happening. And then what we expect to see come out um, up throughout the year and on the ballot through the initiative process um, in November. So just in terms of the 2021 year last year, the general legislative um, items and budget issues, you can go to the next slide, please. <coughs> um, so first, uh, at the request of our county coroner, Kim Jin, we worked very hard last year to secure a million dollars in funding for the county coroner statewide to be able to train together in how to deal with mass fatality events. Um, this came out of one of our department meetings last year that we had with Ms. Jin. Um, and right now, um, law enforcement and fire personnel have the ability to train together for mass fatality events, but um, the coroners were not included in training. So um, we worked closely with the coroners association and others um, and ultimately got the million dollars included in the budget. So we were super excited about that. Um, it included securing a legislative champion. So Assembly Member Cooper carried the budget request last year. And we had countless meetings with Cal OES, Department of Finance, Budget Committees, the Governor's Office, et cetera. Um, and we're really excited that that was included and something that um, Cal OES has been working on closely with the coroners to get that funding out so that it can be um, very useful. Um, the second item was sideshow budget request funding that we had worked on with Supervisor Desmond and Supervisor Frost. Um, originally, we had talked about a $2 million request to go to the Office of Traffic Safety to help fund some, a task force to prevent and end sideshows. Um, once we had further conversations with traffic safety, they only get out federal grants um, and they don't know how, they don't have systems set up to be able to do state grants and it would be really costly to be able to set that up just to get out this funding. So we shifted and um, talked to CHP and um, they really liked the idea and something that it could flow through them to be able to develop this task force. Um, ultimately, it was not included in last year's budget but um, assuming that it's still a board priority this year after you approve the priorities today, and um, we've already kind of laid some of that groundwork to potentially bring this request back next year, and I think we'll be able to be successful this year. 
Um, we've already talked with Assemblymember Cooper and also Senator Dolly, and both have agreed that they would love to submit the request. Um, and CHP has been doing a lot in this space right now. So I think it's really timely um, because with COVID and everything, side shows have been getting more frequent and dangerous. So um, I think the time is right that we would be able to get that done this year. And then just in terms of other more general stuff that was impactful to the county that was in the budget last year, um, as you've heard, there it was the second year that a number of criminal justice fines and fees were proposed to be removed. So the original proposal had proposed to remove 67 different criminal justice fines and fees, and it did not include a backfill to counties um, to provide a backfill of funding for the services that we provide that are associated with those fees. So we worked really closely with CSAC and with the urban counties of California um, to push back on that to limit it. So it was limited to only 17 fees that were removed um, and also to provide a backfill for those services. Um, and ultimately, it'll be $15 million ongoing to counties, although not um, probably as much as it, as it could um, have been, but at least it was a step in the right direction and provided us some funding. So I think that remains to be seen of, of if there'll need to be more funding provided. But the allocation methodology is, methodology is supposed to come out by March. So we're continuing to watch for that. And then there was also Project Home Key funding of 1.45 billion last year and also 150 million for Project Room Key. And then lots of Delta levy funding. So we worked closely with Supervisor Natoli and with the Delta Counties Coalition, there was $104 million in bond funds for local assistance to support Delta levies. And then more specific to the Delta, we also um, were a part of a $12 million budget request that Assembly Member Fraser submitted um, to help remove abandoned and derelict vessels from the Delta which um, Natasha will get into in more detail in um, her presentation about our potential sponsored bill and budget request this year. Um, but last year, the $12 million was included in the budget. And then um, also in the budget last year, we worked closely with the Waste Department, with Doug and Kelly and others. There was um, $60 million included to provide grants to local jurisdictions to help um, implement the 1383 Organics Waste Regulations. So Cal Recycle is still um, working on getting out that funding, but we're watching it closely and um, hope that it's something that the county will be able to take a part of and, and get some of that funding because I know they're working really hard to get 1383 up and going. And then, as you all know, there was the $6 billion, the big broadband package um, that CSAC kind of led the effort on and that got done last year. Um, and then also look, local public health funding. Um, last year, there was 300 million that was committed in the budget, but it would start this year. And then um, we were really excited about that. And then the governor in his budget yesterday also proposed additional funding to local public health jurisdictions in this year's budget. So that would supplement that from last time. Um, and then last year in the May revise, the budget had proposed to um, halt admissions of county LPS conservatives at state hospitals. The goal was to clear beds for felony IST individuals that were on the wait list. But ultimately, this result would have sent the ill LPS conservatives back to counties and not provide us the assistance to create local placements for these really complex cases. Um, and so we worked closely with Ryan and Behavioral Health Department and Senator Pan's office to be able to push back on that to make sure that if it, something like that were to happen, we'd have the resources. But ultimately, the final budget didn't include the halt of LPS admissions. So that was good for the county as well. Um, and then child support. The budget agreement um, had uh, restored funding for local child support agencies, which is something we supported with the Child Support Directors Association. And then lastly on budget, the climate resilience funding. As you all know, the bond, the two bond efforts didn't move forward last year, but that was because the legislature had the surplus and so they wanted to do the $15 billion climate package um, to get out some of that one-time funding instead of doing the bonds. So we had worked with both of the bond authors to get a direct allocation to the Lower American River Conservancy in both the bonds. But since they didn't end up moving forward, we um, worked with McCarty's office to get a direct allocation in the budget for the conservancy. Um, ultimately, we were a part of those discussions in helping get that done. Ultimately in the budget, it showed that it go to the city of Sacramento, but we're working closely with Liz and Parks and um, with McCarty's office to um, make sure that it benefits the county as well. And um, next slide, please. And then just um, these will be really quick, just in terms of more broad legislative items that happened last year. Brown Act legislation was obviously a huge deal with AB 361, allowing Board of Supervisors, as you're doing right now, to continue to operate remotely, which was needed for the pandemic. Um, and then there was two vaccine mandate related proposals last year. 
they ultimately didn't move forward, but I just wanted to flag it because it's something that will likely be coming back this year that we'll want to watch. One proposal was just about employers and how that they would be able to require employees to have the vaccine. And if they didn't have it, what testing and stuff would look like. Um, and then the other one went a little bit further to, to um, include that, but also patrons attending certain industries would have to be vaccinated before entering. So um, both of those, it was a big discussion with business labor and other groups that will continue to be worked on, but um, likely something that we'll see coming back next year or this year, I should say now. Um, and then the AB 988 crisis line was another bill that we were engaged on closely with Bruce and Ryan and others. And um, it would have created alternative um, to 911 for mental health crises. You instead call 988. Um, ultimately, the, the bill that would have um, implemented this last year didn't move forward. The, that proposal had a fee, a, a telco fee on um, user cell phone bills. So I think that might have been the sticking point and ultimately it didn't move forward last year. Um, but this year in the governor's budget yesterday, he already said that um, Health and Human Services Agency is developing a plan to support connections to for prevention efforts like hotlines, the 988 Mental Health Crisis Center, and connecting those with the mobile crisis response teams at the local level. Um, and last year, or this year in his budget yesterday, he also included 7.5 million general fund with 6 million of it ongoing to OES to advance implementation of 988. So something that we'll wanna see um, how that money flows through OES and how we might be able to um, work closely to get that done. And then last year, there was $2 billion in aid to counties, large cities and continuums of care for the HAP program. Um, and then there was a larger kind of $12 billion homelessness package. Um, this year, the governor um, in his budget that he just released yesterday had $2 billion for homelessness. 0.5 billion of that was um, for tiny homes and getting up more temporary housing. Um, and then the other 500 million um, is for um, cleaning up encampments and that would be through grants um, to local governments. So that's something we'll wanna be really closely engaged on with the governor's office and also, also with CSAC and UCC um, to see how that funding gets out. And then also last year, there was the police reform legislation. Um, there was a number of bills, but SB2 Bradford, the peace officer decertification, and then um, some police use of force legislation that was signed. Um, so I think that's just um, an issue to watch that will likely come back in 2022 as well. And then the last one that I wanted to mention was bail reform. Um, that one didn't end up moving forward at the end of session. SB 262 um, was the Hertzberg bill that would have adopted a statewide bail schedule. Ultimately, it would have been the zero bail bill, um, but it didn't move forward at the very end of session. It was on the assembly floor. It got moved to inactive. So um, that's one to watch because he's already said that he wants to bring that back this year. So um, another one to see in 2022. And next slide, please. Um, and then just a quick note on some of the successes that we had last year. I already mentioned the corner funding um, and then sideshow funding that we will hopefully be able to get done this year. Um, another big issue was the Sacramento and Solano, what we're calling the Kaiser Carbon. Um, the governor's May revise budget proposal last year, it included the transfer of Medi-Cal specialty mental health services from Kaiser and would transfer those patients to the county mental health plans. Um, it's only affects Sacramento and Solano counties, and it would align the system of care just be in those two because the other counties already do it the other way. Um, our team was concerned about this, not necessarily for taking on the patients at all, but just because of the timeline and the resources that were going to be provided, given the discrepancy in the population that we thought this would cover. So the numbers that we had versus Kaiser and Department of Healthcare Services were all very different. So we just wanted to make sure mm -hmm that we're all on the same page here so that this could be a successful transfer to make sure that these patients, that their services are not interrupted and that we can do a good job. So we worked really closely with the county's legislative delegation um, to push back and make sure we had the time and resources needed to make it successful. We coordinated a delegation briefing, did a letter to DHCS and Senator Pan weighed in on our behalf. And then ultimately the budget trailer bill language, it included a number of conditions that would have to be met before the transfer can occur which gave us an additional 12 months. So um, that was exciting and we're continuing to work on it. It's an ongoing thing, but um, there are weekly calls with DHCS and Kaiser. So um, we'll continue to keep you posted on that. And then SB 226 by Senator Pan was our county sponsored bill, which was signed by the governor last year, which was really exciting. It would codify an agreement that the county has with DHCS to negotiate with our designated health plans. Um, so that was good news. 
And then AB 821 by Assembly Member Cooper was um, some uh, sponsored kind of supported bill from the county on sexually violent predator placement, specifically when um, an individual committed their crime somewhere else and then they're being placed in their non-domicile county. So for example, they commit their crime in Monterey, but then they're getting placed in um, Sacramento. Our bill would have provided more transparency to local DAs in um, knowing how that placement happened. And so we'd be able um, why they're being placed here and, and have more information um, when that decision is happening. Ultimately, the bill didn't move forward because of concerns from the Assembly Public Safety Committee, um, but we've been continuing to work on this over the fall. And again, um, assuming it's still a board priority after today and when you approve the priorities shortly um, or with any changes, um, we, we've already started to lay the groundwork to move something forward um, this year as well. Assemblymember Cooper is the chair of the Select Committee on Law Enforcement and Community Relations. So he has um, agreed to do an oversight and informational hearing um, in the next two months to um, bring light to the issue where we would have the DA's office and others go through their concerns with the placement process um, and then and the information that they receive. And so we could kind of see what comes out of that hearing. And then if we need potential legislation, we would have a vehicle to do that as well. But the first step would ideally be the oversight and informational hearing. Um, and then the climate resilience bonds, I already mentioned, um, but we were able to get the direct allocation to the Lower American River Conservancy. And then the last one I wanted to mention was a waste management legislation that we'd worked on closely. Um, SB 619 would delay enforcement and add support for counties when implementing the 1383 organics waste provisions. Um, the bill was amended at like the last two nights of session and we were really concerned with one of the self hauling provisions, but we worked with our delegation and were able to get that removed and then ended up supporting the bill and then it passed. So we were excited about that. And then lastly was AB 332 that um, dealt with the safe and proper handling of treated wood waste, which was a concern um, with Department of um, Toxic Safety and um, the sunset date for um, how we were able to treat treated wood waste. But that bill, we worked on closely with the coalition and were able to get that passed and signed by the governor as well. And next slide, please. And then the last one is just 2022 look ahead. Um, some of these I've already mentioned throughout the presentation, but um, as you know, there's the budget surplus and the governor put out his um, January budget yesterday with the money for homelessness. He had an additional 2 billion for housing um, he also had the single payer health care. Um, he didn't directly have that in the budget, but he wants to expand Medi-Cal to um, all undocumented um, folks in the state. So that part was part of his proposal. And then he also has said that he'll want to work on single payer health care with the legislature. And Assembly Member Ash Kalra already has AB 1400, which I think was already heard in committee today. And they're trying to move quick on that as well. So that'll be another issue we'll see this year. Again, the vaccine mandate legislation will be coming back. Um, the governor had already wanted to do early action on the COVID recovery stuff. So increased funding for pop-up testing sites for vaccine, um, getting more vaccines out. So we'll expect to see budget funding and some legislation on that. Um, transportation funding will likely see, as you recall last year, transportation funding didn't end up um, making it in the budget. They needed an additional um, trailer bill to get done um, in order for that money to get out, and it didn't get done before the end of session. So all the $4 billion for active transportation and inner city rail capital program, all of that got reverted back to the general fund. Um, and so they all need to come together with a package with the legislature and governor's office this year to be able to get that funding out. The governor proposed yesterday in his budget, I think it was $9 billion for transportation. Um, but a lot of that was going to high-speed rail, so there could be some potential sticking points with the legislature there that we will want to keep an eye on. And then housing and homelessness are always important. Um, wildfires, there was a lot of climate and drought funding already included in the governor's budget yesterday, and then we'll likely see bail reform back as well. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention the ballot initiatives. A lot of them are in the very early stages, but just because there's so many broad topics um, to keep our eye out for, their split role, um, a potential water financing measure that could provide funding to water infrastructure projects, um, mushroom legalization. There was three different sports gambling proposals that are already um, uh, being circulated and some of that funding would go to housing or to homelessness services. Um, and then there's another one that I didn't list on here, but would um, undo three strikes law and allow resentencing of those individuals. So Many of those, again, are in the early stages, still need to collect signatures, but I just wanted to mention it because a lot of big issues will be coming up in 2022.
Um, and then with that, I will, or any questions, or I'll um, kick it back to Natasha for her um, follow up on the specific um, priorities and our proposed um, budget proposal. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Went through a lot of material uh, very rapidly, and thank mm -hmm. you for the the uh, good recap. But we do have a hand up, uh, Supervisor Frost. Hi, Audrey. Thank you for that um, overview. I was wondering if any of these have numbers or have, are assigned numbers yet, or is it too early? For the ballot initiatives? Yeah. Yeah, uh, many of them do. I think there's only like four that total that have qualified, but um, a lot of them are already getting their title and summary um, and are being circulated. So on the Attorney General's website, they are all listed with language, um, and then some are already, most of them are already being circulated um, once they receive title and summary. I'm interested in the vaccine mandate legislation and the COVID-19 recovery um, in particular. I don't know if you know the numbers. on. Yeah, that. so the vaccine mandate legislation, um, last year there were two proposals and they actually never got introduced. They were just circulated and there was bill language, um, but there are no bill numbers for those yet. And they've only been in session this week, as you know, so um, there's been probably 100 bills introduced and they're, um, the vaccine proposals are not in there yet. So I just I suspect we'll see it over the next month or so as bills are introduced, but no bill numbers yet. Okay. And then for the COVID funding, um, that was proposed in the governor's budget, and he is hoping that they'll take early action on that. So um, I can forward you the summary of that, but no bill number. That's just going to be a budget item. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Audrey, um, I don't see any other um, hands up. Just a quick question for you back to the legislation that uh, Assemblyman Cooper had um, entered in as related to the um, SBP placement. What was the opposition in the health committee? Um, it was in Assembly Public Safety. And I oh, think they safety. had the concerns is just that uh, the overarching concern that we received from the committee chair was that it's already so hard to place someone um, was their argument. So they any sort of additional burdens on um, placing someone, they didn't want to make anything harder because they already have such a hard time finding a placement, given that you have to be this many miles from a school, from a library, et cetera. Um, their kind of just overarching argument was anything making it more difficult um, is a concern. So um, something that we'll have to work through, but I feel like our bill didn't necessarily make it more difficult. We just wanted to get some of the yeah. um, information up front so that we would be able to make informed decisions when we go to rebut these hearings in court, you know, so. Right, right. That's, I'm just curious um, who might be the ones that would be opposing the legislation to be more transparent and more, um, I think, up front with the counties and communities where they're seeking to place them so all right thanks for that any other questions by board members if not we'll go back to natasha thank you audrey um no i don't see unless sue oh sue i'm sorry supervisor frost yes i'm sorry uh yeah i was just going to ask were there two public education initiatives um i think there's only one being proposed so far there was also a um a legislative school bond proposal that was moving forward last year um, it is potentially still moving this year, but again, they're very cautious about doing any bonds right now, given the state surplus. So the governor did propose some school infrastructure financing funding in his budget, but it was only like $1.2 billion, whereas the um, bond proposal would have been $10 billion. So the legislature and governor will continue to be seen of, of how that works out. But um, yeah, the, the governor wanted to do one-time funding, I think, instead of the bond. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay, anything else? All right, if not, then thank you once again, Audrey and Natasha, back to you. Thank you, Supervisor. We could go to the other PowerPoint. And maybe while they're doing that, I just wanna note that um, Audrey mentioned action today. Again, this is a workshop for you today. We're hoping to hear from you and we'll bring back a set of proposed priorities uh, for your approval or consideration at a future board date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also note that I'm not going to go over every proposed change in the 2022 federal and state priorities today. Most substantive changes are made at the request of a county department because they recognize a need that can be addressed legislatively and believe that the board's positioning on the issue is important. All of the proposed changes are shown in attachment one. Um, this is the red line version. 
and attachment two is the clean version of this document. Uh, the board letter also contains a table that explains the reason for each substantive change. So today I want to focus on pages four and five because these pages are essentially new to this document and are intended to help us identify and prioritize pressing issues in Sacramento County. Next slide. Now, this presentation covers the purpose of the legislative priorities, proposed key board actions and advocacy priorities, a sponsored bill proposal, and five proposed state budget requests. And we'll also talk about next steps as well. Next slide. The legislative priorities do several things. They establish the priorities, principles, and policy statements of the Board of Supervisors. Secondly, they create the basis for advocacy efforts, alerting stakeholders to the county's greatest needs. And third, they provide staff and interested partners guidance on the board's positions on key policy matters, which essentially means providing guidance to my office, governmental relations, the governmental relations and legislative office on how to engage on policy issues that arise at the federal and state levels. Next slide. As I developed a set of key advocacy priorities for your consideration, I looked to some of the issues this board has prioritized over time. I listed these actions on page four, setting the context for my recommendations. They're also listed here on the slide. I think it's important to note here that while I have identified a set of key advocacy priorities to provide greater focus, these priorities, of course, do not limit my ability to weigh in on other issues that may arise in 2022 and, of course, are consistent with this document. So um, first, uh, the board has prioritized Bay Delta activities, has prioritized declaring racism a public health crisis, declaring a climate emergency, um, has also prioritized some budget priorities, including addressing homelessness and related issues of mental health and substance abuse, as well as improving the condition of streets and roads. And then also last year, the board had directed our office to, as Audrey noted, work on the issue of placing sexually violent predators in Sacramento County. And also, um, as again, as she mentioned, the issue of uh, dangerous sideshows, which essentially means illegal street racing. So looking to these actions, I developed a set of key advocacy priorities. Next slide. Okay, priorities one and two address the FM3 research community need survey and subsequently the board's adopted budget priorities. So the first key priority is housing and homelessness, including efforts to address its related impacts. The second priority is funding to modernize aging transportation corridors or fix it first. Really, this is about bringing additional funding to fix our roads. The third priority is COVID-19 response and recovery. This priority recognizes that we continue to, na to navigate the pandemic and the needs associated with it. The fourth priority addresses behavioral health. This priority recognizes the need to coordinate with the state on several of its major initiatives that will be implemented in 2022, including implementing the first phase of CalAIM, grant funding opportunities for behavioral health, and Medi-Cal benefit expansions, among other things. Uh, this priority tracks with what the Urban Counties of California is doing, or UCC rather, and we will work closely with that association on this priority. The fifth priority is supporting funding to enhance local climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. This directly supports the board's adopted resolution declaring a climate emergency. The sixth priority addresses the board's adopted resolution declaring racism a public health crisis, the language for this policy statement is derived from that resolution, which speaks to addressing the underlying social determinants of health. The seventh priority supports the board's direction to address sideshows. The eighth priority also supports the board's direction to address the issue of SVPs or sexually violent predators. And the ninth priority addresses the board's Delta priorities. With that, I'd like to move into talking about a proposed sponsored bill on some, and some state budget requests that I think are supported by these priorities. Next slide. This year, I'm recommending that the board sponsor one legislative bill relating to the Delta in support of priority number nine, improving and mitigating risks in the Delta. This bill idea is to establish a statewide ongoing funded program that would remove commercial abandoned and derelict vessels or ADVs from California's waterways. This work would be done through a state coordinating council or fed with 
excuse me, a, store, a state coordinating council of federal, state, and local agencies that would identify, prioritize, and authorize the removal of commercial ADVs. Currently, there's a statewide program for the removal of recreational ADVs, but there's no such program that exists for commercial vessels. The next couple of slides gives you a visual of what I'm referring to when I say commercial ADV. Next slide, please. Six months ago, I didn't know anything about commercial ADVs. I didn't even know what they look like. And you may know what they look like, but I wanted to show you some, uh, some photos to illustrate what I'm talking about. These images are of commercial ADVs that are currently in our Delta within Sacramento County. Commercial ADVs are often equipment used in marine construction, such as a crane barge as seen in the top left picture. In that photo, the barge is actually sunk and the only, um, and the only thing that you can see is the crane, which is above the water. In the second photo, uh, you see a sinking barge. You notice that at the, at the bottom of the photo. There's a number of other non-working vessels. They're kind of all tied together. And these are just sitting here polluting our Delta waterway. Next slide. Now, each of these photos are of an abandoned site also in the Delta. It's called Scary, which is named after the last name of the person that used to own these vessels. At the top, you see an old abandoned tugboat. And to the right, you can see a, a sunken crane barge. I like this photo because it illustrates how oil can easily seep into the waterway. And you can see it there in the top right corner. There's a sheen on the water. The thing about these old uh, commercial vessels is that they are full of environmental and human toxins, such as lead and oil. When the tide comes in and out each day, it picks up these toxins on these vessels because the water reaches the engine compartment or other places petroleum products or other hazards were stored and pulls them out of the vessel and into the waterway, creating negative health, environmental, and ecosystem effects. That bottom photo is also a crane, crane barge, but I included it here because this one shows you the magnitude of the size of some of these vessels. They're massive and incredibly difficult and expensive to remove. It can cost millions of dollars to remove oil, hazmat such as lead, and to dispose of the metal and other materials that make up these vessels. Several federal, state, and local agencies are involved when removing these vessels, but they don't always coordinate well or at, at all in some cases, coordinate well or at all in some cases. My apologies. Next slide. <laughs> so the problem is that commercial ADVs create health and environmental and navigation hazards, as I noted, in the Delta, and there's currently no program or coordination among affected agency, agencies to effectively address this issue. After some informal conversations with federal, state, and local partners, we believe a state program that brings these partners together to identify, prioritize, and fully fund the removal of vessels will clean up our waterways of commercial ADVs. So with that, I'm happy to answer any of your questions about this proposal, but I've also asked Sergeant Darren Epperson with the Sheriff's Marine Detail to join me today to assist with any questions you might have. Okay, any thanks. Questions? Yeah. Thanks, Sergeant. Right. Go ahead, Supervisor. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, fish up. If, if you don't have any questions on this proposal, oh. I can continue on with my the, the presentation. Okay. I was going to pause and see if there was any questions regarding what you had outlined. I, and I appreciate that uh, uh, <clears throat> Sergeant Epperson's on the uh, call as well. So any um, questions? I don't see any. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving on. Great. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about state budget requests. Um, as you probably heard from uh, Audrey, we anticipate that there will be an, a discretionary surplus in the $31 billion range. And I think it's important this year that Sacramento County put forward its own requests. Um, as noted with the key priorities, this will not limit the board from weighing in on other important budget matters. Um, so there are five state budget requests I'm recommending that the board sponsor this year. The first request is a one-time state general fund request of $1.2 million to fund electronic benefit transfers, or EBT, for use of CalFresh benefits at farmers markets. This request is made in support of advocacy priority number six relating to health equity. This proposal would make the use of EBT more cost-effective for farmers market vendors in Sac County, and it would increase access to health, healthy, fresh food for anyone regardless of income. Okay, the second request is a one-time state general fund request of $2 million to fund a statewide task force program for the California Highway Patrol. You heard this from Audrey. 
Um, this supports your advocacy, advocacy priority number seven, which is re relates to sideshows. Next slide. The third request is a one-time state general fund request of $3 million for improvements that meet their community campus. This request is in support of advocacy priority number one relating to housing and homelessness. The need is great, as you well know, at Mather Community Campus, and we hope to bring some additional resources to help make some needed improvements. The fourth request is a one-time state general fund request of 20 million to remove commercial ADVs in the Delta. Now this slide reads 18 million, but I've received new information since creating this presentation, so I'm recommending a $20 million request. This request is in support of advocacy priority number nine relating to the Delta, and it is complementary to the sponsor bill I spoke about previously. Last year, Assembly Member Frazier, and you heard this from Audrey, sponsored a $12 million request to remove commercial ADVs in the Delta. The State Lands Commission did receive those funds and, and is in the process of de determining how they will spend those funds. Now, while we appreciate this step forward in funding ADV removal, the need in the Delta is much greater. The State Department of Fish and Wildlife has estimated a cost to remove all commercial ADVs in the Delta at around $34 million. For this reason, in partnership with our Delta County partners, we recommend the board request 20 million to close that gap. The fifth and final request is a one-time request of $50 million for a statewide regional parks fire prevention program. This request is in support of advocacy priorities number one, relating to housing and homelessness, and advocacy priority number five, enhancing local climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. This request will provide local jurisdictions funding to provide housing, and services to persons camping in parklands in order to reduce wildfire risk. I see a question, Supervisor Cerna. Yes, thank you, uh, through mm -hmm. the chair. Um, Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, on that uh, $50 million request, Natasha, um, first of all, what there, 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 prob there probably is some kind of formula to how you arrive at these, these numbers. Um, so I'd be interested to know specifically how you arrived at the $50 million figure for the Regional Parks Fire Prevention uh, Program legislation or funding request. Um, and then uh, would we be so specific in our request as to point out um, various different um, um, regional park assets um, under the purview of Sacramento County? Would we Would we specify how much would be uh, that we would request for the American River Parkway separate from Dry Creek Parkway, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's a good question. Uh, two things. First, um, I've asked Corey Brown, who is a local attorney and you know, a, a parkway advocate to also uh, be here today to help um, answer questions on this request. So I'll, I'll probably hand it over to Corey um, to maybe address Corey the $50 million number and then um, if you wanna respond also to the specific assets within Sacramento County, but I would just note that this is a, a statewide program. Um, so I, I would like to hear from Corey what his thoughts are about including those specific assets. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Very good. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Cerno for the, uh, the very good question. Um, the $50, $50 million figure recognizes two key factors. First, the problem is a very large problem and exceeds what $50 million could accomplish but it could make a significant impact upon providing uh, housing to uh, folks that are unfortunately illegally camping in the parkway um, while reducing fire risk and protecting natural resources. Uh, the $50 million seemed to be a, a, a reasonable uh, amount to ask for in context of this year's budget with the size of the budget surplus with the governor's uh, leadership and focus on uh, helping address homelessness as well as wildfire. So while the $50 million doesn't solve the problem, it gets us part of the way through that. And that's why we came up with a $50 million figure. Certainly much more could be allocated to address this on a statewide basis. And then uh, Corey, is there, uh, would there be any specificity in our request to uh, pinpoint different assets? There, there, could, there, there could be, because this would be establishing a statewide program Generally, you would be setting up criteria that the agencies would be allocating the funding. The current draft includes criteria that would be very favorable to Sacramento's parks, including uh, area, identifying areas that have had severe uh, damage currently from uh, wildfire that have a significant issue of people camping in the, within the parklands and things like that. But uh, uh, there is flexibility in terms of exactly how this is drafted. 
But I think to get a statewide program uh, established of this uh, dollar amount, sometimes it's more difficult to earmark funding for specific uh, parks rather than set up criteria. Right. I think if the criteria is established uh, uh, appropriately, you can end up with the same result, uh, sure. but uh, very open to uh, suggesting different types of language for this program. Great. And then lastly, I, I think I heard you say uh, that the money would be used in part or perhaps the majority of it would be used to, to help find shelter or housing for folks. Uh, so it would respond to the, the connection uh, between um, encampment living in parkways uh, and fire risk and trying to reduce the risk by way of uh, relocating folks from parkway assets into appropriate shelter. Is that what I heard you say? Correct, correct. Yeah, the, the, the basic notion is that each dollar would be helping achieve three goals. First, providing housing to reduce homelessness. Second, reducing fire risk. And third, protecting park resources. Okay, very good. Great, thank you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Supervisor Frost, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Corey, I was wondering, uh, in, to the point of being able to identify other uh, different assets, is it possible to identify like a community who's working on a, um, a an escape a fire evacuation plan, safety and evacuation and mitigation plan, um, speaking specifically about Rancher Marietta, which is an at-risk community with um, like one road out and they're trying to um, put together a plan that would um, prevent them ending up in a situation like the car fire. So we've been looking for funding for that. Yeah, more than happy to talk to you and learn more about that situation. I am familiar with uh, Rancho Murrieta, uh, but I'd love to uh, learn more about that situation and provide advice on how you could potentially address that. Okay, great. Uh, maybe I can reach out or you can reach out to me. I, I really appreciate that. More than happy to. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, uh, keep moving down through, Natasha. Thanks, Corey. That Great. Thank me, you, Supervisor. Yes, thank you, Corey. <clears throat> that brings me to the last slide, which is really just to talk about next steps and to hear from, from <clears throat> you and your thoughts overall. All right, uh, we've heard some comments and uh, obviously a lot bundled up in the uh, legislative package and thank uh, Natasha, Audrey, certainly uh, uh, Corey and uh, Sergeant Epperson for their contributions to this along with all the other county departments that I'm sure have weighed in. So uh, let me go to my colleagues. I see uh, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, uh, Chair Natoli. Thank you, Natasha and Audrey. Um, I'm just, I have a question on the, the governor's budget, proposed budget with respect to uh, cleaning up uh, homeless encampments. Was there any specific language in there about um, uh, funds specifically for abandoned vehicles? It made me think about, you know, we're talking about abandoned and derelict vessels. Yeah. I'm thinking about vehicles, not vehicles that are currently being used, obviously for, for housing, that's a different issue, but, but abandoned vehicles that are uh, un unquestionably abandoned. I mean, it, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. We're, we're wrestling at STA about, about trying to get uh, uh, more, you know, vehicle registration fees, renew the vehicle registration fees for uh, abandoned vehicles, but it's, it's not enough. Um, so do you know if there's anything, was there any speci anything specific about that in, in the budget? And Natasha, I didn't know if you wanted me to jump in, but um, Go for no, it. I, I don't think it was, there was anything specific to that. We haven't seen trailer bill language yet, but it's really just to expand the $50 million in competitive grants that they did last year from the encampment resolution program. So um, I'm just looking at the summary of what he put out yesterday and I don't see any mention of that and I didn't hear it in his presser. So I'm thinking more just um, for relocating um, for encampments, but I don't see anything related to vehicles in it. I wonder if, if it might be worthwhile to, to make it the language um, broad enough to encompass those kinds of efforts um, because a lot of these encampments involve abandoned vehicles as well. So. Just or even an additional appropriation if needed. Right. I think that's a yeah, great idea. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of municipalities are wrestling with it. Certainly, I know in Super yeah. Tolly's district, I mean, downtown Sac or Sacramento, of course, but also in the unincorporated areas more and more. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, 
problem is, this is a workshop. I would just note, I'm very supportive of the, certainly appreciate the comments, <clears throat> Supervisor Desmond really just to be in the vehicles uh, and anything we might do to give us an opportunity to seek more money there, but certainly on the abandoned vessels, I mean, the magnitude of <clears throat> just the pictures that were shown there, if you were out on the shoreline or out on the water, just massive um, uh, structures, uh, obviously constructed of steel and other metal, and there they sit in the water, um, you know, <clears throat> either sinking and or uh, contributing pollution and certainly causing other hazards for boaters and recreations and so forth. So, and I know that our, you know, uh, marine detail with the county has been very, um, very engaged both on the recreation vehicles, but certainly as it relates to working with our brethren in other counties uh, and folks uh, to, um, uh, I think, um, get focused to the to the issue and folks in Yolo County, I know years past have been involved, but all five Delta counties are very committed uh, and we appreciate the efforts that Assembly Member Frazier brought forth last year, but um, clearly there's a need for additional funding. And I think we could be a, you know, be at the forefront working with our fellow counties to, um, you know, seek uh, legislation in a year that looks to be a good budget year to um, maybe begin to clear the Delta of some of these hazards and have an effective program to do so. So, uh, Natasha, anything you wanted to add or is there Sergeant Epperson anything before we bring this back to the board? Because you asked Sergeant Everson, maybe I'll see if he has anything to add. Um, just to note that uh, supervise, on Supervisor Desmond's comment, I could add a, you know, another policy statement here related to abandoned vehicles specifically. We could add a budget request. I can work with some folks to, to identify what that might look like um, and, and add it here and bring it back to you in the next iteration. If that's what you would like to see. Well, <clears throat> pleasure with the, the chair. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, no, the yeah, worst no, thing I to say is no. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I, I agree. Either as part of the larger, you know, uh, budget item to clean up encampments, or or a separate separate one, because I think it's it's becoming you know, a, a bigger and bigger problem. I definitely think we need to raise awareness. I'm sure that folks know about it, but I think to the extent that we can raise awareness, I think that's also really important as well. So um, I'll add something into the document for your consideration. All right. Hey, uh, Natasha, this is uh, Sergeant Epson. Can I add something? Oh, sure. sure I, I, uh, good afternoon to uh, Chair and Tully and, and, and members of the board. I just want to add that the photographs that Natasha showed, and she did an excellent job kind of explaining the situation. There's three large commercial abandoned derelict vessel sites within Sacramento County on the waters. Um, she had pictures of two of the sites, but there's another third site that's also the same scale and scope. I would estimate each one of these sites is gonna cost around $2 million to clean up from start to finish. So that would be $6 million just for the County of Sacramento out of that 12 million that the estate got for the entire Delta. Um, I even even the thirty four million dollar estimate was done in two thousand and eighteen and is probably shy of the actual cost. Uh, but we certainly are in need of that of that additional funding and certainly are in need of a statewide program. So I, I certainly appreciate uh, the board's support in this as we try and come up with a solution not only for our area and the delta, but statewide. I might just make a quick quick footnote here. I see we got a couple of colleagues punched up, but um, is that, there needs to be some assurance too that what these vessels are uh, retrieved that they're not put back out in the marketplace. I mean, that was an issue some years ago with some of the vessels that they were, you know, abandoned, taken in uh, via whatever program, you know, they were surplus to begin with and then they were sold to some scrap dealer and put right back out on the water uh, to once again be a potential problem. So I think that just as they do with a lot of the abandoned vehicles or cars that are uh, given through under certain programs, they are destroyed. Uh, so there's not no question that somehow it's going to be spend all that money cleaning it up and then it ends up being somebody's problem later down the road again. So yeah, that, that's exactly correct. So our only option is destruction and disposal. Uh, there is no reuse of Good. any of these 
vessels or marine equipment because you're right it'll just get pushed around across our county line to one of the other neighboring counties and it'll be the same issue for them so we we've, we've already crossed that out okay. as an option good okay thanks sergeant Epperson. appreciate your work there okay we have a uh, supervisor frost and supervisor kennedy just wanted to ask natasha um when are you coming back with with this second review good question i was uh if I brought it back on consent, I'd come back on the 25th. If we come back for a presentation, I have to push it out to February. So my preference is to bring it back to you on consent with what we've talked about here today um, on the 25th so that we can get working on these issues. We've done some preliminary work, but without your approval, um, I don't really feel comfortable having the conversation, you know, having conversations with the legislature on these issues. Is, is it possible to talk with you, Corey, prior to that timeline? Yes, I, I can be available this week. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Patrick. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, just not to belabor the point, but on the um, abandoned vessels, are, are we gonna have a coordinated effort with other counties? Because there's two sides to every river. Yeah, that's a good question. Go ahead, Sar Sergeant Everson. Yeah, so um, we're actually, we do that now uh, on a county level when it comes to the recreational vessels. The three sites that are within our county are far enough into our county that they're not going to drift away. They're all fairly large and most of them are sunk down on the bottom. Um, so we don't have any, any issue of them creeping across the county line or, or too much concern for coordinating with the neighboring counties. But what we're proposing is a statewide solution where all the counties in the Delta and then the San Francisco Bay and then along the coastline all would have some say in this council um, of statewide agencies and some federal representation. So that's the whole idea of the coordinating council is so all of us can present our issues and problems you know, of our ADV sites to the council, then they can look at them, accept them, prioritize them, decide which ones are gonna get funded and then set out to enact the uh, disposal of those sites. Thank you. It's really the only way to go is coordinating. Okay. All right, any other questions, comments? If not, I think uh, Natasha, you've gotten pretty good direction and consensus around most of the issues. Sounds like a couple of ringbacks and <clears throat> the consent calendar in, uh, in two weeks, it sounds like, so. Okay. Happy to do that. Chairperson, uh, we do have a public comment. Sure, okay, very good. Let's uh, go to our callers then. Okay, could you please transfer the caller? Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Sure, hey, uh, my name is Nikki Jones. I'm an organizer with the Carceray Sacramento and also an organizer with the Sacramento Homeless Organizing Committee. Um, I do appreciate the presentation today. I have some questions and I wonder, kind of on a bigger, uh, picture how these priorities are determined um, where you know some of the I saw the one through nine priorities and kind of how those find themselves manifesting in particular legislation here and there we see this one example uh, about cleaning up the river which I really appreciate um, but I would like to kind of have a, a bigger picture also know um, how this process process should seems like it how it could, how it should be more engaged with uh, constituent policy priorities and would like to hear how those have been engaged and what engagement will happen before those priorities come back for approval. Um, you know, there were a, a lot of things brought up and discussed and a lot of things kind of placed on the slideshow and not discussed. Obviously would have liked to hear quite a lot more about um, some of the real emergencies that we're in, 
um, like like the climate emergency, and I know that the cleaning up the river relates to that. But I, there are a lot of um, kind of when when you when you are the county and you can only work on county things, what you advocate for on the state and federal levels um, is just so huge. This is where this is where the sky's the limit. This is where you have to dream about what your county and your constituents need and listen to them about what that is. And so I also have concerns as it relates to um, criminal justice fines and fees. Really, really disappointed to hear um, that this county advocated for less removal of fines and uh, criminal fines and fees uh, removal, criminal justice fines and fees removal. You know, we, the county and city, went through a listening session process this this year about that. We've we've heard a lot. There's a, a community working group on this uh, that has a lot to say about how these impact, these fines and fees particularly impact and affect the lives uh, detrimentally of communities of color, of poor communities, and why these are tied to histories, legacies of white supremacy, and why are we advocating when we understand racism is a public health crisis, when we understand the criminal justice system has been lopsided, why are we advocating for these fines and fees that weigh families down, that weigh community members down from uh, re-establishing uh, uh, in the community? It's really honestly absurd and I'd really love to hear any any thoughts about why that was a priority. I understand the the lost revenue, but we have to account for the wrongs we've done. You can't just say, oh, we're gonna lose money. You have to account for why you why these people don't this shouldn't be paying should be paying you. They shouldn't be. That's it was, we've historically seen that we've wronged the community and now we need to account for it. So um, you know, this is really one small piece of a, a bigger picture of why, where is the community engagement on your uh, process for deciding legislative priorities and why, why re I, we really need to know why you fought to keep these people in debt because it is honestly atrocious. Um, so yeah, appreciate all y'all's time. Um, and work on this and hope to see something different uh, in in three weeks. And obviously would like a presentation. This isn't, this. there needs to be quite a lot more dialogue and it's the fact that it would come back on consent and prohibit some of that dialogue is even more concerning. So I think we need to expand dialogue instead of, uh, and community engagement instead of moving towards a, a lack of, a, an, non-transparent um, legislative priority process. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Nikki. Thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, Tasha, any response? There's sure, no more I, callers. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. I can't, your mic is going in and out on my end, so I apologize. I didn't mean to okay. cut anyone off. <clears throat> no, it's fine. Okay, well, I was asked, Natasha can respond. We'll take, I know we had another caller. I think there's only one caller, but we'll take the other callers, then we have Natasha can respond. Yeah. Yeah, um, I appreciated the comments from the caller. On the criminal justice fines and fees, we did not advocate on keeping the fees or not keeping the fees. We were um, just making sure the legislature understood the impact of the loss of that revenue. And we were advocating for backfilling those fees. We wanted the legislature to step up and provide us revenue, um, uh, again, to address the revenue loss. It wasn't that we were advocating to keep the fees. So I just wanna make that clarification. So sorry if for some reason that got confused. Audrey, did you wanna add anything on that? No, that was perfect. I just wanted to apologize if that came off as that's how I advocated that. No, it was just simply we just wanted there to be a back as those fees are used for other county services. So um, we simply for a backfill, not on whether the fees should be eliminated. We had, you know, did not weigh in on that. So thank you, Natasha. Yeah. And then just to note that the advocacy priorities were derived from actions that this board took. So that's how I came up with these nine priorities. And um, I kept these statements broad and that's intentional. I wanna be able to have some flexibility to weigh in on the issues that are coming up in the legislature. If we're super specific here about priorities, there, we might be missing something that comes up both at the federal or state level. So these are intentionally drafted the way that they are. Um, I also wanna note that we do a lot of work internally with departments to identify what their issues are, what, what's coming up, um, things that they know that need to be addressed in the coming year. Um, and that's how 
uh, the, we revise these priorities. It's always in partnership with our department director. So I just wanted to make that note as well. Oh, and Ann, you get your hand up, go ahead. You're on mute, Ann. There you go. I apologize. Yeah. Um, I also just wanted to point out that many of the key advocacy priorities, uh, not all, but many of them are also quite consistent with the results of the poll that we recently conducted uh, with the community about what their priorities are. So many of those are consistent with the, with the public as well. I would just say too that, uh, again, appreciate Nikki calling in. I know she and others certainly have uh, weighed in, you know, at board hearings uh, consistently over the course of a number of years. But if there's, you know, interest, certainly I, I know Natasha, you're always very accessible. And I assume that Audrey, if you need be, wanted to talk uh, further, is the one just to explain how we derive them into Ann's point, your point about either working with county departments through survey instruments or board direction. But uh, I think, you know, part of the question was there is that how are these developed? Um, you know, and, and how do they get before us in the format that they are? And I think that's been, you know, addressed in part. But um, again, I would encourage uh, uh, Ms. Jones and others to reach out to you, uh, Natasha, and you can maybe coordinate some ongoing discussion about at least how you get there. Obviously, it's still up to the board to either bless these or not. So, sure. okay, thanks. All right, uh, Flo, you said other callers? We do not have any other callers. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, bad. All right. Okay, so this is a workshop. I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, looks like we're going to try to come back in a couple of weeks. I would just note too, if it's on consent count, if there are any questions or comments, we can pull it off consent to uh, have further discussion. In fact, we could we could schedule back as a separate matter. I'm fine with that too. I mean, if there were some items, there's you know, unless there's objections by the board, if there is an interest, obviously. Maybe I just, we would have to wait till February if we bring it back for um, a presentation. If, why, if it's on, con oh, excuse me. Go ahead. I was just saying, why is that though? If, if we brought it back in a separate manner, I mean, our agenda is full, but no full, it can't be fuller than it was today, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Okay, so we have an evening session on the 25th. Is that what you're saying? Because we're going to get there today for it, I think so. All right. Well, again, um, and I'll get to Supervisor Frost, but you can bring it back on the consent calendar, but if there's discussion, we're gonna end up pulling it off anyway, so, um, anyway. all right. That was, that was what I was just gonna say. We could we put it on what we, you wish. We could put it on consent and then pull it if we have changes or comment. Right. Or comments and yeah, all right. What's the, so the board's um, okay with bringing us back on, on the consent calendar on the 25th, recognizing some of the timelines, but understanding we may have um, further discussion. If so, obviously it will come off of consent. So it's okay. All right. That's what we'll do then. We'll come back on the 25th and Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, that concludes that item for the present time. So we'll now move to the uh, two o'clock matters and uh, go into the time matters for the afternoon. Madam Clerk, next item. Okay, for item 57, you are acting as the Sacramento County Water Agency and the Sacramento County Water Financing Authority. This is approving the issuance of the Sacramento County Water Financing Authority of Series 2022 revenue bonds, interim financing in a principal amount not to exceed $95 million and approving the forms of and of and authorizing the execution and delivery of the related documents and directing and authorizing certain other actions in connection therewith. Good afternoon, no, no. Chair Hi, Mitchell. Colin. Yes, this is Colin Bettis, your county debt officer. Um, the item before you today is the approval of the series 2022 bonds for the water agency. The water agency intends to finance the costs of certain additions, betterments, and improvements to the agency's water system comprised of the Arden service area distribution pipe re realignment and meter installation project utilizing the WIFIA credit agreement that was approved by the Board of Supervisors on November 17th and closed on December 8th of 2021. The WIFIA credit agreement was selected as the method of financing due to the advantageous rates um, 
that are now set at 1.89%, which is better than what was originally anticipated at 2.08% as of October 20. As mentioned in the presentation in November, the agency and the Office of Budget and Debt Management are now recommending approval of an additional interim financing, namely the Series 2022 bonds, in order to achieve additional savings during the construction period. At the time of writing the report, um, the estimated savings were approximately $1.8 million. Due to the very beneficial interest rate achieved through the WIFIA credit agreement, set at 1.89, as well as rising short-term interest rates, the amount of actual savings during the construction period will now be less than originally anticipated and is now estimated to be approximately $700. The WIFIA credit agreement allows for the unique opportunity to lock in those long-term interest rates and only pay on the credit agreement at the time that we pull down the loan to, to take out the interim or pay off the interim financing. The agency will be required to pay a portion of the interest on the interim financing mechanism. However, that will be paid at the short-term interest rate at approximately 0.8% versus the 1.89% of the WIFIA credit agreement. In addition, we plan, uh, sorry. Um, in addition, we plan to issue the Series 2022 bonds with a premium, which will be utilized to pay the costs of issuance and a portion of the interest during the construction period. That concludes my presentation. And um, I'm available for any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Colin. Was there anybody else? I'm yeah, a number of other presenters, but they're just available for questions. So that was that's fine. correct. We have Nick Jones from PFM on. If you have any questions from our financial advisor, very good. Let me look to board members. Questions uh, on this? All right. Oh, Supervisor Desmond, go ahead. I pressed the wrong button. Um, thank you, and 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 um, thank you, Colin, for the presentation. My, mine doesn't have to. My my question or comment doesn't have to do with the, the financing, um, but just really the, the the projects that this is going to fund in general and the impact in um, some of these these communities that are served by the county. And and I I had a, a brief conversation about this with uh, uh, Chair Natoli and, and our our county exec. I mean. We're going to be doing an awful lot more work in some of these communities and, and, and tearing up some of the roadways in the process. And, and I just like to, to go on record, you know, and, and reiterate conversations we've had in the past that it's, it's my hope that our Department of Transportation will be working closely with the Sacramento County Water Agency to identify opportunities where instead of just repairing a portion of a roadway that may already be degraded to an extent that they are, we are, we are repairing the entire roadway or at least doing an overlay on the entire roadway. I know, I know Chair Natoli probably has some comments about this as well, but uh, um, it, it really creates a lack of trust in these communities when they see the county come in and, and they're already dealing with a roadway. It may not be one of the worst on our PCI index, but it's already in pretty bad shape. And a utility comes in, tears it up, and just repairs, you know, a little patch. Um, that is very, very frustrating to folks. So I, I just, I really hope that our DOT folks are working together and really maximizing our dollars to to repair the entire roadway where we can. I don't know if. It, yeah, it, I would just like to, to maybe piggyback on that because we did have that brief conversation about this, and I would just add that, uh, and I shared this in my briefing. Uh, with Ann um, yesterday, that this project probably the large the largest one. We got 30 miles of distribution pipeline in the, in in, in right of way is going to be installed with this project. And I drew some parallels with the Harvest Water project, which again will be in a rural area where the roads are some of the worst PCI in the county already. Um, and you know, it's one thing for the utility of the water, whether it's delivery of we cycle water with the Harvest Water Project, uh, which benefits us in lots of different ways, or the potable water supply for folks in these neighborhoods in, in District 3. It just seems to me that uh, if, if we're gonna approach this from a more global, and I think the rightful approach, that is, is that for streets that have long been in a deteriorate, deteriorated state to, to not go in there as a part of these projects in upgrade the water infrastructure in this case, but also 
get the streets back into a good state of repair is um, is ignoring the problem. And yeah, it takes money, and you know it's not the water department is going to pay for all this. Only there is a, a portion share, but and whether it's we, whether we look at it in the general fund context of these larger projects, or we look at it in the context of we're using WIFIA to finance the water infrastructure, and you have a rate behind that. Uh, but maybe there's some other infrastructure financing that would allow us to do this. But I just think that it would be um, a real mistake uh, for us to go in and only do half a street or a, a, you know, a section of the roadside edge and then call the rest good because that's just the way it was and we didn't touch it with this project. I just, I, I, I think that's a bad way of doing business. We've done that this way in this county for a long time, sometimes out of necessity. I think those days are over, at least in my view. Um, and uh, while we're looking at our budgets and so forth, and whether it's in this segment of the county over the next two or three years as this bill goes on, the Harvest Water Project over the next two or three years, we need to find a way to do a complete streets and put the streets back into a state of uh, repair that will last another generation or two. Whereas right now, um, you know, they're already in a deteriorated state. So I, I'm 100% supportive. And if this needs to be a budget discussion, again, it's not all gonna be done this year, uh, for you know upcoming budget deliberations, then so be it. I just think that it's you know it needs to be a business practice on the part of this county that not only will we go in and repair what we tore up, but we actually make it better when we leave when we leave that spot and have a road in, in good repair. So um, I don't know. I and I had a chance to talk with you. I'm not necessarily generating response today, but I just uh, I feel pretty strongly about it as it relates to this project and as well as others in this county. So. Uh, supervisors, uh, this is yeah. Michael, Mike Penrose. Um, <laughs> Welcome <I> back. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to weigh in a little bit and advise your the board that there has been significant coordination for the Arden uh, water projects in past years based just on the exact concerns that have been raised uh, both by S Supervisor uh, Desmond and yourself. Um, and there, there is an effort underway and a clear acknowledgement of the coordination of the uh, infrastructure provision with these projects, both with DOT and the water agency. Um, the needs of the funding for all the components of the road rework uh, may come up in future uh, budgetary discussions, but in terms of prioritization and coordination of work and putting those two together to get the best complete project for the road conditions, um, that's in play and will continue to be uh, you know, exercised as this program is delivered. It's uh, it's clearly the best way to do it. So, uh, just wanted to assure you that that is those coordination efforts are actually underway and um, being considered from a programming perspective to line up that work together. So, well, well, thank you, Michael. And I just again, I would suggest it again with the Harvest Water Project, which is miles and miles. It's at least thirty, probably thirty miles of rural roads that are in bad state of repair, and there's no way that with D five allocation you could get all those roads done in the next five or 10 years with overlays and repairs. So I just think it needs to be a part of that discussion with the sanitation district as well. And it can't just fall to that project, just like with that water can't fund all this either. So I, I know you're aware of it and you were aware of it before you retired and came back, but I appreciate uh, your leadership on this issue. So we'll we need some, some attention to it. All right, anything else um, on this? Uh, if not, then we we have any callers on this? Edward? We do not. We do not have any public comments. Okay, we have a recommendation. We have a motion. I'll move approval. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded then to approve the staff recommendation. And this is act, acting as the Sacramento County Water Financing Authority. So, do we wear a different hat now, or? I think, in, in fact, there's two actions, one for um, the agency and one for the authority. Okay, and they, so they require separate actions? Uh, I believe so. Uh, can, can, I, can I ask Lisa Travis to confirm that? We haven't done that in the past um, for other items when you're acting as two hearing bodies. Uh, I read into the record that you're acting as a Sacramento County Water Agency and you're also acting as a Sacramento County Water Financing Authority. I, just, right. I mean, since the since the board members are the same, I believe that it's acceptable to just take one motion. Either way is fine, I guess, but I will defer to the board as to how you want to handle. 
Okay, I think one motion is fine as long as it's acceptable. So if, yeah. if, I, if I understood the Supervisor Desmond's motion and was seconded by Supervisor Frost, then that would be the action to acting as both of those bodies, the agency and the authority uh, to approve the staff recommendation. Okay. All right, if nothing further than flow, please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisors Frost. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Desmond. Aye. Cerna. Aye. Natoli. Aye. Unanimous vote. All right. Okay, for your okay. next. Next item. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Item 58 is the retroactive authority to apply for and accept grant funds and ex execute a retroactive revenue agreement up to $5 million with the State of California Department of Healthcare Services for the term of July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024 for the Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Program, authority to execute retroactive revenue agreements with qualified and interested managed care plans for the term of January 1, 2022 through December 31, 2022, retroactive authority to amend and increase fiscal year 2021-22 expenditure agreements with behavioral health providers in the total amount of $3,410,000 from January 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2022, approve a salary resolution amendment adding 10 full-time equivalent positions and approve an appropriations adjustment request in the amount of $3,787,621 to support the implementation of California Advancing and Innovating, innovating Medi-Cal Enhanced Care Management. Okay, thank you, Flo. All right, uh, looks like Siobhan and Brian and uh, Janine Spotness are up today, so Good. on this one, again. Great, thank you again. Good afternoon, board. Um, I am going to go ahead and give the presentation on CalAIM implementation, and uh, Dr. Quist and Janine are available to answer specific questions if they should arise. So this is just a continuation of um, the CalAIM discussion that we've been having with the board. We came to you with a board workshop last fall, and then we've been speaking to you about different components of that along the way, such as the health information exchange. So the first several slides are kind of a repeat of some of the information that you've already heard from me. And so I'm gonna speed through those very quickly and get into the heart of the proposal pretty quickly. So next slide. So just as a reminder, CalAIM, California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal Overview, basically the Department of Healthcare Services for the state submitted a, a waiver to the federal government, to CMS, to improve the quality of life and healthcare outcomes and reduce disparities in outcomes for Medi-Cal beneficiaries by implementing a broad delivery system program and payment reform across the Medi-Cal program. So that's just a big way of saying, we're gonna use healthcare dollars to do things outside of the box to improve the quality of life for people that we serve. The federal approval came for this waiver on 12-29 and uh, with a January 1st go live date. Next slide. So a reminder about the framework, the way CalAIM works is that the federal government gives funding to the state, Department of Healthcare Services, and the state has developed the framework. Within that framework, local uh, managed care plans that operate within counties actually develop these models of care in conjunction with and with input from the community partners. In Sacramento County, we have five managed care plans, Aetna, Anthem, HealthNet, Kaiser, and Molina. I wanna thank our plan partners. They've done a fantastic job coming together and engaging with the community, with the county, with our health systems, our federally qualified health centers, and our community-based organizations to be able to get input about the gaps and the needs for Medi-Cal beneficiaries in our communities so that we can develop the best model of care possible for Sacramento County. And so that is the framework. Next slide. So under CalAIM, there's several initiatives and reforms, enhanced care management and community supports, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, behavioral health payment reform, behavioral health medical necessity criteria, eligibility criteria, and documentation redesign, a long-term plan for foster youth, a multi-system data exchange and care coordination, mental health and SUD integration projects, SUD is substance use disorder, and population health management. 
Next slide. So a little more in depth, enhanced care management and community supports. Um, I've spoken to you about this and the reason why this is important to highlight is because this is what goes live now in January. And the goals of enhanced care management are really to provide a whole person care approach through comprehensive care coordination. This is really building upon the lessons learned through the whole person care pilot that just ended here in December of last year. The whole person care target populations include folks with severe mental illness or substance use disorders, homeless individuals, high utilizers of health care, foster youth, individuals transitioning out of incarceration, nursing home residents transitioning to the community, individuals eligible for long-term long care and at risk of institutionalization, and children with significant medical or mental health needs. Community supports provide medically appropriate and cost-effective alternatives to higher cost emergency health care services. These fall into four buckets, although there's 14 identified community supports at this time. Housing and navigation supports, which include things like navigating folks who are homeless into more permanent or secure housing, security deposits, um, tenancy repair, those types of strategies. Post Acute support services, this includes things like respite care or medical respite as folks are transitioning out of higher levels of care, such as a hospital. Uh, transition supports and at-home supports like personal care. How do we help keep pe transition people back from institutions such as the jail or such as nursing home into their own homes? And then how do we help support them once they're in their own homes to maintain? Next slide, please. So this structure really puts, uh, the proposed structure really puts Sacramento County at the hub of CalAIM planning for the community. And the Department of Health Services, our behavioral health, primary health, and public health divisions will play a coordination role in this, ensuring that our elected officials, our board of supervisors, and other community leaders have an opportunity to learn about and weigh in to the decisions being made under CalAIM, engaging community providers and stakeholders, and then working with our managed care plans to ensure that whatever models are being developed are doing so with our beneficiaries in mind. The Department of Healthcare Services alone is just one of the departments that's heavily impacted by CalAIM, our Department of Homeless Initiatives, Department of Human Assistance, and Department of Child and Family Services are all key departments in making sure CalAIM gets up and running as it should. And I just wanna thank my department head partners and the County Executive's Office for all of their support in thinking through how this can best be rolled out. Next slide. So in this proposed county role that we'd like to have in Cal Ames, starting in January, right now, 2022, these are the activities that we're proposing that we take on as a county. Ensure coordination amongst managed care plans and providers. Define the needs and gaps to inform Cal Ames efforts. Ensure Cal Ames policy and funding opportunities are effectively leveraged for the benefit of county residents. Provide information on CalAIM to com the community and to stakeholders. Facilitate a learning collaborative to assess outcomes and continuously improve the impact of CalAIM services for our county residents. Define how the county's homeless services and system of care can be leveraged and braided with the CalAIM homeless and housing supports. Serve as an administrative hub for enhanced care management for the severely mentally ill and substance use disorder populations. Implement behavioral health payment reform and documentation reform and build and maintain a social health information exchange for comprehensive care coordination and data sharing across providers and plans. Next slide, please. In addition to what those uh, efforts are right now, there are going to be some future efforts under CalAIM. The state is still defining what those will look like that we would like to spearhead and be able to um, help the community to plan for. And these include exploring the county's role in serving foster youth, individuals transitioning out of incarceration, 
nursing home residents transi transitioning to the community, individuals eligible for long-term care and at risk of institutionalization, and children with significant medical or mental health needs. So we have a lot of programs that the county already operates in our multiple departments that serve these populations, and we just want to be able to leverage the CalAIM resources to serve them more effectively. And then to plan for the future of CalAIM reforms and initiatives, including but not limited to population health management, for which our public health division is uniquely situated to not only track what's happening with our whole population's health in Sacramento, but then to implement efforts and make recommendations as to how to improve the overall community health. And then the SMI, SED, SED is Severely Emotionally Disturbed Demonstration Project for Children that we'll be looking into to see if that's something the county should engage in. Next slide, please. So currently, we are proposing multiple board actions that will help give us the tools and resources that we need in order to implement the proposal that I just presented. First, we are asking that the board accept $5 million in grant funding from the Department of Healthcare Services for the what we call BHQIP, Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Program, to support implementation of the behavioral health aspects of CalAIM implementation. So those are the things I talked about, like documentation redesign, uh, medical necessity, uh, changing the criteria, those types of things that are going to be a heavy administrative lift for our behavioral health division. We're asking that the uh, board allow us to enter into revenue contracts with the managed care plans, uh, Aetna, Anthem, HealthNet, and Molina, and you'll notice Kaiser's not on there. Kaiser is actually not contracting with the county for this service at this point. Um, to receive funding for CalAIM related activities. So this would essentially be enhanced care management or um, community supports that we may be a hub or a pass through for. We're asking to amend and increase contracts in the amount of $3.41 million with all mental health and substance use providers who have existing contracts with us so that they can provide ECM services to both the SMI and SUD population. So what we're intending to do is leverage our existing partnerships with providers who will now also be providing enhanced care management in addition to the other services they provide on our behalf, such as full service partnerships, for instance. And then adding 10 uh, full-time staff to, the DA to DHS to support the development and implementation of CalAIM activities throughout the community. Six of these staff would be housed in our behavioral health division to do all of the behavioral health um, related activities, two in the administrative division to usher in the new reforms under CalAIM and work with the managed care plans, and then two at our primary care clinic to help support uh, high utilizers of healthcare services through enhanced care management. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll just make one comment. We are not currently asking for additional general fund to implement this. We feel this is going to be fully sustainable with the funds that we are able to leverage through managed care and through Medi-Cal and through the grant funding. So our next steps would be to obtain approval on the action items from the board that I presented today to execute our contracts with the managed care plans and our providers so that we can begin ECM services to the SMI and SUD populations as soon as those contracts are executed. And then for the remainder of this year, we would begin the implementation of other CalAIM initiatives and reforms. And then starting in January, 2023, we would implement ECM for the new populations and the new community supports that I've outlined prior. So that is the end of my presentation and I am happy to take questions. Yvonne, um, I guess a question that comes to my mind, I asked this of Ann yesterday, as we see the items on the agenda today, and maybe some of the positions are more easily uh, recruited and filled than others, but uh, when we look at the um, expansion of some of these efforts and implementation of others, I guess I'm curious, how are we doing as it relates to, you know, workforce uh, obviously with COVID that has its impacts, but generally are we running high vacancy rates? Do we have uh, good pools to draw from as it relates to professionals and paraprofessionals in these various positions? Because I guess I'm 
concerned that we appropriate money, we budget positions, and you know, I was alluded to in one of the calls earlier this morning that we have you know, vacancies in any number of areas. And I guess I'm just curious as to you know, how you think we're doing because it's gonna rely on a lot of cases, not just the, the, the provider contracts and they're having the personnel to uh, uh, provide the service, but us as well. So can you give me some yeah. insight on that? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that is a very important um, aspect to look at when we're thinking about not only hiring county staff, but also hiring and contracting with providers to do this work. One of the things I will say is the reason we chose to put the MHSA item prior to the CalAIM item on the agenda is because we recognize that the, the rate increase and the capacity increase that you approved this morning in MHSA will really help our providers to be able to hire, recruit, and retain staff within the programs to provide the direct services. Um, with regards to county staff, when you look at our vacancies, um, one of the reasons we have a, high, a higher than normal vacancy rate at, right at this moment is really because we have ramped up eff efforts so quickly in some of these programs to actually expand, for instance, the wellness crisis call center and response um, to actually hire staff. And we are in the process of hiring staff. I think where we're going to have the biggest challenges aren't in things like Calame, what I'm proposing here, because these are more administrative positions. Um, really, where we're going to have the challenge is doing the um, doing the direct service work. So we're seeing a significant uh, concern in our nursing and medical areas. We're seeing significant concerns in our uh, behavioral health areas when it comes to direct service populations, clinicians, and counselors to actually go out into the field and do the work. Um, earlier today, Dr. Quist talked about how um, we're going to be implementing peer-related efforts. One of the things we really are focusing on is looking at different classifications of um, staffing that we can bring on. I think we've relied on traditional staffing patterns, such as clinicians who are clinically trained. We know that there are peers that there are paraprofessionals who are really equipped to do the type of work that we wanna do, the outreach and engagement to certain harder to serve communities. And those are the folks that we really are going to be focused on um, getting hired and trained and ensuring they have the necessary tools and resources to do the job. And then you've probably seen a lot of efforts around um, public health, workforce development, behavioral health workforce development. There are initiatives coming down from the state and locally that we're doing to try to develop a workforce to create a career ladder for folks who want to enter our profession, but maybe need a little bit more education and training to do so. So those are all things we're gonna focus on in tandem to be able to address some of the vacancies and concerns we have with staffing. But I, I feel confident with this proposal that we'll be able to get it up off the ground. So uh, are there time um, uh, related issues as it relates to accepting the grant though, that you know, if you, you, know, if you can fill the positions and deliver the service and, and uh, ramp up as you've suggested, but I guess, I mean, as I said it on the Youth Advisory Board, Mental Health Board, uh, on Friday and heard Dr. Um, uh, Gordon's uh, presentation. And I know about the, you know, the initiative to actually have a career, you know, focus uh, for uh, providers of service in the, you know, behavioral health area. But I guess it still occurs to me that even with all that you said that in, in, in part with the clinicians and so forth, people that actually can provide the service at a certain level, you know, everybody, I say a lot of folks are looking for those very same people uh, to do services both in the private sector as well elsewhere in the public sector. So are we at risk of losing dollars um, in the event that we aren't able to implement as you might have suggested? No, not no. No, we're not at risk of losing dollars. Um, you know, like I said, some of the reforms that we're doing or the initiatives are really going to rely on this uh, 10 staff that we're hiring for the county. The contracts that we're going to have with providers it really is the way the dollars flow is if they provide the service, then they bill us for the service or claim okay. through us and then we claim. So it's not about we get these dollars and would have to pay them back. It's really more of a traditional healthcare billing in a sense, if you will. Okay, pay as you go. Okay. 
All right, very good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions by board members? The hands, um, do we have callers, uh, Madam Clerk? Yes, we do. Okay, let's go to our call line. Okay, could you please transfer the first caller? Please transfer the caller for item 58. There's one caller in the queue, I do see them. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Oh, sure, let me pause the meeting. I thought I did. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you said, dear. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, you said you can. sorry I, was, I had a background, I had the meeting in the background. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, if you could start no, with your okay. comments, you've got three minutes. Sure, this is just, uh, this is just Nikki again. Hi, everybody. Um, because of the really wonderful advocacy of some people in the community, uh, mostly with Sacramento Act and, you know, Mike Jasky following this really closely, uh, been able to follow the Cal AIM process and have been really, you know, the biggest thing about this for me that I appreciate is that we're finally getting insurance to pay for things that aren't necessarily medical care but definitely impact people's health and i can't say how many um you know medical professionals physicians that i have spoken to that talk about oh gosh if they could just prescribe housing if they could just prescribe housing um and how many <clears throat> health care barriers, if they could just prescribe transportation, which thanks to some things um, have, have been helped with. And I know this, CalAIM doesn't address necessarily housing or access to housing, but the idea that you can, you can really, you can bill these folks for more than just the medical services is really uh, good to hear. And in terms of, you know, job, kind of a, a lack of ability to place folks in these jobs. I just want to say that Sacramento State has one of the uh, leading social work programs in the um, state, if not the nation. And so it's concerning. I hope that y'all are doing really targeted, specific outreach out there to make sure that from this community comes the, the workers who work with this community. And I know that continuing um, you know, finding specific health care for inside the jail has been difficult. And I just want to say that's going to continue to be difficult because y'all need to release people. Y'all need to, this talks about reentry. Colleen talks about reentry. Um, we, we're we still waiting to see what the county's plan for uh, decarceration and, and getting people out of the jail and into community safely and with the resources they need is. And we've been waiting for quite some time. We know we're, you know, I could probably go on for six more minutes about this. So I'm, I'm happy to be cut off. But this, this idea that there's now money, we can look at this. Okay, there's support for folks in reentry. What is the, 
you know, interim public safety and justice agency, Bruce, what, what's happening to really move towards getting people out of the jail? And we just haven't seen that. And we would, we really need to see that because, you know, right now there's 900% increased COVID numbers from last week from inside the jail. So we need to stop people from getting in and we need to stop people from getting out. And Kelly addresses some of that, but we would like to hear what else you're doing. Thank you, Nikki, for your comments. All right. Any um, any other callers, Madam Clerk? Uh, no, at this point, we do not have callers, and I will close the public comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board then. Uh, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, then a motion be in order. <clears throat> Go ahead and move the item. Second. <clears throat> All right, it's been moved and seconded. Moved by Sterling, seconded by Kennedy to uh, approve the staff recommendation as outlined. And I trust we will have periodic report backs on this. Uh, the handshake is head yes. So. Okay, if nothing further, then uh, I'll call for the vote. Sure. Yes, Supervisors Frost. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Desmond. Aye. Cerna. Aye. Anna Tolley. Aye. Unanimous vote. Okay, for item 59, introduce ordinance amending Sacramento County Code Chapter 4.07, banning flavored tobacco sales to any person, waive full reading and continue to January 25th, 2022 for adoption. Okay, so I understand, uh, Supervisor Kennedy, you're gonna kick this off, is that correct? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. I have a um, fairly lengthy statement I'd like to make to kick it off. And I also know that uh, I believe Dr. Kassirier is, uh, is uh, on the sidelines. If there's any health-related questions, um, she'll be available for that. Yeah. <clears throat> While California has made great strides in reducing tobacco use, tobacco use remains the number one preventable cause of premature death and disease in Sacramento and the nation, killing 480,000 Americans annually. Prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products in all tobacco retailers is a critical step that will protect children living in Sacramento from the unrelenting efforts by the tobacco industry to hook them to a deadly addiction. Flavored tobacco products are designed to alter the taste and reduce the harshness of tobacco products so they are more appealing and easy for beginners who are almost always kids. These products are pervasive and are mar marketed and sold in a variety of kid-friendly flavors. With their colorful packaging and sweet flavors, flavored tobacco products are often hard to distinguish from the candy displays near which they are frequently placed in retail outlets. In California, nine out of 10 high school tobacco users report using flavored products. Menthol cigarettes increase smoking among youth as well. No other flavored product contributes more to the death and disease caused by tobacco use than menthol cigarettes. Menthol delivers the pleasant minty taste and imparts a cooling and soothing sensation. These characteristics successfully mask the harshness of tobacco, making it easier for beginning smokers and specifically kids to tolerate smoking. <clears throat> the FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee has reported that menthol cigarettes increase the number of children who experiment with cigarettes and the number of children who become regular smokers, increasing overall youth smoking. Young people who initiate using menthol cigarettes are more likely to become addicted and become long-term daily smokers. The availability of menthol cigarettes reduces smoke cessation in some populations, especially among Black Americans, and increases the overall prevalence of smoking among Black Americans. Menthol cigarettes are marketed disproportionately to younger smokers and are disproportionately marketed per capita to Black Americans. A 2009 federal law, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act prohibited the sale of cigarettes with, with characterizing flavors other than menthol or tobacco, including candy and fruit flavors. While overall cigarette sales have been declining since the 2009 law, the proportion of smokers using menthol cigarettes, the only remaining flavored cig cigarette available, has been increasing. 
Menthol cigarettes comprised 37% of the market in 2019. The overall market for flavored tobacco products is actually growing. In recent years, there has been an explosion of sweet flavored tobacco products, especially e-cigarettes and cigars. These products are available in a wide assortment of flavors like mango, blue raz, pink punch, and mint for e-cigarettes and chocolate, watermelon, and cherry dynamite for cigars. Tobacco companies are making and marketing deadly and addictive products that look and taste like a new line of flavors from a Ben and Jerry's ice cream store. Flavors are not just a critical part of product design, but are a key marketing ploy for the industry. In 2016, the Surgeon General, a Surgeon General report on e-cigarettes concluded, e-cigarettes are marketed by promoting flavors and using a wide variety of, of media channels and approaches that had been used in the past for marketing conventional tobacco products to youth and young adults. The 2019 National Youth Tobacco Survey found that 69.3 of middle and high school students, over 18.2 million youth, had been exposed to e-cigarette advertisements from at least one source. Flavored tobacco products are popular among youth. These sweet products have fueled the popularity of e-cigarettes and cigars among our youth. Eight out of, the, out of 10 of the kids who have ever used tobacco products started with a flavored product. Across all tobacco products, the data is clear. Flavored tobacco products are overwhelmingly used by youth as a starter product and preference for flavors declines with age. In California, 8.2% of high school students reported using e-cigarettes. The California Student Tobacco Survey found that an increase an increasing pro proportion of these youth are using flavored tobacco, 96.2% in 2019 20, up from 86.4% just two years prior. Among California's high school e cigarette users, the most commonly used flavors are fruit, 63.9%, mint or menthol, 14.7%, and candy or sweet, 13%. Youth e cigarette users are also at risk of smoking cigarettes. A 2018 report from the National Academy, Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine found that there is substantial evidence that e-cigarettes use, increase, use increases risk of ever using combustible tobacco cigarettes among youth and young adults. In January 2020, the FDA restricted some flavors in cartridge-based e-cigarettes, but exempted all menthol-flavored e-cigarettes and left flavored e-liquids and disposable e-cigarettes widely available in every imaginable flavor. New data show that the market share of these products has grown substantially that you, and that youth quickly migrated to flavored products that were exempt from the FDA's policy. Among high school e-cigarette users, use of disposable e-cigarettes increased by 1,000% from 2019 to 2020. And in 2020, 37% of high school users of, of flavored e-cigarettes reported using menthol products. E-cigarettes market, e-cigarette market share data from California confirmed these trends. From February 2020 to June of 2021, disposable e-cigarette sales in California increased by 51.9%. Disposable products are sleek, easily concealed, pre-charged, cheap, some less than $5, and can even have higher nicotine concentrations than even Juul. They are widely, they are widely sold in kid-friendly flavors like, like candy and fruit. From February 2020 to June 2021, menthol-flavored e-cigarette sales in California increased by 43.1% from 226.4 thousand to 324.0 thousand units. And menthol flavored cartridge sales increased by 44%. Tobacco companies have a long history of targeting and marketing flavored tobacco products to black Americas, Americans and our youth. Tobacco industry marketing often targeted at minority communities has been instrumental in increasing the use of menthol products in the dis and in the disproportionate use of menthol products by minority groups and youth. Menthol cigarettes are, market are marketed disproportionately to younger smokers and black Americans. Dating back to the 1950s, the tobacco industry has targeted these communities with marketing for menthol cigarettes through sponsorship of community and music events, 
targeting magazine advertising, youthful imagery, and marketing in, re in the retail environment. This targeting continues today. In 2018, California tobacco retailers in neighborhoods with the highest proportion of black residents were more likely to advertise menthol cigarettes and, cha and charge an estimated 25 cents less for Newport cigarettes compared with stores in neighborhoods with the lowest population of black residents. Nationwide, as a result of this targeting, 85% of black smokers smoke menthol cigarettes compared with 29% of white smokers. In 2013, the FDA released a report finding that menthol cigarettes lead to increased smoking initiation among youth and young adults, greater addiction, and decreased success in quitting smoking. Tobacco use is the number one cause of preventable deaths among Black Americans, claiming 45,000 Black lives every year. Tobacco use is a major contributor, contributor to three of the leading causes of death among Black Americans, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. The higher rates of some tobacco-caused diseases among Black Americans result in part from their greater use of menthol cigarettes, which are associated with, re with reduced secession. A study released just this month found that among the Black community, 157,000 smoking-related premature deaths and 1.5 million excess life, life years between the years 1980 and 2018 can be attributed to menthol cigarettes. The scientific evidence leaves no doubt that menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products increase the number of people, particularly kids, who try the product, become addicted, and die a premature death as a result. In Sacramento County, nearly 90% of our kids who use, tobacco, who, who use tobacco report using flavored tobacco products. In Sacramento County, half of our 52% of current youth cigarette smokers report using menthol cigarettes. In Sacramento County, the vast majority of current youth tobacco users report using a flavored product, with 96.2 using flavored vapes, 78% using flavored hookah, and 75.7 using flavored smokeless tobacco. We've all been touched by this, not just from a personal level, also a financial uh, level for our community. It's costing us great, great amount of money in order to, to deal with the repercussions of, of smoking that is starting with our youth and they're being targeted by the, by the tobacco industry. I can tell you from a personal standpoint, uh, if you had asked me 11 years ago, did I have anyone in my family with cancer? My answer would have been no. Within 15 months, uh, it, lung cancer wiped out an entire generation of my family. And they all started when they were young children. So this is personal for a lot of us. And um, so I, at that, I would like to uh, ask that the board cons uh, consider uh, approving this, this ordinance uh, and for the, for, the, for the children in our community and the minority communities that have been so heavily targeted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the time. Good. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, um, do we have a member of the board uh, with the hand up, but did, was there any more to the presentation, uh, Patrick? Did you say Dr. Kasiri was going to just be available or part of the presentation? Yes, yes, Dr. Kasiri is available. I believe um, we have uh, also staff from uh, finance standing by if there's any questions of them. I see Mr. Lemire and others. Okay, so let me um, go to- uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yes. If okay. I could add that, uh, Dr. Kasiri isn't able to be with us today, but Dr. Gail Bronson from Public Health is available to, to speak if she uh, if you have questions for her. Okay, thank, thank you, you for yes. being with okay. us, Dr. Brosnan. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. So let me go to uh, questions. I know we have probably a number of folks that are signed up to speak. We've received a good deal, good deal of correspondence, um, some of us recently as an hour or two ago. Uh, on this, but uh, let me uh, go to board member. So it's Professor Desmond. Thank you, Chair Natoli. And, and um, yeah, I just want to <laughs> preface my comments. You know, Supervisor Kennedy, I, I thank you, you know, for your leadership on public health issues. You know, you're, you're a friend and you're, you're also a, a leader on these kinds of issues. And I have a great deal of admiration uh, for you because of that. And um, yeah, it's kind of emotional. I just I got I just got struck by it. My, I, my oldest sister died of lung cancer. Uh, was a smoker for 35 years, and um, 
So, I mean, I have no <laughs> issue with the, the science and, the, and the, the, the terrible impact of these tobacco products. And, and thank you for taking the time to uh, uh, outline all of that. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, you and I had a chance to talk a, a little bit and, um, you know, when it, when it comes to, well, a couple of things, I'm, I'm just going to break down a few comments um, by, first, I want to talk a little bit about our, our process for, you know, crafting legislation here and implementing legislation, which, which we're doing, we're discussing today. Um, and then kind of talk a little bit about my philosophy, which Supervisor Kennedy, you and I spoke about that yesterday. The process, um, I guess, just start kind of starting with that. You know, it's 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 tough. The first time I saw this ordinance was on Friday, um, and so I didn't have a, a, a lot of opportunity to really dig into it and, and talk to different stakeholders about it. Um, um, you know, I'm, I think we're all used to the legislative at the, at the state capitol. That process, there are so many um, public opportunities to be heard as legislation winds its way through the process, unless of course it's a budget trailer bill. Um, and, and that certainly was the case with, with the uh, underlying um, state legislation, uh, 793, yeah, here today. So I, I just wanna preface my comments with that because if I'm not entirely prepared, that, that that's the reason. And I, um, I, I don't know, I know this, it's a discussion for another day, but uh, I don't know if this board has ever considered forming like a law and legislation you know, subcommittee. Um, I know we're much smaller than other, than other uh, uh, bodies that do that. But just as a procedural matter, so our today, we're going to be discussing this matter, but we will not be making a final decision on this, right, until second or third. Okay. So this is not the only chance the public will have an opportunity to provide input, correct, Patrick? Okay. Just want to make sure on that. So just from a process perspective, I, I, I think it's important to make sure the public knows what we're, what we're doing before we do it, especially for something like this that's going to have a great deal of impact. And, and I ask your indulgence too, because as Supervisor Kennedy, I know he has a, a, an awful lot of folks in the unincorporated area, as do I. <clears throat> so a lot of probably, a, you know, a very large percentage of the businesses that will be impacted by this are, are in my uh, district. So I just will have, uh, you know, a lot of questions about it. First, with respect to my, uh, just kind of philosophically, um, you know, it, it's tough. We, we hear people use the term nanny government or paternalistic government. And so I, I struggle with that a little bit whenever we're making, and I'm not talking about children. I mean, I, I have no uh, issue with banning these products and being, being sold to children, which they already are. But when it comes to making these decisions with adults and preventing them from using a product, um, that's where I struggle a little bit. And I, I think Supervisor Kennedy, you'll have to help help me help get me there with some of these things. Yeah, I talked to a friend the other day who chews uh, tobacco and he's an adult. He is a you know, very educated person. He is uh, chews tobacco just infrequently, but he chews the wintergreen tobacco. And he said to me, he said, Rich, who are you to tell me that I can't use this product anymore? Um, and and I, I think Supervisor Kennedy, I think this, this ordinance would include that. I mean, it would be banned in Sacramento County. Is that accurate? Exactly. Um, and, and, and I do get concerned just as a philosophical matter that if we start making these decisions on what we should ban in terms of what adults can engage in, in terms of products or activities that they can engage on, in, it's, it's kind of a, a slippery slope. And, and, I, and I don't want to be, I want to be consistent at the very least. You know, I, I look at alcohol products, for instance, and you can go down the aisle of a grocery store and see a lot of alcohol products that have that are that are that are clearly being marketed to young people because of the flavors, the fruity flavors, and and the and the uh, um, I guess some of the advertising they have. Um, and then same with cannabis. If, if you go into a, a cannabis dispensary, you know th this board is going to be having a decision or having a discussion about changing the county's approach to cannabis legalization. But it certainly strikes me that in those dispensaries, there's a lot there's a lot of products there as well that have feature fruity flavors and, and catchy marketing schemes that I could see, you know, young people uh, being attracted to as well. So I guess, you know, my first question, Supervisor Kennedy, which you and I discussed a little bit, help me make the distinction between what we're talking about today and some of those products. And 
um, you know, I mean, I'll throw that out there and see what you have to, to say. Help, help me get past this philosophical, you know, inconsistency that I, that I am concerned about. That, that, that's, that's fair, Steve Ryder Desmond. And I will tell you that I've been considering this for seven years. So this isn't something that, uh, you know, I jumped into. Um, it's just, I finally just had enough. Um, first of all, the addictive nature of this is farther is much higher than than other products that you mentioned. As far as cannabis, cannabis is highly regulated compared to tobacco. Um, uh, I, I don't know personally, but I, I hear that uh, you uh, you know you can't even get into a dispensary uh, you know without registering, without showing ID. Uh, with I mean so so children's access to uh, cannabis is already so regulated that I, I don't think it's analogous um, to that the, the the nanny gate I mean the nanny uh, <laughs> the nanny state stuff um, it, yeah I struggled with it too and I, I will tell you that um, and, but the the fact is is to me it's I mean the same thing is and you know you you're, you hear this all the time but. You know, we make people wear helmets when they're riding their motorcycle. You know, it, it, we make people wear seat belts when they're in their cars uh, because of the societal cost, I think, is what finally tipped that legislation. Uh, and, I, and so I see that th th this is the same in that category I look at it. Thanks for picking two examples that you knew would resonate with me. Yeah, well. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, the other question I had that someone actually brought up to me is, you know, it's it's not lost on me that we are. You know, I, I'm looking outside my office right right now downtown, and um, you know, we're surrounded by by a lot of folks suffering from addiction from um, really bad substances, methamphetamine, opioids, heroin, um, out on our on our streets. And you know, at a time where we're, we're we're almost not entirely legalizing these things, but we're certainly making creating more, a more permissive environment um, for some of these. But I know that's a, a side issue, but it made me think, um, someone brought up to me, you know, some of these tobacco products actually help folks who are trying to, you know, kick their addiction to a harder drug, some methamphetamine or, or some other substance. Have you, have, has there been any discussion, uh, you know, about that? Or do you have any opinion about that, uh, Supervisor Kennedy? I, in other words, do you think, is there a chance we may be removing a tool for adults, you know, to, to help make a product available to them that might help them get off a much more harmful drug. I'm, I'm curious if that's come up. Honestly, that's not a rhetorical no, question. No, no, no. It's, 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 it is an argument that is made frequently, but there's no science. Uh, there's, it's, there's no scientific basis that these products actually, I mean, there, there are those who say, well, these particularly vape products help the cessation of smoking of cigarettes. There is no scientific basis that I have seen. And in talking with, um, you know, those in the industry, I, I have not seen that, that that is a claim that I don't, I have not seen backed up by any scientific basis. Okay. Um, and then just kind of, you know, and I, I appreciate your response and, and you can understand that I'm, I'm obviously you see that I'm struggling with this. Um, getting into some of the specifics of the ordinance and, and the state law. So I, I throw it out there to you is, is um, you know, why would this state law maybe, or SB 793, um, which passed with actually, you know, pretty good bipartisan support actually at the state legislature. Now it's on hold as a result of the referendum process. But from what I'm hearing, that referendum process is probably going to fail. Um, why wouldn't we wait and, and wait and see if that happens before we take any action? Well, a, um, that's a very good question. I, I, I asked the advocates the same question and you know what it came down to. First of all, what this does is this also is consistent. And I made sure that when it was drafted that it was consistent with what the city of Sacramento is doing. So one third of our population is already operating under these rules uh, in, the, in the county. Uh, at least. Um, but as far as, you know, the way I look at it, Supervisor Desmond is, first of all, I, I'm i not as confident as you are in the, the, the initiative process coming out the way I'd like to see it come out. Um, I mean, tobacco, we know how much money they have, how many resources they have, and we, we know they're going to come after it in a big way. So, you know, I, I, I hope you're right, but I, I'm not convinced. 
Um, the, the other thing is, is that every day we wait, someone get, you know, more kids are being, are getting hooked on these every, every day we wait, you know, more people in the African-American community are being targeted and becoming hooked. Um, it, it's just, uh, it, it's, to me, it's at a level of, of dire need. And that's why I opted to introduce this rather than wait. Okay. Uh, fair enough. I know I, I, I appreciate that. I, um, you know, it's funny we, we talk about the city of Sacramento, what the city does. I mean, I'm, it, it occurs to me that it would be a, a better, from a policy perspective, almost a better approach to mirror what the state law is, is likely going to be to ensure more consistency. It's, it's funny because I hear from the business community, I know we all, we all received some um, public comment today that, that came in today from some um, um, uh, business owners who sell some of these products that would be affected. Um, and, and they're obviously against the, this ordinance for, they think it'll affect their business, but I actually met with a group of business owners. Um, and this just kind of, this, this came up in passing that the state law passed and the county is going to be considering something I had not seen the ordinance yet. Their bigger concern, I mean, they, they almost knew it was almost a fait accompli that, that, you know, that the state law was going to go into effect. Um, their bigger concern was consistency, you know, across uh, uh, jurisdictional boundaries. And, and that's something, you know, when I worked at the highway patrol, that was always something we were very cognizant of is making sure we establish a regulatory framework in the state of California that is, that is consistent, right? So businesses are not navigating uh, patchwork um, laws. And, and we experienced that in different contexts, but um, so that's a concern of, of a lot of businesses that I hear from. Um, they're, they're, they're more concerned about they're, they're, they know that the, that the city of Sacramento has done something that's, that's pretty, um, I think, pretty restrictive, uh, more restrictive anyway than the state than the state law. Their request to me was, look, if, if the county supports something, we would ask that it's, it's consistent with state law. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, like, like I said, I mean, it, to, to me, and we, we can just differ on, on, on that because I, I, like, I wanted it to be consistent with the city because, as you know, the district I represent, you can drive down many streets and you're in city, county, city, county, city, county, you know, so, so that, that's why I specifically looked at, at uh, mirroring this after the city of Sacramento. So. Okay. And see, I'm on the other. On, I'm on the other side where it's yeah. they're, they're in the county, and they'll be in the city of Citrus Heights and the city of Rancho Cordova. And so, you know, it, it, that's that, that's a bit of a challenge too. Um, and then, you know, that also kind of leads into a couple other questions that you and I actually we we talked about it a little bit um, when you and I spoke. Is that some of the? It seems to me some of the specific. You know, I'm looking at a. There was a, a headline in the news in the news clips. And a media headline that were introduced an ordinance banning candy flavored tobacco sales in Sacramento County, and it it really talks mostly about youth. Um, and this, obviously, the city of Sacramento's ordinance, this ordinance we're proposing is is much much broader than that. But I mean, it seemed to me there there is some wisdom in some of the exemptions that were created in the uh, in the state law, specifically with respect to um, hookahs. Um, that's something that's carved out because I think that's distinct from some of these uh, vaping products that really are, I agree with you, marketed towards children and their gateway um, into, into tobacco products for children. Um, I, I think I think hookahs are, enjoy a, a distinction, not only in terms of the product itself, but in terms of how they're used. Um, the state law, as you know, also made some exemptions for premium cigar products, um, but uh, you know, so those those are things that I, I you know, I, I wonder. I'd like to have a discussion. Maybe I'd like to hear from some other board members, but maybe have a discussion about some of those exemptions and whether you might be willing to consider um, implementing one or a couple of those, incorporating any of those um, into the ordinance that we're going to be considering or discussing more today. So I'll just stop my stop there and and uh, wait to hear from some of my other colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. So, so if I may, Mr. Chair, just, sure. just respond to that. So I, I too had, was considering the a hookah exemption um, because it's a cultural thing as much as anything. Uh, and um, 
but I, I did come across some numbers, if I might. Uh, a single hookah tobacco smoking session, which is typically 40 to 45 minutes, exposes its users to 25 times the tar, 125 times the smoke, 2.5 times the nicotine, and 10 times the carbon monoxide as compared to a single cigarette. So, so if, if we were to go down that route, I just want to get that, you know, have that fully understood. Thank you. Um, before I go to the next supervisor, I just wanted to say, Supervisor Desmond, you, in your earlier comments, you said you thought there was going to be several hearings. What's being proposed today, again, it's entirely up to the board. If this is introduced, it would be the first reading. And then if, as at least recommended in the staff report, would come back to us for adoption uh, on the 25th. So just be aware of that, that this was at least advertised uh, for consideration as the introduction of amendments to the existing tobacco ordinance. So uh, it wasn't just a workshop, and not that you said the workshop, but I just wanted to be aware that um, if action is taken today in the affirmative, whatever that were to look like, it would be back to us in two weeks for adoption unless we chose to do something else. So is that correct, Patrick? That's my understanding. Yes, I, I, I won't speak for Ms. Travis, but uh, yes, this, this is an ordinance that's being proposed. So the first reading would be today. Second reading would be at least seven days, so two weeks with our rules. Uh, and um, uh, however, if it were to be um, uh, substantially changed today, and again, Lisa can address this, um, then I believe it would have to go through another first reading. Lisa? Yes, that's correct. If there's a substantial or substantive changes to this ordinance today, then we would bring it back in two weeks um, for further uh, introduction and then continue it to adoption. Okay. And then lastly, the way ordinances are done allows for a 30 day uh, implementation and so become effective unless otherwise specified in the ordinance itself, it would take effect whatever the requirements were 30 days from the time it was only adopted. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Supervisor Desmond, any, any clarification on that? I just want to be clear because you kind of referenced Yeah, that. no, I, I, and I appreciate that, Chair Natoli, and I, I think that's important for the public to understand as well. Yeah. Um, right. No, that, that's very helpful, and I'll probably have some additional comments. Okay, here. good. Yeah, okay, thank, you. thank you. Uh, okay, Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let's see, one of the questions I was going to ask about was <coughs> would it be effective because a lot of the business owners have, um, you know, purchased inventory, and so it could be a financial, have a financial, I'm not sure what kind of financial impact it could have. Um, I did want to ask, uh, my understanding is this is for the unincorporated area only, so it would not pertain to uh, any of the seven or five or seven cities. And I wanted to ask Ben Lamira if he could maybe speak to, or if someone could speak to the financial implications um, to the county. That was one of the things that we had talked about in the past when we had brought this issue up. And I remember us, um, I believe we heard something like it was a couple million dollars annually, or maybe that was what Sacramento City was potentially going to lose. Um, so thanks for being here, Ben. Ben Lamera, Director of Finance. And in answer to the question is that city did say when they passed their ordinance, um, they were estimating about a $2 million loss in sales tax revenue associated with tobacco products. Um, we're not able to verify that that was a $2 million loss to them. And it's a very tough thing to estimate because there's other tobacco products that are wrapped amongst the, the tobacco sales. And from what we were able to see in some of their, at least in their financial statements, we weren't able to see an impact of, of the loss in revenue. Um, and that was, I think we looked back at, for, uh, at just their last CAFR, and we couldn't tell that there was actually a loss in, in revenues associated with the, uh, with the ban. Um, it's a tough number to estimate. Like I said, the flavored tobacco is wrapped amongst the other tobacco products. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted to uh, say that I did receive calls and visits from the Indian community regarding the hookah. Um, some of the, uh, you know, some of the, uh, in, um, some they shared with me about the rich culture and tradition and how this is something that um, has been a part of their culture for over a hundred years. And so that, um, and I guess there's hookah bars. I, I've never been to one, but we have hookah bars, which potentially we would be shutting down businesses, which is, um, so that I'm concerned about. But, but the other thing that uh, comes to my mind is, is the idea of some of the businesses are within five or 15 minutes from a border, you know, to another county or city that, that does have um, flavored vaping, which bears the question, you know, is this something that you just, you know, punish your local business people, they can't sell it, but someone five minutes away can, or someone who lives in a neighborhood and has a convenient place, they go close by, you know, to, to, to get the flavored vaping, which is helping them, you know, kick a 20 year habit on cigarettes. Um, but they have to now drive to Placer County to get their um, their vaping cigarettes. Um, I'm not a smoker, so I, whatever they call it. But the, the point I'm making is it doesn't solve the problem. I'm, I mean, I'm concerned about if it solves the problem, which I think Supervisor Desmond's point about doing it, you know, doing at the state level, at least it's consistent across the board and fair to every business and we're not punishing businesses that um, are in close proximity to other competition. The other thing that uh, that occurs to me and that was the conversation that we had a long time ago around um, why not you know use some of those revenues that we have on some of these products to do a better job enforcing the laws that are already in place or maybe even have the the laws be so strict like if they sell it if they get caught selling it to kids they lose their their license to you know their license is revoked and they have a ten thousand dollar fine you know instead of up to ten thousand dollars we just revoke their license if they get caught selling it to children um, I, I don't want children to get on cigarettes and I want people who are smoking and trying to get off cigarettes. I don't think it's fair to, um, uh, you know, I guess, try to insert myself into their decision about their life and their health. I think that's an individual decision. So th those are some of the things I I um, I I am I understand what your you know I respect your priorities, Supervisor Kennedy, of thinking of people's health, and um, I'll, I'd be interested. I I have also received a lot of letters from the business community, and also some communications from the Indian community around the hookah, and also those who are actually vapors, adult um, vapors, who actually feel like for the first time in years, they may have a shot at getting off of cigarettes. And then we ask ourselves, you know, we have cigarettes and we have marijuana, we have alcohol, and we have all these other things that you can get addicted to, but we're picking this one thing. Um, so those are some of the thoughts that come to my mind, and I'm going to um, look forward to hearing from public comment um, what they bring um, uh, to, to share with us about their thoughts. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Frost. Supervisor Cernan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> well, um, I guess uh, I should never take for granted uh, what I might think is 
going to be a slam dunk for this board. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess I, I come from this from a pretty um, simple distillation of what I fundamentally believe our responsibilities are as elected members of this board. Uh, and it's something that we practice very, very regularly. In fact, no more so than in the last 22 months. And that is to a large extent uh, to set policy, to make uh, decisions, thoughtful decisions that are vested in the charge to protect public health. Uh, to me, um, you know, whether you want to call it a no brainer or low hanging fruit, uh, if you think about the fact that more than one out of every fourth death from cancer in California comes from smoking. And then you cross check that against our own personal experiences. I don't believe there's a single person on this board that hasn't been touched in one way very intimately about uh, or from someone dear to them, either being sick or passing from cancer. Uh, Supervisor Kennedy mentioned his uh, his experience, as did Supervisor Desmond. You know, I lost three of my parents uh, within seven years from the disease, and uh, it's little known. <clears throat> it's little known, but my uh, my late father uh, was a uh, smoker, not an aggressive smoker, uh, very early in his adulthood for about ten years. Uh, so was uh, so was my biological mother. Um, whether or not that was attributable to that time in their life. Uh, I'm not a doctor and, and I've not been told that, but um, nonetheless, it does tie me to um, being a family member uh, close to someone who's died from it. If you think about um, what we do in terms of not just, uh, you know, the uh, analogies to traffic safety that were mentioned earlier, but um, you know some of the 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 things that um, we institutionalize as a county in terms of our practice to protect public health, whether it be uh, all the infrastructure that we have set in motion long before uh, COVID to keep um, uh, communicable disease in check. Um, this to me is, is part and parcel of that general charge in terms of being good stewards of, um, of, of ensuring threats are kept at a minimum uh, to keep our constituents healthy. And let's be clear, this is not an outright ban. It's not like the, the uh, individual that wants to kick cigarettes can't switch to vaping. They can. They're just going to have to vape a tobacco flavor. Um, and, um, you know, again, I, I don't see this at all uh, as being uh, distinct in any, in any way from some of the, the other um, uh, decisions that we've made, um, you know, decades ago, in fact, uh, to, to keep our, our constituents uh, uh, healthy and disease free. Um, the economic arguments, I, I, I can appreciate that, I can understand it, but um, I don't feel, speaking for myself, that I've been elected to this post um, to let, uh, you know, uh, the economics uh, of this uh, supersede the fact that if we can keep uh, adults and especially young people from even um, beginning the habit of uh, smoking or tobacco use in general, um, you know, we, we have fulfilled our, um, our responsibility. And, you know, I appreciate uh, obviously the, the great thought that Supervisor Desmond has given this and and I always appreciate um, the fact that he's uh, seems to keep an open mind and wants to to hear from uh, both sides uh, of this uh, of most 
if not all policy debates that have been in front of him since his uh, election to this board. But um, uh, in terms of attempting to, to join my colleague, Supervisor Kennedy, to try and convince uh, Supervisor Desmond or Supervisor Frost of why this does constitute good public policy and why this is needed, I, I would simply ask you to dig deep and um, reflect on the charge that we have uh, to advance what is uh, good, appropriate, um, and healthy for the constituents that we serve. That's why I'm uh, very supportive uh, of this. I'm not, uh, quite frankly, interested in um, negotiating uh, to the bottom a, a watered down version of it. I think there's a lot to be said for consistency when it comes to um, a prospective policy like this in the county, uh, when it's already been adopted uh, by our largest uh, uh, sister jur jurisdiction in the city of Sacramento. And again, it's not an outright ban. It, uh, it, it simply, um, for me, uh, just uh, will uh, make it a little more difficult uh, for people to poison themselves uh, and to um, begin on the path of addiction that uh, the, the statistics tell us uh, more often than not are gonna lead to lung disease, cancer, emphysema. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. I'm eager to hear from the public. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna. Uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Yes, thank you. And thank you for that, Supervisor Cerna. Um, I just, a couple of things that did come up. Uh, there was a 2020 uh, Surgeon General report um, that on smoking cessation that says, and I'll quote, there's presently inadequate evidence to conclude that e-cigarettes in general increase smoking cessation. In fact, there are a lot of products on the market that are not smoke-based to help people uh, quit smoking already. So, so I, I, I just that's not a compelling argument to me. Uh, and also, as far as the costs, um, the societal costs are well known and well documented of smoking and and what it does. Um, approximately 13.3 billion dollars in healthcare costs each year in the state, including 3.6 billion dollars in medical expenditures. Uh, the policy. Um, this would lead to substantial savings over the long term. Um, this, the, the state will save approximately $11,000 in, in long term health care costs for every smoker who quits because of a policy like this, and at least $21,000 for every youth who is prevented from smoking. So, the, 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 if you've got dollars and cents it, there, there is an argument to be made there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You bet. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Um, with that, then I think we have a number of folks that have signed up to um, speak to this. And I know we received a good deal of correspondence. I wanted to ask one question though about the ordinance. Does it change the spacing requirements between tobacco retailers as a part of this? I don't believe that it does. It only affects um, the type of products being sold. Okay, so there's no changes in, because we've had an ordinance on the books now for gosh, 25, 30 years, uh, different elements to it, but it does not. So the only thing that affects is the type of product uh, that could, that either is allowed or prohibited in Lisa, is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, Flo, I'm gonna turn to you to help uh, manage the calls. Yes, sir, uh, please transfer the first caller. How many, how many do we have, Flo? We Hopefully. have about 29, uh, maybe even 30 callers in queue. Okay, before we start, I, you know, I've been allowing three minutes today and it's seemed people a, bit, a little less rushed, but uh, if you can be succinct, recognize we're now approaching five o'clock and with that, uh, we'd be at 6.30 before we concluded the, the calls potentially. So um, try to be concise, obviously get your point across. We will still allow for three minutes and. Uh, then bring it back to the board once we've concluded the public testimony. So, okay, thank you. Flo, go ahead. Okay. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have, um, please start with your comments. Okay. Hi, my name is Angel, and I am an advocacy and training intern at the Sacramento LGBT Community Center and a resident of District 1. 
Our center took an early support position on this ordinance and asked that the Board of Supervisors vote in favor of ending the sale of flavored tobacco products in Sacramento County. At the center, we support and provide health and other services for LGBT youth and communities in need. Research shows that LGBT communities are nearly twice as likely to smoke e-cigarettes than their cisgender counterparts, due in large part to targeted advertising in LGBT press and other industry tactics. Big Tobacco preys on our youth and communities of color with kid-friendly candy and minty menthol flavors. Ending the sale of these products in Sacramento County will make it that much harder for tobacco companies to hook more youth onto tobacco and suffer lifetime addictions to nicotine. Tobacco companies have spent millions in our state to continue pushing the product. And you can help break the cycle in Sacramento County. We ask that you pass this important ordinance and end Big Tobacco's profit off community health. Thank you, Joel. Okay, please send the next caller. Supervisor Kennedy, do you have a question or a comment? I see your hand up. Okay. Hi, Sorry about that. Hi, caller. Please uh, start with your comments. You have uh, three minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. My name is Rima Corey. I'm general counsel for Fumari, which is a premium hookah tobacco manufacturer. And I'm also one of the founding members of the National Hookah Community Association, which was founded to protect and preserve the rich thousand year cultural tradition of hookah. First and foremost, um, you know, we as an association uh, represent Middle Easterners, Afghans, Turks, Indians, North Africans, um, Armenians, Indians, I mean, this uh, association really does give a voice to a lot of these minority uh, communities that uh, celebrate and use uh, hookah in um, social events, uh, celebratory events. It is really a centerpiece uh, for social engagement, especially for Muslims uh, who don't drink. Uh, this is uh, how they bond. And, you know, hookah is not the problem with youth. Um, hookah use, use amongst youth is one of the lowest of all the tobacco products. Um, it is a very unique tobacco product. Uh, it cannot be used with uh, other devices such as vape. It can't be chewed or rolled um, or used in other pipes like bongs. Uh, hookah tobacco is only used in a hookah. Hookahs are generally three feet tall. They are very difficult to conceal. Uh, kids aren't hiding them in their backpack and pocket and smoking them at school. Um, they take about 20 to 30 minutes to set up. So, you know, kids aren't sneaking them into school and smoking them in the bathroom. It just takes way too long. Recess would be done before then. Um, and, of course, you know, they're not being confiscated at schools. Um, you know, hookah is one of the least used tobacco products by youth, according to the CDC. And the FDA agrees that although there's a correlation between flavors and youth uh, initiation of tobacco products, that they do not see the same correlation with youth usage because of its low prevalence. So here we have a cultural tradition, not an issue with youth, and it will be banned if this passes without a hookah exemption because hookah tobacco only comes in flavors. So therefore, uh, it would be a de facto ban on this rich cultural tradition. So before we solve a problem that doesn't exist, please understand the facts. We ask uh, that you please consider this and that you exempt hookah like it's exempted in um, the FD 793, the California State Flavored Tobacco Ban, along with premium cigars over $12 and loose leaf tobacco, because all of these items are not traditionally used by youth. So please don't let our cultural tradition become collateral damage. This would be an unintended consequence. Uh, we expect our lawmakers to understand the difference and to, pre and to give consideration to all the minority communities that will be disproportionately impacted by such legislation. Uh, please take a moment to understand what that impact would be. We appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rio. Okay, next call. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jessica Garcia. 
I am a resident of District 3, and I'm finishing up my final year at Sacramento State. I just want to start off by um, thanking the council for their work on this ordinance. This is such a great step in creating a safer and healthier Sacramento for youth and young adults. The tobacco industry has intentionally mar marketed their candy-flavored products to lure minorities and young adults for decades. Flavors like dulce de leche, churro, and tamarindo are just a couple of examples of popular candy in the Latino community that have been trans, um, transformed into flavors and tobacco flavors by the tobacco industry. These products were made with the intention of gaining youth and young adult users, um, not adults. Consequently, e-cigarettes, um, which are offered in over 15,000 flavors, are now the most used tobacco products among Hispanic and Latino high school students. As a young Latina, it is concerning to me that my community members, um, that com I'm, I'm sorry, my community continues to be targeted by the tobacco industry as a direct result is being negatively affected by disproportionate burden of disease and death. I urge you to protect the lives and future of our youth, young adults by approving this ordinance to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco. Thank you. Jessica, before you hang up, if you're still there, what, what did you say? Some of the flavors? Did you say the churro? The churro flavored? The person hung up the phone. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay. I know, I know <laughs> one of them was tamarindo, which is a trop tropical fruit. Okay, tamarindo. Okay, got it. I just, yeah, I wasn't able to. I was trying to write it down here. So thanks. Uh, no. Okay, next caller. Please send the next caller. Can someone send the next caller? Um, I think the feed must have cut off for everyone uh, and then they jumped back in, so sorry about that. Okay. Hi caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Knox. I'm a Sacramento resident and the director of the American Cancer Society's advocacy work in California and Hawaii. And we urge you to adopt the comprehensive ordinance before you as is without any exemptions. We know that tobacco kills more people than alcohol, drugs, guns, car accidents combined. We know that the tobacco industry's use of flavored products is what's driving the youth, uh, youth vaping epidemic and is the basis for its ongoing practice of predatory marketing of menthol in communities of color. And we know that the history of the tobacco industry shows that they will exploit any loopholes or exemptions left open to them. And that's why it's critical that the board follow the lead of the city and align with its comprehensive policy of prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products with no exemptions. And, and to be clear, the state law is designed to be a floor, not a ceiling. Local governments can, should, and always have been able to adopt tobacco control measures stronger than those set out in state law. And in fact, it's the only reason why California has the strongest tobacco control laws in the world. And that is because local jurisdictions in California adopted them first. And their lead was followed by the state, and then other states, and then the nation, and then other nations. So we urge you to adopt this measure in its strongest form, and we thank you for your consideration and leadership. Thank you, Jim. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have uh, three minutes. Yes, hi. My name is Dalbir Chahal. I'm a retailer and uh, supervisor in Natoli's uh, District 3. Um, I'm also representing uh, Store Owner Association, APCA. I would like, first I would like to thank Supervisor Desmond and uh, Supervisor Frost for their thoughtful comments. Um, I'm requesting uh, Board of Supervisors not to proceed with this, van, this ban since a statewide flavor ban is already going to be on the ballot this year. 
you should let voters decide if they want to ban any flavor tobacco or not. Not waiting till November 2022 is a voter suppression makes the whole BOS look like bad regardless of the topic. I also want to remind you that the 30-day sell-off is not sufficient as the retail businesses are really slow and struggling financially due to COVID. Uh, Supervisor Frost uh, was asking a question like uh, what finances we are talking about. Throwing away the unsold inventory would be a financial loss for a retailer, especially for the 30 days. 30-day sell-off is, is, is too little to sell the existing inventory unless the uh, uh, county wants to buy uh, inventory from us back, you know. Um, and uh, Supervisor Kennedy was talking about that he did everything to match this to the Sacramento City, but even Sacramento City gave us six months to, to sell the, the existing inventory. Also, um, menthol cigarettes and chewing tobacco has nothing to do with the, the the candy flavors or kids. So menthol and chewing tobacco should be excluded from this ban. Uh, I think the young children are more getting ho hooked on to the flavored marijuana than to the flavored cigarettes. So that should also be considered. <laughs> cigarettes is, is not that harmful as you guys think. And the last thing I would like to ask to uh, uh, Supervisor Kennedy that uh, he's talking about uh, uh, children's getting hands on the, on the tobacco product. I mean, we are responsible uh, store owners. Where those children are getting that tobacco? I mean, is it just a, just a political agenda to, to, to push this ban? I mean, or is, is there, are there any numbers? Sacramento County did any research, like how many retailers got caught selling the, 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 those products to the, the children? That would be my question for Supervisor Kennedy. So at the end, I would request you guys not to, not to proceed with this ban. Let voters decide in this ballot. What they what they want to do with the flavored tobacco? Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Uh, could you please, can hi? Could you mute the meeting in the background? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you so much. And then you can start with your comments. You have three three minutes. Hello, supervisors. My name is Twyla Laster. I'm the project director of the Seoul Project. However, today I am making public comment on my own time. As a resident and constituent of Supervisor Cerna's district, as a resident, I strongly encourage you to restrict the sale of menthol and all flavored smoking products with no exemptions for menthol nor hookah. Hookah is not a safe alternative to smoking. In fact, hookah contains many toxins mm -hmm. that can cause the same issues as smoking other products. You've encountered pushback from hookah lobbyists and business establishments with claims that because using hookah is a cultural practice, flavored hookah tobacco should be exempt from other flavored tobacco sales restrictions. Thus, while all tobacco retailers would be restricted from selling flavored products, hookah lounges and retailers would continue to sell. Recent data indicates that hookah use is not unique to any community or culture, and that its use is becoming increasingly common and addicting among youth uh, and young people, mainly from different backgrounds. The five hookah lounges in this county with their nightclub atmosphere have nothing to do with Middle Eastern culture and everything to do with increasing profits from disease and potential death of young people. CDC facts were misquoted by the second caller this evening. The CDC website clearly states that hookah use has been on the rise over the past two years from use by high school students and college students. The supervisor uh, Natoli asked about flavors. There are apple, cane, mint, papaya, queen of sex, mango, peach, on and on. And so in the midst of COVID, there's nothing more important than getting these products out of our community. Smokers are more susceptible for COVID, uh, with COVID infections. Therefore, menthol and all flavored products, which specifically includes little cigars, cigarillos, hookah products, cigarettes, vape products, and all electronic smoking devices, must be restricted from sales to protect the health and well-being of all Sacramento County residents. Thank you for your consideration. This concludes my public comment. Thank you, Ms. Lasseter. 
Okay, next caller, please. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello, members of the board. My name is Amanda Simpson, and I am a policy analyst with the Sierra Club's Environmental Justice in Tobacco Control Project, which focuses on tobacco product waste. Like many of my colleagues have already emphasized, flavored tobacco products are driving a youth vaping epidemic. According to the 2021 National Youth Tobacco Survey, 85% of youth cigarette users use flavored products. Menthol, in particular, is reported as the most popular flavor. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that tobacco product waste is toxic and dangerous. E-cigarette waste, in particular, contains lead, mercury, heavy metals, plastics, battery acid, flammable list batteries, and nicotine, which is listed as an acute hazardous waste by the EPA. In fact, nicotine is toxic that the ingestion of as little as two cigarette filters is enough to poison family pets. As you might expect, e-cigarettes cannot simply be thrown in the garbage. You should also know that under federal hazardous waste law, schools, not the tobacco industry, are bearing the financial and administrative burden of properly disposing of these toxic and dangerous products. With that, thank you, members of the board, for prioritizing the health of our youth, pets, and the environment. Thank you, Amanda. Can you please send the next caller? Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Good evening, County Board Supervisors and staff. My name is Paramajit Kara, and I'm a retailer in Carmichael, and also um, a board member of APCA Association. My, my another friend just called Dalvir Chahal. I am agree with him on everything. And my concern is, uh, I am opposing uh, on ban of a flavored tobacco. Uh, first of all, ban of a tobacco in Sacramento County will not solve the problem. Uh, basically, like Sacramento City ban it, I think uh, uh, we have not get any survey what they uh, gain out of it. Did it everybody stop, uh, you know, smoking uh, flavored tobacco in Sacramento County? basically is going to shift from our county to a different city and our neighbor counties. Um, and our, uh, all the retailers now is we have a good cash registers uh, and we are very responsible retailers. And it's not our mission to sell to the miners. We have our own kids. We don't want any kids to be uh, smoking. Uh, we just want to be a, a uh, just want to uh, you know share our things with this, like Roseville uh, decided to ban on tobacco, and they send the survey out there, send the decoys out there to see how many retailers they get busted. They get zero, so they stop it. They say, well, if we don't, have, the retailer is not the problem. So the, most of the people buy it, you know, mo, you know, the adult passing to them, and or they buy online. So. And also, I just want to mention is if we the bill is passed, then we still we need more than 30 days. Definitely, Sacramento County gave us six months. It was good enough. And we, if we look at six months, we are very close to the November 2022, where is that a referendum comes. So my request to you guys uh, is, uh, please, uh, just hold this bill till at least uh, November 2022. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marvie. Next okay. caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. 
Good afternoon, board. My name is Alex Winston. I'm here with Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, also known as PAVE, which is a national grassroots organization founded by parents in response to the youth vaping epidemic. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank Supervisor Kennedy for sharing um, the staggering statistics regarding this issue that illustrate my family's story. In 2017, my son started vaping menthol nicotine products at his high school, and he still does three years later at age 18. My husband, who was trying to quit, was vaping menthol and died at age 42 of a severe heart arrhythmia with 500 milligram levels of unregulated nicotine in his system, leaving me a single mother of four kids. E-cigarettes are not a cessation device. My husband was mixed race, black and Native American, two of the highest risk populations to suffer from tobacco related health disparities and the predatory marketing of methyl products by the tobacco industry. His life mattered. Please vote in favor of the proposed flavored tobacco product ordinance, including hookah, menthol and e-cigarettes. No person, business or government should profit off of people's lives. We were too late for my son who is already addicted and for my husband who is no longer with us. Let us not be too late for the next generation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex, for sharing. Okay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Natoli and Sacramento Board of Supervisors. My name is Kimberly Bankston Lee, and I'm the Senior Program Director with the Soul Project. I'm sorry for your losses from tobacco-related deaths. I share that, too, with you in losing my mom to smoking. I'd also like to acknowledge the difficult time that we're all going through as, as a result of the variant outbreak of COVID-19, and I hope that your families are safe and healthy. Smoking is most likely associated with getting sicker with COVID-19, People who smoke are nearly two and a half times more likely to get really sick, like admitted to an intensive care unit, needing mechanical ventilation or dying compared to those who do not smoke. In Sacramento County, 20 to 30 percent of African Americans, as well as people living at or below poverty, smoke, and most started before the age of 18. Eight out of 10 African American smokers smoke menthols. This is true for both adult and youth smokers. Flavored tobacco, including the very first flavor menthol, is appealing to youth because it numbs the throat, which disguises the harmful effects of smoking. And over half of youth smokers use menthol cigarettes. Menthol is also an anesthetic. Comprehensive policies that protect youth, the poor, and African Americans, and really all communities, include prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco and vape products, including the flavor menthol, and including flavored shisha tobacco used in hookah pipes. There's community support in Sacramento for this kind of policy. In a public poll, opinion poll conducted by the Soul Project, 67% of African Americans support restricting the sale of flavored tobacco. And comprehensive policies reverse the discrimination inflicted by the tobacco industry, not cause it. The industry lures the black community by placing cheap flavored products in our neighborhoods and uses the Middle Eastern, Indian, and other communities by suggesting flavored shisha, not regular tobacco, is part of the culture when it is not. It wasn't until the 90s companies started adding fruit flavors. Then it exploded over the world and became very popular. The cultural tradition is pure tobacco, not flavored shisha. The industry is simply using black and all these other cultures to fill their pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Next caller, okay. please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Isam Jwainat, and I am a, my wife and I have been uh, uh, smoke shop owners since 2008. I want to thank you, the board, first of all, for your time. I know you guys have been on uh, since about 9, 9.30, so I know it's probably very tiring for you right now. We're all having a hard time thinking. 
But I want to ask that you not proceed with this ban, item number 59, since a statewide flavor ban is already going to be in effect and on the ballot, I mean, in 2022. You know, I also want to remind you guys that, you know, we've all been impacted, including yourselves, and we've been slower and struggling financially due to COVID. I mean, my wife and my kids and myself currently suffer from anxiety induced by the past couple of years from dealing with COVID. And to put this on us right now, I mean, and not just us, it, it just and everybody in general is a lot. And for us to have to clear our inventory in such a short amount of time would really just affect us mentally, physically, and emotionally. We need ample time to adhere to these guidelines that you guys are trying to put into effect. I mean, and and study has shown. I mean, there's 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 a study that's been shown, and and uh, numbers have come out from you know the San Francisco ban that has been in effect for a few years now, that numbers in vaping among youth have a, has actually risen risen since the 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 vaping ban has been in effect. So how does that make sense? You know, do, uh, we do our jobs as as shop owners as adults as humans and as as people that are empathetic and sympathetic to our to other individuals to make sure that these products do not get in the hands of children we've been in business again like i said since 2008 and not once have i ever received a letter other than saying that we've done a good job by not selling to a minor and we've never sold to any minors in our record of in our time of doing business so we're doing our part the job the, that comes down to the parents, the parents teaching their kids what's right from wrong, what's wrong from right. I mean, you know, we're all we're all adults too at, at the same time, and there's adults that like things. I mean, I'm an adult. I like ice cream. I like I like I like Skittles. You know, can I go get that? Yeah, I can go get that. I mean, but you 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 guys have to understand that you know we are all adults and we we have a right to choose we should be able to choose that's that's why we live in america that's why we these people that you're hearing from with from india and and, and middle easterners they come here because there's an o opportunity that they didn't have back home you know i think there's a bigger problem that's going on honestly and if you look at the numbers and uh, you know if you look at the, there are more deaths and more illnesses among youth from diabetes from evil, from kids going into any store that they want, pulling anything off the shelf without an adult that says chocolate, uh, Reese's Pieces, um, you know, sweet and sour, all this stuff that is, 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 is causing our kids to get sick, you know. And, and when it comes to COVID, one of the biggest things they say, for example, that uh, affects these kids is, is obesity, is, is, is unhealthiness. Let's focus on that. I mean, we're, the ban is going to come. You guys, it's, it's going to be on the ballot for 2023, 2022. Let it play out. Let us have ample time to make sure things work out right. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Okay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please uh, start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, supervisors. My name is Marissa Greenband, and I'm the director of tobacco control projects at Breathe California Sacramento region. We're a local nonprofit agency. Tobacco use remains the single most preventable cause of disease and death in the U.S. And I want to remind you that this puts this product in a category of its own when it comes to the considerations of policy and public health. While public health advocates have made decades of progress in reducing the burden of tobacco products on our communities, Big Tobacco has fought to continue making a profit by enticing new users with addictive flavored tobacco products. Tobacco products, including vaping and hookah products, are being marketed to our community members under the veil of enticing flavors that mimic fruits and even candy. The tobacco industry and public health advocates alike know that these flavors have been marketed to youth in particular, even mint and menthol flavored products. There is some misconception around menthol not being a youth flavor, but youth are not exempt from the attractive qualities of this flavor and the way it covers the harshness of tobacco. Over half of youth who smoke cigarettes smoke menthols, and mint and menthol flavors are among the most popular and vape used by youth. Similar to vaping products, the tobacco industry has co-opted the use of hookah too, commercializing hookah use and incorporating flavors to entice entice youth users to this highly addictive product. In the U.S., nearly 80% of youth hookah users report using hookah because it comes in flavors that they like. 
I also want to note that hookah is primar primarily used by young adults aged 18 to 29 years in California, and the Hispanic Latino population makes up the largest proportion of young adult hookah users at 54%. In addition, over 9% of high school students report ever using hookah. Before I conclude my public comment, I want to recognize the youth advocates that work with Breathe, as well as multiple partner agencies who are not able to make the call in time today with school and extracurriculars. But ahead of this meeting, they sent to your offices 278 postcards via mail about their concerns around flavored tobacco in the community. You might have also seen the digital billboard that one of Breathe's groups ran in the month of December on Business 80 near Fulton Avenue, which called attention to the fact that nearly 90% of Sac County youth who use tobacco report using a flavored product. And if you missed it, you can find it on Breathe's Instagram page to check that out. Thank you, supervisors, for hearing our comments this evening. Thank you for your comments and for referencing some of the work the young people did to uh, communicate their concerns. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Chris Hudgens. Appreciate your um, your time today. I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate you uh, hearing all these comments. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm with the National Hookah Community Association. I want to talk about hookah a little bit further. You've heard a lot of statistics and uh, different different uh, points made, but I think the important thing to to focus on is hookah is not a uh, issue for youth abuse. Uh, the FDA and CDC do an annual survey about uh, youth and uh, use, uh, youth use of tobacco, and hookah is consistently one of the smallest categories, the lowest categories, coming in around 2%. For comparison's sake, uh, vape is up around 20%. The, the, uh, there's many, many reasons why it's, it's uh, not often used by youth. Part of it is logistical and challenges. Uh, a, a hookah is several feet tall. It's not something that is easily lit or carried around uh, in a backpack. It is the only way to smoke hookah. And additionally, hookah is, is generally sold in tobacco specialty stops or lounges, places that require of age uh, verification. And in fact, um, the, the hookah community completely supports strengthening uh, strengthening policies to prevent youth access. We supported that at the state level with uh, SB 793, making, making it harder for youth to enter uh, places where hookah may be available. Uh, and, and we believe that the, the county should mirror SB 793 with the same exemption and the same protections to prevent youth access. Uh, it's also important to remember that, that many of the folks and business owners who who use and sell hookah are, are immigrants or, or uh, minority groups and, and that all hookah is flavored. So a ban on hookah in Sacramento County means that the hookah lounges there are going to close. And the hookah, th those lounges verify age before individuals come in and take steps to prevent youth access to the product. And we fully support that. So I think we need to consider all of these uh, the, the possible outcomes of this, fully supportive of, of preventing youth access to hookah, but you have to balance that with taking responsible steps not to close immigrant-owned business, immigrant and minority-owned businesses, and mirror what the state has done with SB 793. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hutchins. Okay, next caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. First, I'd like to thank Chair Natoli and the entire board supervisors for hearing this very critical ban on the matter on our agenda. My name is Ryan McClinton. I'm a lifetime resident of Sacramento, California. County, excuse me, Sacramento County. Um, a public health advocate, a community organizer. Um, but today, I'm here with the campaign for tobacco free kids to support this ban. The reason why I'm calling because for this particular ban is because it's, it connects to me on a personal level. As a son, I've watched my dad battle the addiction of nicotine, seeing how much he'd rather not be on it. He currently is in his fourth round of being smoke-free for five years, and my stepmom as well joined him in that battle. 
The reality is that so many of the smokers that we're talking about and the folks who would use these flavored tobacco products, and yes, my dad started with menthol and, and eventually has tried other vaping products uh, once they became available. However, but my, <clears throat> what I found talking to so many smokers is that they would rather not be in that battle and they definitely don't want to see their kids in that battle. We're having a lot of discussion around what the impact is on our youth and the access to youth. Yes, that needs to be the focal point, but we also need to take account for the people who are currently hurting right now. Our county took an aggressive approach, one that I'm great, grateful for, to say that racism is a public health crisis. What does that mean in policies? It means that when we have policies that are causing poisonous outcomes to our communities, we're seeing our infant mortality rates being impacted, we're seeing our black communities being harmed, our Latino communities being harmed, buy tobacco products in them at affordable rates where we don't have quality food access, where we don't have quality produce. When I'm talking to a lot of these store owners who are calling in who are saying that these that this ban would hurt their business and hurt their constituents, why aren't those same store owners providing better health outcomes, better health opportunities for their clients? There was a caller who talked about kids buying, grabbing candy and and chocolate and sweets off of the counters, yet you sell those same products in your smoke shops. So I don't understand how we're prioritizing wellness when we're seriously arguing about keeping harmful products in our county. We have an opportunity as a board, as a county, to represent how do we start restoring the health outcomes that have been ravaging our communities for so long? How do we make the smart investment to make sure that we don't have more stories like what Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor um, Cerna and Supervisor Desmond have shared about their own personal battles that they've seen and the impacts of nicotine usage and addiction? This is our opportunity to make that right. This is our opportunity to live into the policy that says racism is a public health crisis and change those outcomes going forward. I urge you to strongly consider supporting this ban and making sure that we don't allow this cancer to continue working its way through our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Next caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have uh, three minutes. Hi, my name is Dr. Kylie Avison, and I'm a Sacramento area pediatrician. I'm in full support of a comprehensive policy restricting the sale of flavored tobacco products. As has been well demonstrated, flavored tobacco products differentially affect our pediatric population and our communities of color. I recall a specific instance in which I cared for a teenage patient who was hospitalized for something we call E-Valley. E-Valley stands for e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. And E-Valley is just that, it's injurious. It's a serious and sometimes fatal lung disease that is directly linked to vaping and e-cigarettes. My patient, like 80% of E-Valley cases, was young. Before coming into the hospital, she was a normal, healthy teenager. But on arrival, she was popping up blood and could barely breathe. She was hospitalized for over a week and luckily was able to return home. But in over a quarter of cases, our patients end up on ventilators. And 2% of the time, these patients will die. E-Valley is a completely preventable disease, and deaths due to E-Valley are completely preventable deaths. So here, we have a product directly linked to the death of young people, and that same product is preferentially marketed to our young populations under the guise of fun flavors. As a pediatrician, the answer is clear. We must ban the sale of flavored tobacco products to keep our children and our community safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Finn. Next, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. This is Ann Delcor. I am the founder of the Anti-Vaping Alliance in Sacramento and a member of Parents Against Vaping Electronic Cigarettes. A flavored tobacco ban can prevent thousands of people, especially teens, from initiating tobacco use. My journey in advocacy for stronger tobacco laws began in March of 2019 on the early side of the teen vaping epidemic. As a parent volunteer at Rio Americano High School, I worked closely with the counselors and the administration. That spring, they became overwhelmed by students who were vaping, congregating in the bathrooms, meeting up in cars to share devices and flavored tobacco, even vaping in the classroom. 
noting often that the vapor smelled like candy, and teachers had a very difficult time identifying who was vaping. The devices are so discreet. Administrators became overwhelmed with confiscating the flavored tobacco bottles and the devices, often suspending students. 100% of the tobacco confiscated was flavored tobacco. Vaping had become a major distraction to education. So we decided to address the issue head on, and I started the Anti-Vaping Alliance, a group of students, parents, administrators, and health experts. We've worked hard over the years to educate our community community about the dangers of flavored tobacco and the effect of nicotine on the adolescent brain. We've spoken at multiple meetings and advocated at the state capitol. It's a quiet, discreet de- epidemic designed to attract and addict the young, and nicotine is a toxin that actually changes teens' brain cell activity, and these changes can be permanent. Please ban the flavored tobacco and help protect the brains and the health of our teens. Thank you, Anna. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please uh, start with your comments. You have three minutes. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Good evening, supervisors. My name is Tom Nelson. I am a vice president of the 3rd District PTA. The 3rd District PTA represents parents and school communities of Sacramento County and seven other local uh, counties. Uh, We are one of the county's largest child advocacy associations. Our executive board is in strong support of this ordinance. We believe ending the sale of candy-flavored tobacco products in Sacramento County is critical in combating early youth addiction to tobacco products. These candy flavored products are merchandise damaging the health of our children. Ending the sale of these dangerous kid-friendly flavors is critical to protecting the health of our children. Please take action to stop tobacco companies from endangering our children. On behalf of the third district Uh, PTA Executive Board, we ask that you vote in favor of this ordinance to protect our children. Uh, I want to say I appreciate the discussion I heard and to use uh, a few words from the uh, U.S. Constitution, we appreciate you giving priority of governance to um, to promote the general welfare to ourselves and our posterity uh, instead of economic interests. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Next caller, please. We have uh, probably around 17 callers and it's hovering at this number currently. Hi caller, please start with your comments. You have uh, three minutes. Hi, my name is Dr. Lena Vanderlist and I'm a community pediatrician here in Sacramento and I'm representing the American Academy of Pediatrics, Northern California chapter. Um, I think that I am in strong support of this ordinance banning flavored tobacco in Sacramento County. We know that flavors hook kids. Four out of five minors, like since days before, say that they started on a flavored product. Just in my office last month, I saw a teenage boy who came in and said he started vaping and didn't even know that there was nicotine in vapes. Um, And he just started using it because there were fun flavors and it was a fun thing to do with his friends. And soon he found himself having to go to the bathroom and use the vape throughout the day. I think this is an excellent example of how flavors are the things that draw kids and teens in. And then they're stuck with a nicotine addiction for the rest of their life. And we know how horrible tobacco addiction is and cigarette smoke and other um, tobacco products are for health care down the line. And um, so that's why I strongly support and this ordinance in banning flavored tobacco in Sacramento. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Um, Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Philip Gardner. I'm one of the co-chairs of the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. 
and I'm recently retired from the University of California Office of the President for that and related to these research programs. Um, I want to thank you um, all for having this today and calling on you to pass the strongest ordinance possible. Um, we can't wait on the state every day that we wait to implement um, restrictions on flavors, more kids take it up and more folks of color die from it. It's unfortunate that I've heard, you know, people putting forth that this is a thousand year old tradition in the Middle East. Let's just be honest and frank that it was, um, it was European colonialism that introduced tobacco to the Middle East only some three to 400 years ago. And then as has also been pointed out by other people, that actually Islam frowns upon this and then to add insult to injury, the majority of people dying in North Africa and the Middle East and unfortunately in the United States, in California, and in the county of Sacramento are folks dying of tobacco related diseases. Um, it has been mentioned, I wanna repeat it, that um, 793 should be seen as a floor, not a ceiling, and that each county has the ability to take extra steps to protect the health and welfare of their, of, of their clients, of their um, citizens. And I wanna call on you to do the same thing. A lot of times when we talk about the costs associated with this, what is left out often is the question of healthcare costs that will go down, hospitalizations that will go down, or emergency room visits that will go down. And not to mention that people that use smoking devices it, during the time of COVID-19 just exacerbate over overall health crisis that we face. Let me give a shout out to Supervisor Kennedy. Um, Supervisor Kennedy, I'm a doctor of public health and I thought you made the case very well um, for why we should do this. It isn't a question of saving tobacco industry or hookah industry profits. It's about saving young lives and saving black lives. With that, I've written you a letter that you've all received, some of you responded. I hope you do the right thing. Follow the lead of Sacramento. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, supervisors. My name is Sue Taranishi. I am calling as a board member of Reed Sacramento, of Reed California, Sacramento region. Our mission is clean air and healthy lungs. I'm a resident of District 2. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy, for your statement and all the data. And I just urge your support of this ordinance. And I think the, well, you've heard many, many comments, and I know it's late, but I think the a couple of the main things that I just wanted to stress, that 80% um, of the kids who use tobacco started with a flavored product, and 90% and of Sacramento County kids who use tobacco report using a flavored product. So... As guardians of public health, I would urge your support of this ordinance to hopefully stop many of our youth from starting to use tobacco and um, just protect our public health. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Good evening, supervisors. I'm Lindsay Freitas, a resident of Sacramento County in Supervisor Desmond's district and advocacy director for the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. I'm also representing the Greater Sacramento Smoke and Tobacco-Free Coalition comprised of local community groups and community members working to create smoke and tobacco-free communities in Sacramento County. I am here in strong support of a comprehensive policy to end the sale of all flavored tobacco products in the Sacramento County, including e-cigarettes, menthol cigarettes, and flavored shisha tobacco, as the policy is drafted without exemption. Prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products in all tobacco retailers is a critical step that will help protect children living in Sacramento County from the unrelenting efforts of the tobacco industry to hook them to a deadly addiction. 
flavored tobacco products are designed to alter the taste and reduce the harshness of tobacco products, so they're more appealing and easy for beginners who are almost always kids. These products are pervasive and are marketed and sold in a variety of kid-friendly flavors. With their colorful packaging and sweet flavors, flavored products are often hard to distinguish from the candy displays near which they're frequently placed in retail outlets. Past economic studies have shown that reducing tobacco sales in a community will actually create new jobs and improve the community's economy. Researchers estimate that since most of the money spent on tobacco products is actually exported outside of our community to manufacturers and farmers out in other states, prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products statewide would return money to the state through new economic activity, creating a net increase of 3,322 jobs and $580 million in economic activity. Furthermore, in a survey of hookah lounges in the city of Sacramento before and after the implementation of that policy, we see that these hookah lounges simply did not close. They switched from using flavored tobacco shisha to non-nicotine shisha and continue to operate. In California, nine out of 10 high school tobacco users report using a flavored product. And I ask for the council to end the sale of all flavored products. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Camille Boudreaux, and I'm here on behalf of the Sacramento County Young Democrats. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of this comprehensive ordinance. The evidence is clear, candy flavored tobacco products are making it easier for kids to become addicted to nicotine early. 90% of kids in our county using tobacco are uh, using flavored products. Big Tobacco directly targets youth and communities of color to get them hooked on tobacco products. They know hiding dangerous and addictive nicotine products behind flavors like sour apple minty, and minty menthol are a sure way to get our communities addicted early and addicted forever. A comprehensive law prohibiting the sale of these kid-friendly products is the best way to put an end to this predatory practices of big tobacco here in Sacramento County. This is a public health issue that isn't going away unless we take critical steps to protect our community. I ask that the board please vote in favor of this important ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, uh, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Yes, thank you. My name is Ms. Wilmore and I'm speaking on behalf of my family. I'm also a public health retiree. And I, um, I'm just so excited that Sacramento County is considering this very important policy. Uh, let's do the right thing. Sacramento County has a golden opportunity today to make public health history. With more than 350,000 youth in your county, it's time to do the right thing and consider a policy that would prohibit flavored tobacco products, including menthol and hookah, to protect our kids. Their lives literally depend on it. I love visiting Sacramento County. It's such a beautiful area, and it's also named after a river, which represents to me the continuous flow of life. Unfortunately, the tobacco industry needs new customers, and we all know how easily flavors entice kids to smoke, like using flavors like unicorn poop. As I reflect on my 32-year public health career, I wonder, what new product is going to be next? This is personal for me, as I lost my dad due to smoking at age 49. He started at age 9. I have a sense of urgency for protecting all of our youth in the state of California. Sacramento County has a great track record for protecting its citizens, and you are no stranger in protecting disenfranchised populations such as foster care youth and African Americans. The county has received no, um, some really great notable national awards for your Sacramento County Black Child Health Legacy Campaign which is aimed at reducing deaths among African-American 
children by 10 to 20 percent. So what you've already done in your county totally complements what you're doing and considering today. So we need to do the right thing. As we all know, with COVID-19, has had a tremendous life impact on all of us. Four out of five teens, according to TobaccoFreeCalifornia.com, who vape, four out of five teens who vape use flavors. And teens who vape are five to seven times more likely to test positive for COVID-19. We have a pandemic with COVID-19, and we have an epidemic regarding flavored tobacco products. Today's action can go a long way in protecting the public's health as well as preventing our youth from having a lifelong addiction to tobacco products. Thank you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi there, uh, supervisors. My name is Mark Strau, and I am a uh, retailer in Sacramento. I just want to point out that this ban will not stop youth vaping or smoking. What it will do is reduce staff in our businesses. It will also push sales outside of Sacramento County. So we operate in other counties, and when the city of Sacramento passed their smoking ban, we benefited by having uh, the customers in the area coming to us. This will make it so uh, the, the youth will be able to get their tobacco from the internet, illegal markets, illegal people on the street, and uh, other places in the other cities and counties in the, in the neighboring areas. Please do not uh, let us lose our staffs because we cannot have the business that we had before. There is the vote coming up in November as we've been talking about. Please wait on this flavor ban. Please vote no on the flavor ban. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Good evening, Chairman and uh, members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Jaime Rojas with the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, the trade group representing most of the retailers in Sacramento County. Many of our member retailers in Sacramento County are unable to attend tonight's board meeting. Our retailers have not had the opportunity to speak on the issue to county staff and to many of the supervisors on finding alternative solutions to youth vaping usage. The county did not outreach to our retail stores about this meeting or have scheduled a retailer workshop to discuss alternatives, options, and work with the business community prior to considering any ordinance, like the cities of Sacramento and San Jose did with their retailer community. The county's retailers are exemplary in keeping tobacco products out of the hands of underage persons. According to the FDA in the state of California, county retailers have a near perfect 93% compliance record by refusing to sell to anyone underage. Why would the county want to harm responsible retailers and change the customers to other jurisdictions or to illicit markets? Our retailers do not sell tamarindo, churro, burro, unicorn poop, or any other absurd flavors because of their limited floor space for tobacco products. These crazy flavors are sold online. It is already illegal to sell to anyone under the age of 21. Let's focus on code enforcement investments since it's already illegal to sell to anyone under the age of 21. The issue is compliance and the county should consider increasing penalties and even taking away tobacco retail licenses for those not following local, state, and federal rules and regulations. A recent study on the San Francisco flavor ban from Yale University with the funding of the FDA shows that the flavor ban in San Francisco does not work and has caused youth usage to instead use traditional combustible cigarettes instead. Flavor bans do not work. We urge the county to pull the agenda item tonight and schedule it once all stakeholders have been considered prior to impacting businesses on an ordinance that has not worked in other California cities. 
Let's consider simple options and considerations by the county like stiffer penalties, loss of tobacco license after a second offense that 7-Eleven retailers already use, mandatory electronic age verification systems, cost effective, focus on the issue of vaping flavors only, or as Supervisor Desmond and Frost stated, let's wait for the referendum and the voters to pass a statewide flavor ban. We thank you for consideration. Thank you for your call. Okay, next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 You have Sorry. three. Hello. You have three minutes to start with your comments. Please start. Hello. Good evening, Council. Thank you for all your patience and listening to everybody's comments that are happening for such a long period of time. My name is George Johnson. I'm a founding member of the National Hookah Community Association. I also manufacture traditional wooden hookah pipes called Regal Hookahs. I wanted to make a few comments on uh masal and shisha tobacco has been preserved in honey and molasses for centuries thus making hookah masal or the way it's pr produced a flavored product so um council member Serna, it is a de facto ban on hookah double apple has been around for over two centuries um, zaglul and jurak have been around for over 300 years if you look up doka has been around since the 15th century so, um, you know, I, I, I go to Egypt and I've, I've enjoyed smoking shisha in like El Fishawi um, hookah lounge. It's older than the United States as a country. And so to prevent people from existing businesses to continue to do what they're doing, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sad. And, and a caller had mentioned that, uh, you know, Sacramento City hookah lounges haven't closed because they're using alternatives. I want to warn against some of the consequences of the unknown, these unintended consequences like non-synthetic nicotines, non-FDA approved uh, tobaccos. You know, tobacco has to go through PMTAs, pre-market and testing authorization with the federal government. And so we're in compliance with all these rules that we're providing a safe product. And if we open up Pandora's box to all these alternatives, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be some, you know, unintended consequences here. Also, I, I'm just wanting to urge everybody to exempt hookah using the language of SB 793 because it, it prevents it from being sold in gas stations, liquor stores, 7-Eleven. It pertains only to 21 and over establishments, thus taking away this marketing argument that everybody seems to make, that we're marketing to children. We're not. We, it's been over 50 years since there's been a tobacco advertisement on television. It's been over 20-something years since there's been a print media you know, with tobacco products, we, we, we don't have bright colored images on our packaging for hookah tobacco. So, you know, it's, if children are not allowed in those establishments, they can't see it. So there is no real marketing that way. Also, 30 days is not enough time for these, these small minority owned businesses to purge their inventory. I mean, the, many of these people are personal guarantors on their leases. Should they, they default on their lease obligations, they get a, a um, bankruptcy on their credit filing. You know, they could lose their homes. So I want to thank everybody for, for all the talk, and I hope that you guys can follow the state's exemptions, mirror the language, 21 and over establishments, save traditional hookah. Thank you for your time. Thank you, George. Okay. Next caller, please. What do we have in the queue still? We have about... 12 to 13. Okay. Can you guys send the next caller?
Did we lose contact? I don't, can staff, can you guys hear me? Okay, hi caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Neve, and I am asking you to please exempt Tuka from this flavor ban. Today, we know what the issue is. Vaping has become a major problem amongst teens. Why do we have to target minority-owned businesses? Why, cannot, why can we not give these businesses a chance to, sur to survive and implement the same regulations as marijuana dispensaries? Through my love for hookah, I have met and become friends with people from all different types of backgrounds. I would never think to ask any of my Muslim friends to meet up at a bar for drinks. That is not the type of environment they would like to be in. Hookah lounges are our safe place to meet up and enjoy a night out. We also occasionally meet up at each other's houses and enjoy dinner followed by tea and hookah. If this ban was enacted, I would no longer be able to go to adult-only smoke shops to pick up shisha, and I would not be able to meet up with my friends at an adult-only hookah lounge. Shisha is sold in gas stations or supermarkets like all other tobacco products. This ban would have a devastating effect on lounges and instantly force them to shut down. I would also like to add that there were some false claims made by other commenters tonight. My community doesn't appreciate certain callers telling lies about our own traditions from people that clearly haven't gotten the chance to experience our beautiful culture and haven't done honest research. I hope we can all come together and find a safe and common ground that protects our youth, but doesn't target my people that have been so viciously persecuted in the past. Thank you. Please exempt Tuka. Thank you, caller. Comments? Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, County Board of Supervisors. My name is Mullen Spence. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, please mirror the rhetoric in California Senate Bill S R793 and provide a cultural exemption for hookah. Gavin Newsom has stated that hookah is not the problem in our classrooms. Hookah is an important cultural tradition for many minority groups in our community. I am a woodworker that collaborates with an artisan hookah manufacturer. Not only has the hookah community provided me gainful employment, but also it has exposed me to people from different cultures and backgrounds I might never have had the opportunity to meet. In addition, lawfully operating businesses are the best line of defense in eliminating youth access to, to tobacco. We should consider 21 and up and only establishments for tobacco sales and perhaps use some of the same precautions that we dispensaries use with multiple layers of age verification and security. I'm a fan of better enforcement of already existing laws instead of pushing consumers to online and black market sources. In conclusion, please consider this culture with the respect it deserves and exempt hookah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Next caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Erica Costa. Good evening, supervisors. I'm the advocacy director for the American Lung Association in California, the leading public health organization fighting to reduce and prevent lung disease. I'm here to express our support for the passage of an ordinance in Sacramento County that restricts the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Each year in California, nearly 40,000 adults die from smoking-related causes, and over 12,000 kids become new daily smokers. According to the U.S. Surgeon General, tobacco companies have a long history of using flavored tobacco products to entice new, younger customers. In fact, 8 out of 10 youth smokers report that they initiated tobacco use with a flavored tobacco product, and that the younger a person is, the more likely they will be to use a flavored product. There is no evidence that shows the aerosol admitted by e-cigarettes is safe for non-users to inhale. What we do know is that these products are especially enticing to youth. Who have, become, who have begun using at an alarming rate. E-cigarette use among middle and high school students is, is higher than that of traditional tobacco products by those populations. But effective policies um, to, re to restrict the sale of these products can curb that trend. 
In addition to targeting of, the targeting of youth, we also know that the flavor of menthol is commonly used to target communities of color. The American Lung Association urges the board to prohibit the sale of these products and to save the lives of its residents and prevent youth in the county from becoming lifelong tobacco users. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Eric. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Brian Hecox. Um, I am a small business owner here in Sacramento. I'm a constituent of um, Supervisor uh, Desmond in Carmichael. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I am not big tobacco. I am a small business owner operating a shoestring budget to keep stock levels for my customers and to pay my employees. Uh, there was a call uh, earlier that mentioned a valley as a, a scourge of vaping, and that is completely false. The CDC and the FDA both uh, acknowledged that a valley was the result of illicit THC cartridges being made in people's basements using uh, vitamin E as a substitute to fill cartridges. It had nothing to do with professional uh, e-cigarette use. Um, there are some, some studies that have uh, shown that in San Francisco, uh, the uh, ban on flavored vaping products is not only not deterring youth uh, smoking uh, rates, but also increasing the science direct addiction behavior reports uh, published in July 2021 was a peer reviewed study that showed an increase of 35% among youth uh, 18 to 24 in San Francisco in the year following the ban. Um, another uh, peer reviewed uh, study showed that, that was published in August 2021 from in the American Journal of Public Health showed that um, policy, uh, a, see, policy that had the intention of reducing e-cigarette use uh, unfortunately had the unintended uh, consequence of increasing youth smoking rates. They compared San Francisco with, a, with its flavor ban to other jurisdictions in, in like populaces that did not and found that youth smoking and youth vaping had actually decreased in those places without flavor bans. This is a disastrous policy that is going to not only serve to not help the public health here in, in, in Sacramento, but it's also going to hurt our, our local economy. There are well over 300 uh, specialty retailers in Sacramento that operate with these flavored tobacco products. My, mine among, I don't carry Kratom, I don't carry cigarettes, I don't have tertiary products. I, I focus exclusively on helping one smoker at a time walk away from tar, from carcinogens, from 25,000 additives and, and get them into vaping where they can still obtain their nicotine and do it safely. And specialty retailers here in Sacramento have shown time and time again that they are good actors. Uh, the California Department of Public Health's own statistics on, on youth and straw uh, purchase stings show that among 312 sting operations, only 311, uh, 311 tasks with flying colors, only one wasn't, and it wasn't a specialty retailer. The issue with youth uh, access to vaping products in Sacramento is not happening in vape shops. It's not happening in hookah lounges. It's happening at gas stations where they can walk in without having to be ID'd first, and it's happening online where they can they can purchase products with someone else's credit card. You are you are looking at shutting down over 300 businesses with 1,500 employees, and you are looking at disenfranchising tens of thousands of vapers in the local Sacramento market. The MSA, the Master Settlement Agreement, shows that. We have a, a, a financial benefit in shutting down vaping because it pushes people back to smoking, which yields more money. Sacramento County alone has received $304.7 million to date from the MSA, $15.7 million just last year. That money's not going to enforcement. That money's not going to help these people that are suffering from cigarettes. My own mom died at 35 years old, three days after my 14th birthday, from smoking. She didn't have access to flavors. Youth initiation of tobacco products is nothing new. Shutting, the, shutting down flavored vaping will not help the public. It's only going to force them to go to other places to get it. It's only going to force people back to deadly cigarettes. This is a disastrous policy, and I ask you, please, reconsider what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, supervisors. My name is Eliza Tong, and I am a professor of medicine at UC Davis Health. 
I'm here tonight as a, prov as a private citizen in Supervisor Natoli's district, and my views do not represent those of the University of California. As a physician and a native of Sacramento, I am in strong support of a policy for unincorporated Sacramento County to restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes and without exemptions. Doctors and nurses are working hard to help our community with COVID infections, um, but people who smoke uh, are among those at greatest risk for getting sicker with COVID. The Surgeon General has concluded that smoking worsens lung health and weakens the immune system. And before the COVID pandemic, we were already dealing with two vaping epidemics with the rise in youth use and also with lung injury, both of which are still ongoing. This policy can help us in this fight to keep our community healthier. A strong policy can also encourage people to quit. When the city of Sacramento policy went into effect in 2020, I had an African-American patient in the hospital tell me that her mother and brother told her they all finally needed to try to quit their menthol cigarettes together. We need a policy for the county to help people like my patient and her whole family quit flavors and quit for good. Using flavored tobacco products, whether or not they are vaped or smoked, is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration for smoking cessation. When I grew up in Sacramento, I remember kids bringing candy cigarettes to school, cartoon characters like Joe Cool making smoking fun, and cool menthol cigarettes lying around the house. Fortunately, I also grew up in a time when that social norm changed when leaders in Sacramento and the rest of California started implementing strong policies to protect me as a child. More than ever, we need your leadership in Sacramento to help us improve our local environment and set standards for a healthier community. I am happy to work more with you to make our Sacramento County the healthiest in the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tong. Next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Can you um, also Thank mute you. the meeting in the background while you're talking? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, thank you so much. And then you have no three worries. minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate taking the time. My name is Taylor. Uh, being a smoker of cigarettes for over 22 years, uh, because of vaping, I haven't touched a cigarette in over three years health benefits, my overall life has just changed for the better dramatically. And, you know, having lost loved ones, family members to lung cancer, I wish, I wish they had vaping uh, when they were smokers because I honestly believe they would still be with me to this day. And uh, I purchased all of my vaping in Sac County and all the smoke shops I go to you know, I'm 36 years old. I still get carded. So I know there's speculation of underage selling. Uh, I have never seen that before. And honestly, every every smoke shop owner around is, you know, they're saving lives. They, they really are. It's a amazing substitute to nicotine, uh, to cigarettes. And, you know, it's, it's dramatically changed my life. Uh, but listening to everything so far, I understand that it is on the ballot for November, and being a business owner myself, I know how difficult it is um, inventory-wise, and I would highly recommend everyone to just vote on giving them ample time, you know, to to go ahead and maneuver all the material they have, all of their, you know, all their stock, everything like that. But overall, I can just tell you that vaping has saved me, and uh, I I owe everything to that. Uh, my life right now, it's just, it's so much better because of it. So uh, I appreciate the time very, very much, and thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Taylor. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Anch. Thank you for taking my call. I am against this ban. I would like to request to let voters decide during November 22 ballot. If you still decide to go ahead with this ban, please, I request 
Give us at least six months to clear our inventory. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Neha. I'm also a smoke shop owner in uh, Sacramento County. Uh, I'm calling to vote against this because the reasons this is not just affecting uh, against the ban specifically, because uh, this is this is going to affect a lot of a lot of business owners out here. Uh, the reason I understand that young kids are getting access to vape and vape products, just banning it in Sacramento County might not just resolve it. Kids can go different places, and nowadays they normally have access to this products around the area. And uh, so I don't think just banning it in Sacramento, Sacramento County itself will help. So uh, looking at this, I would like to ban, uh, vote against the ban. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Colin. Thank you for your comments, Colin. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Yes, my name is Ashok Desai. I am calling from the Orangeville Smoke Shop. Uh, so we are, I am opposing the ban, uh, flavor ban, is item number 59. So if you want, then just wait up to November 22 referendum, and then you can decide it after that, what you want to do it. And if you want to do it, then give, give me at least nine to one year, nine months to one year, then we can read up the our inventory. And uh, is Sacramento County, they ban, but what about the nearest cities? Is a, we live in Orangeville, our store in Orangeville, and Citrus side is open. So customers get, get there within two and five minutes. So what's the meaning? It's a health issue, only they live in a Sacramento County. So what about the Citrus side? So please, I'm opening the ban. Item number 59. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Tim Gibbs with the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. I'm also a constituent in District 2. I wanted to highlight who is actually funding the opposition to this ordinance. Flavored tobacco policies have been coming up in California for some time now. And the big tobacco companies like RJ Reynolds, Philip Morris, and Juul have collectively spent nearly $60 million opposing flavored tobacco policies just in California, and that's only since 2017. That is an obscene amount of money. But make no mistake, this industry is committed and, dare I say, desperate to keep candy, fruit, mint, and menthol-flavored tobacco products on the shelves. They need to replace the tobacco users that die using the products. We've been hearing a lot from the opposition about just waiting until the referendum. That is precisely what the tobacco companies consider a win. Their tactic is delay, delay, delay. Every day we wait to end the sale of flavored tobacco products in Sacramento County is another day that tobacco companies are able to hook more kids in vulnerable communities. As to the referendum that the opponents keep referencing, it only exists because the tobacco companies spent $20 million to qualify it. They were spending upwards of $8 a signature. They're going to spend whatever it takes to try and defeat the referendum to ensure candy flavored tobacco stays on the shelves. If we want to protect Sacramento youth, we're asking you to pass this policy as is today. One other thing I wanted to address is that this ordinance in no way would ban hookah. It only prohibits the sale of flavored shisha tobacco. There are hookah lounges that still operate in the city of Sacramento. 
They are continuing to operate despite the Sacramento law that passed in 2019. They just don't have flavored shisha tobacco in their hookah pipes. I also wanted to address the study in San Francisco that the opposition keeps referencing. That study is fatally flawed because the data collection took place before the ordinance even went into effect. It has been thoroughly debunked, but has not stopped Big Tobacco and their allies from referencing it. I urge Sacramento County to side with the trusted organizations who make up our coalition and against the opposition whose reportable funding has been 100% from the big tobacco companies. Thank you. Okay, next. You, sorry. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Mohammed Asghar. I host uh, this uh, ban for the flavored uh, tobacco. Okay. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. My name is Vanessa Lopez. I am a 17-year-old senior in high school and a resident in District 4. I am a representative from my school student government class and heard about this ordinance and felt compelled to call in on behalf of the youth community in Sacramento County. There are two main points I would like to address. First being that the arguments from retailers are justified, but not in the aspect that they are not the issue. While it may be true that they are not directly selling to youth, they are the source of it. I can say without a doubt that at least 90% of youth who obtain tobacco products at my school get their supplies from 21 plus individuals who willingly and legally are able to purchase these flavored tobacco products. And I doubt it is any different at other schools around and around our community. Again, I would like to emphasize, while merchants may not be directly selling to youth, they are the source of it. I know this because I am the youth you are allowing to be victimized by these products. Secondly, I am appalled that the argument made by a few supervisors and callers is that the money Sacramento County is going to lose seems to be more important than my health and the health of my generation. I personally have seen peers and friends of mine become victims of these flavored tobacco products, and I can say with a broken heart and tears in my eyes that I fear it may already be too late for them. So I plead to you to approve this ordinance with no exemptions. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, yes, my name is Heather Molina. And I was uh, born and raised in Sacramento. I've been an avid cigarette smoker for about over a decade. And um, I've tried everything to quit. I've tried the Nicorette gum and the patches, everything. And I just want to say the vaping is the only thing that has worked for me. I was able to quit cigarettes. I've been cigarette-free for over a year now. And I just want people like me to be able to express that this stuff has helped us and has, you know, given us something other than cigarettes to get away from that. Because I've had a grandfather that's passed away from cancer, so I know how it is. And I, and I believe it helps a lot if there's choices out there, different things to help quit. Because not everything's going to work for every person. Not one thing's going to work for every person. Sometimes we need something different. And... I think vaping for the certain people that can't do the gum, can't do the patches that don't work has really helped us in that sense. And I just want to thank you for your time and thank you. I know you guys have been on here for a long time. I appreciate it. And I hope you really hear our voices out there. So thank you so much. Thank you for calling, Heather. Okay, ne next, next, call call next caller, please. How are we doing on numbers? What do we have now? I think we have about a couple more callers to go. Okay. All right, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, caller, please start with your comments. You have uh, two, three minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Ralph Proper, and uh, I'm on the board of Breathe California Sacramento Region. Uh, I, uh, I'm a biochemist with a master's in public health. I worked uh, over 30 years at the Air Resources Board as an air pollution research specialist, focusing on uh, cancer-causing chemicals and how to eliminate them from our air. As a result, uh, the uh, research that I authored before I retired a few years ago showed that there were close to a million lives saved as a result. Uh, however, I want to add that uh, tobacco causes more deaths, not from cancer, but more from, from uh, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and so forth, and strokes. This isn't generally known uh, because uh, cardiovascular disease is so much more common than, than cancer, and uh, whereas maybe a quarter of uh, lung cancer deaths are from uh, smoking, that's not true for, uh, for heart disease. Why does this matter? Well, one reason it matters is uh, that the death toll from smoking is far higher than thought. I've also heard comments about vaping being better, and uh, it is possibly true that it doesn't have some of the carcinogens in it that cause cancer. However, it still has the nicotine, which is a probable cause of the great increase in cardiovascular deaths from, from smoking. So uh, that doesn't really help in, uh, in the long run. So uh, speaking for the Breathe California Sacramento region, I want to add how important this is that we not get children hooked and the flavored products is what uh, really does it for them. So uh, for all these reasons, I think it's important for us to pass this uh, ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. And next caller, please. And next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. No problem. Uh, my name is Manny. I am a UCD alumni, and uh, I have been in the retail industry for 10 plus years. And uh, I'm not gonna touch the issue of uh, violation of personal freedom by and uh, too much over overlooked by the the city on this uh, matter of vaping. But I would request that uh, we are given ample time to consider us. Uh, ways to liquidate our inventory and uh because it's a very hard time right now with the COVID shutdowns and now everything we're already in a time of economic uh, uh hardship and uh i would request the uh, board members the city council uh if they will go through with this we will uh wholeheartedly comply with what the what the fine people of the city and uh, the board board uh, council people want but I would request that we get at least maybe hopefully a year to uh, liquidate our inventory. And I would like to also add that city does reforms and take measures to actually curb the black market, which this ban will create on the vaping because people will find ways, um, especially through online and uh, friend-to-friend -friend sales, out-of-state sales, and uh, that will be all that I would want to add. Um, let's not ban it, give the people the freedom to choose, but if you guys do decide it, at least give us the time to liquidate our inventory, and uh, please take some reforms and measures to counteract the, the black market that it will create because we will lose a lot of tax revenue based on, based on that. Because as a as a retailer, we majority of our sales is going towards vaping. That's what the public wants, and we are paying a lot of sales tax. We're contributing to this contributing to a lot of sales tax being paid. So, give us the chance to liquidate our inventory and uh, take measures to um, stop the black market after you guys do decide to take it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manny, for your comments. Thank you, sir. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. 
I don't, I don't agree with this ban. I'm just asking that you guys give us time, at least till January of next year, to clear out our inventory and allow menthols, as that is a FDA allowed item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. I'm on there. Uh, hello, everybody on the board. I know you guys are there for so many hours and it must be really tiring. I am a teacher by profession and I've been in a smoke shop business for the last 18 years of my life, unfortunately. When this opportunity came with the e-cigarette, I was so fascinated that now I had an opportunity to make people quit. And I swear, I have made so many people quit, thanks to the Lord. Now, all those people that I have made quit and all those people who are in the process of quitting, what happens with the flavor ban? I know flavor helps them to quit because it is tasty. Who does not like tasty products? So I have helped so many people get on there. And now all this is going to reverse. All my efforts that I have put into this, has going to be go to waste. As far as you're saying that kids are getting addicted to this, no, we do not sell to kids. We card every damn person who comes to the store. And sometimes I have parents who come and say they are regular cigarette buying ladies and when they come to buy a flavor or something, I ask them, why are you buying this? I'm buying this for my kid because he would rather go and do meth. I don't want them to do that. So I'd rather give him this. This is what parents here in America are saying, unfortunately. And we don't sell to such parents. I don't mind losing such customers. But this is something really ridiculous. If we want to do it, let us do it for the whole damn country, the whole state, not just for one county. Because we are going to get deprived of our business. They'll go to other places and buy. They'll go to other cities, Citrus Heights, here, there, they'll buy online. Ban online, ban the whole country from every flavor that you can, sir. I would be supporting it if you do it without any loopholes. Not where we are creating loopholes, we are creating a black market for the kids to go and buy whatever they want, wherever they double the prices. Don't do that, sir, please. You want to do it? Please do it the right way. Don't keep any loopholes there. Ban it, but ban it all the way through. I really, really urge you to do this. Because otherwise, unfortunately, we are going from the frying pan to the fire. This is not helping us in any, any way. This is not helping us, sir. This is really not going to help us. I'm sorry I have to say this, but my heart burns to think that this is happening now. At such a point in this COVID time where we are dying, we are thinking, and all this is going to happen to us. That too with no time for the inventory to be sold off. All our effort to help people quit is going to go in vain. I have so many customers who have quit, so many. And most of my customers were people who smoked for 40 to 45 years of their life. I have made them quit. I have monitored them. Please help me, sir. Please don't let this ban go like this. Let them vote for it. Or you want to do it? Do it all the way. Do it all the way. Federally do it. Just stop it. Stop it completely where they cannot get access to anything anywhere. Please, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry to be so upset. Okay, no, thank you for your call. Appreciate your comment. Okay, next caller, please. And also, uh, Chairperson, we have about five more or six more callers in queue now. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi. Uh, I just want to say hi to the board, and thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, my name is Hassan Chaudhary, and I'm a owner of a small business in Sacramento County. And I strongly believe that we store owners are the um, first in line of defense against selling to minors. And me personally, I can't speak for anybody's store, but in our stores, we have a couple of them in the county of Sacramento. We have never, ever, ever sold to a minor, nor have we ever allowed adults to buy from minors. I have never been cited by the Sacramento County that I've sold to a minor, and I've been in business for over 10 years. 
And it is very unfair to take that away from us. And I, I hear all these callers calling, stating that they're professional doctors, or they're this or that. I got, we are hearing students calling in. Like, how can we confirm that any of these callers that are calling are actually professionals and they have done their study? And how do we know all these students are getting extra credit just to call in, just to make up some stuff? You know what I mean? Like, I really hope that all of our voices are heard and our, our voices matter. And I would like for you guys to push this ban further back, not because so we can make extra profit, just because we're actually struggling just like everybody else to make ends meet. And if we're in with all this inventory, what are we supposed to do with it? We can't sell it to anybody. That's a loss to our pocket, to our families. To our, we're not able to provide food for our families. I know there's a lot of people or my people, predominantly the Indians or the Punjabis, the Pakistanis, they would love to call in and give their part of the story, but they can because of the language barrier and they cannot say all that they want to. And, there, and a lot of us were afraid to even publicly speak. So I just would like to say that let, let the public actually decide what is right for them and what is wrong for them, whether, I mean, whether they want to smoke or not. Like, who are we to tell others, hey, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Let us, the people, like the Constitution says, let the people decide. So I don't think it's fair for us to just put this out there and be like, okay, we're done with flavors, and that's that. that I mean, that's not fair. So I feel like that the, the ban is not really going to do anything. People are still going to have access to what they want, whether we like it or not. And I feel like the stores are our first line of defense. So that's all I got to say. I just want to say that I'm opposed to the, uh, to the ban of the flavor and all that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Appreciate your call. Thank you. Next, hey. next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Sujeevan Dhaliwal. I am a realtor in the Sacramento County, and I'm requesting that you guys not proceed with this ban. Since statewide flavor ban is already going to be on the 2022 ballot, you should let the voters decide if they want to ban any flavored tobacco or not. I also want to remind you guys that we are in the middle of a pandemic, and retail businesses are really struggling right now financially due to COVID. So in an event that any, you know, banned realtor happens, you should at least give us a year to clear out our inventory. Thank you so much. Please don't proceed with this. Thank you. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Sure. Hi, I am uh, Nasser Trazi, the owner of Zahra Hookah, a company that designs and manufacture hookah products in California. I have been in the hookah business for almost 10 years. I am also a parent of three teenagers who never smoked bef before or vaped. Why? Because as a parent, it's our responsibility to teach our kids what's good and what's bad for them. What we need is more education about vaping and smoking, better parenting about smoking and vaping. I am here to ask you to mirror SB793 and exempt hookah. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Uh, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, I am a retailer in uh, Sacramento, California, and I don't want to go through with this ban. I have a lot of products that I wouldn't be able to uh, sell it all within a short period of time. And right now with COVID pandemic, it's very hard for me to uh, with business, and this would just hurt me more. That's all I had to say. Okay. Thank you for your call. Okay, and please send the next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. 
My name is Sam Mansour with Sonic Brands and Sonic Smoke Shop. By now, I'm hoping you read my letters and public comments. I know I don't have enough time to touch on everything, but I'd like to tell you that we've done our own investigation, and 90% of shops that did not ID were shops with minor tobacco use permits, not smoke shops, not vape shops. Supervisors, you know over 95% of us are not selling to kids. We're an adult establishment, and I'm not sure why everybody's assuming that we're criminal. I don't disagree kids are vaping, but we're not the problem. Kids are mostly buying the products online and directly through China, specifically dhgate.com, and please do the research on that. To answer um, a question I heard earlier, flavors are 80% of our sales, and that's how much we're going to lose. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Appreciate your letter as well. Okay. Uh, and I, I believe we have the last caller uh, getting transferred into the meeting right now. There could be one person that might have slipped in, but just want to let you know. Okay. All right. Very good. We're going to take this. Last couple of callers, and then we'll bring it back to the board for and, further discussion. And Chairperson uh, Natoli, yes. when you bring it back to the board, uh, there is a video that uh, needs to be aired, uh, and it is the preference of airing that video before you guys go into discussion. Okay, and who's the video from? From it's, it's, uh, Don, it's from uh, um, students in District Two. It's, it's only two minutes long. Okay, that's fine. I just, I, yeah, I thought there was a video. That's why I asked earlier about that when we were early part of the hearing. But okay, very good. We'll um, take the final callers and then we'll bring it back for the video presentation and then back to the board for discussion and deliberation. So, okay. all right, very good. And Supervisor Natoli, Supervisor yes. Natoli, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Dr. Kasiri is on the phone and she would also like to make a comment at the close of public comment. Okay, very good. We'll take Dr. Kasiri and appreciate Dr. Braz has been with us the entire time as well. So, thank you, Gail. So, or I guess, yeah, okay, very good. Okay, so uh, I did I misunderstand? Could you transfer the last caller or was that the last caller? I may have misunderstood because we were Skyping, sorry. Oh, that was the last caller. Okay, so no other callers in the queue, no one that dropped? No, nope, no one dropped. It's just the okay. delay of what I'm looking at and what they're actually having in their system, so. Thank you, Flo. And again, when we started into this, we thought about 6.30 or so and uh, came out just about that and a little more, so. Okay, well, thank you to all of our callers, all the commenters, and uh, so with that, we'll come back to the board. Um, we'll uh, um, complete the public hearing uh, at this juncture anyway on for today's purposes and uh dr, dr. kasiri had a video I think. Well, there's a yeah video. no i know i I'm, I'm getting there i just want to <laughs> move in that way thanks i'm going to get to supervisor kennedy had the video and then dr kasiri wants to speak so is that the order you want to take him in mr kennedy yes sir okay all right very good okay so we'll go now to the video presentation uh and then come back to dr kasiri and then board members I'll ask Metro to please um, go ahead and play the video. The volume is really low. It my name is Teresa Naval, I'm a junior here at Valley High and a proud member of the Health Tech Academy. We've been learning about tobacco prevention through the soul project. The tobacco industry has been targeting youth like us through bright colors, exotic flavors, and even cartoon characters. We soldiers have been working hard to reduce the number of people impacted by commercial tobacco. Just this year, we pushed to get heart health products smoke free, but we need your help to take the next step. Hello, I'm Daniel Qureshi. Uh, do you at Valley High School? And I'm enrolled in uh, Health Tech Academy where I'm studying to become a community health worker. I have seen uh, uh, kids my age, younger and older, using nicotine weight, e-cigarettes, hookahs, small cigars, and other tobacco products, even at my school. The tobacco industry is targeting young uh, people like me to buy their products because they know we can be addicted at a young age. The uh, industry is making a lot of money by using a, a, a slow poison to kill its own community. They invested a lot of money to make tobacco more addictive to uh, the people. 
My name is Mustafa Mulo. I'm part of Relica Health Tech Academy. This is an issue I care about because the enormously powerful tobacco industry has lobbied to derail initiatives in Congress of a state legislature. But where federal and state governance fails, local leadership, leadership has succeeded. Thank you. So please consider stopping the sale and use of tobacco products of any kind. Thank you so much. I want to see in the future people playing together, not alone, way big or small game. Support the flavor event to protect health and wellness of youth like this. What to protect the sale of menthol and flavored tobacco products? Appreciate their comments in this middle of the video. So. Supervisor Kennedy, was there anything else you wanted to add at this point? No, sir. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, so now we'll go uh, to Dr. Kasiri, I believe. Uh, good evening, uh, supervisors. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm not going to say much because uh, Supervisor Kennedy uh, basically covered uh, all of the background on the numbers but I just wanted to be able to point out uh, two main points. One is that there are 118 jurisdictions in California that have passed um, these bans. So Sacramento County is not alone in, on this journey. And a few years ago, we did start uh, reviewing this, but at that time, the decision was made to postpone it because the state was considering it. So I think getting back to that point and then getting to the same point of saying, well, the state is going to consider it, so let's wait. I think we've done that before. And a lot of these children, as you have heard, have waited many years. I, I've talked to some of them who have said, you know, they see their, their, their friends getting addicted and they're very passionate about it. And I've asked for um, assistance, for your help in being able to make sure that um, the availability of, those, of these products is reduced in their communities. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the hookah. I know a lot of the speakers did talk about the uh, cultural tradition, and definitely I can understand that as an immigrant myself, the importance of that. But I also want to point out that we also need to look at the health effects. Um, in public health, as We've worked with many immigrant uh, communities. We have identified some things that uh, they look at as cultural traditions, such as uh, certain cosmetics, uh, certain um, uh, utensils that they use for cooking that put them at risk of exposure to lead and ex exposure to mercury. And we address those and look at ways of removing that risk. And that is what we're trying to do here. When you look at hookah, if you look at the American Lung Association it does state, uh, website, it does state that hookah smoking is linked to many of the same adverse health effects as cigarette smoking, such as lung, bladder, oral cancers, and heart disease. So I think looking at that, it's not that um, the target is not the cultural tradition. The target is being able to create a more healthy environment, especially for the children who many times uh, out of curiosity try different products and ed end up getting addicted. So again, I wanna thank you for your consideration and thank you uh, Supervisor Kennedy for the work you've put into this and for your introduction of, of this ordinance. Thank you, Dr. Kasiri. All right. Um, is there any further testimony? If not, then I'll, I have board members that are with hands up. So is there anything else? Uh, if not, then I'll come back to board members for comments and questions. And there may be a number of, I see uh, uh, three members. So let's we'll start with Supervisor Serna, then Supervisor Desmond, Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kasiri uh, for, your, uh, for your words. And uh, certainly thanks to all the um, 
dozens of uh, members of the public that waited patiently to address the board on, on either side of this, this matter. Um, even though we're holding this uh, meeting remotely, uh, it's uh, rewarding to, to see that uh, folks are still willing to take time out of their busy schedules to participate in their, their county decision-making and governance. And uh, certainly I think uh, all of us can, can appreciate that. Um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier before we uh, took public comment was, uh, again, sharing my own personal perspective on, on what's before us is that, uh, you know, serving as I do um, also at the state level on the California Air Resources Board, um, you know, that, that, that charge, uh, as well as ours here at the county, um, is also a public health uh, responsibility. And of course, uh, the California Air Resources Board gets um, a lot of notoriety these days for what we do when it comes to greenhouse gas reduction and uh, climate change and those types of things. But uh, we are principally a public health uh, agency. And as such, uh, I have a chance to work with uh, my colleagues in that capacity that uh, many of whom are, are respiratory um, doctors and professionals and certainly have heard from many of the same advocates that we heard from uh, today, you know, uh, representing uh, um, Lung Association and others, uh, Cancer Society. Um, and so, uh, again, um, I would just encourage those members of the board who may still be um, unconvinced or, or on the fence about um, the import of what's in front of us relative to the preservation and enhancement of public health, arguably the most important responsibility we have to those that uh, we serve, um, I, I think it, 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 you should let that resonate with you. And uh, again, I say that respectfully, and it's not that I don't believe um, everyone on this board to a person has a big heart and, and certainly understands how important public health is. Um, but again, we're, at, we're, we're being asked to address a balance as we typically do. Um, one of the things that, that really hasn't garnered much discussion or uh, comment thus far, either from us or staff or, or the public, is the fact that um, uh, doing what we can to uh, prevent more addiction to nicotine, and especially nicotine that is administered via smoking, uh, you, you get, um, remember, an additional health benefit in terms of reducing secondhand smoke uh, exposure and the health consequences that, that come with that. So I think that that should be something that we keep at the forefront of our consideration as well is that uh, um, assuming that we, we could uh, find it um, in our will today to act on this affirmatively, uh, that we'd also be doing, uh, I think, a great service to those folks uh, that don't um, use uh, tobacco, but who, uh, by way of perhaps being a family member or a coworker or, um, or a fellow student, um, isn't necessarily going to be exposed to that, uh, that is to uh, carcinogenic smoke. So, um, and then uh, lastly, you know, I I was interested in, in looking at what we actually do as a county and put out there very publicly um, uh, on our Department of Health Services webpage. Uh, we certainly have a, a fairly robust tobacco education program um, that uh, is noted there. Uh, and on that, the first thing you read on that, on, on that page is that smoking is the number one cause of preventable deaths in the United States. Over 480,000 people in the United States die each year from tobacco-related illness. That is more, than, more deaths than AIDS, alcohol, car accidents, illegal drugs, murders, and suicides combined. And I can't help but think that if that is our message, that is something that is unequivocally connected to who we are as a, as a government, as a health agency, and if we don't act affirmatively, if we can't find it in our will to act affirmatively tonight on this, uh, I can't help but think that um, 
uh, we should be called on the carpet for uh, hollow rhetoric because identifying that and then the laundry list of, that follows in terms of all the programs that are dedicated to tobacco cessation and, and education um, and to think that we could have uh, you know, prohibited uh, the, or, or intervened to stop the next generation of nicotine addicts or the next generation of uh, cancer victims or, or emphysema victims. Um, that's more than frustrating. That's, you know, that's um, uh, really a tragedy, uh, quite frankly. So again, I'm looking at this clearly as, as a, a public health opportunity. Um, one that, uh, quite frankly, we should have taken advantage of uh, years ago. Uh, I think if there's any uh, room to take what some members of the public commented on today and, and perhaps slightly shape what's in front of us uh, would be uh, relative to the, the idea of standing inventory and how best to be fair about that. Uh, but I think other than that, I, I still, uh, as one member of the board, stand resolute and strong uh, support of the uh, proposed ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Cernan. Okay, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, uh, Chair Natoli, and, and um, I'm going to echo Supervisor Cernan with his thanks to, to the callers. You know, it's very emotional, emotional, a lot of passion. Um, I'm certainly struck by the science, um, the, the adverse health effects by this. Also struck by, you know, the, the personal stories that people shared with us and, and the fear of, uh, of some of the small business owners about the hardships that they face. I mean, I, 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 I don't think we should disregard that. Um, <clears throat> and Supervisor Stern, I, I, you know, he made a comment about me digging deep. I, I you know, I, I am digging deep on this, but I assure you, and you, you know that I, uh, um, you know, I struggle with it. I, I, um, I'm, you and I have, we represent different districts, different, uh, constituencies and, and, and you're right about the public health benefits of, of this. It's crucial. And I, I'm trying to balance it with, you know, some individual freedoms here too. And, and, and so that's what I struggle with, but, you know, listening to, to Supervisor Kennedy and Dr. K and, and of course you, Supervisor Cerna and the other callers, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded that we need to act. I am, um, I'm also persuaded by some of the arguments against um, against exempting uh, hookahs. I, I think, you know, I I'm, I'm I maybe at some point in the future, but I'm not prepared to go that far at this point. Um, you know, I represent a lot of of recent immigrants from Middle Eastern countries, and 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 I and I I've I've participated in shisha myself in the Middle East when I traveled to the Middle East, and it's it is such an important important cultural activity that I think is um, would be would be very difficult for, for folks coming here trying to um, assimilate to our, our country and, and uh, um, so maybe at some point in the future but what I would what I would ask Supervisor Kennedy is would you consider an amendment to this that that preserved some of the exemptions from SB 793 I mean particularly when it comes to hookah I mean it, the language is pretty pretty restrictive. Um, so I guess I had a question, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. I, um, I, I, I did look good and hard at that. Um, and, uh, in, and, and had, had quite frankly, uh, thought about and entertained the idea of putting it an, an exemption in the original, um, uh, ordinance, um, However, the public health arguments um, won uh, me over, and um, you know, as, as Supervisor Cernas said, we're also we're not looking at a full ban. And as one of the callers accurately said, we're not looking at a full ban here. It's it's the flavored tobacco. Um, so at, at this point, I'd rather not. If I was to make a motion, which I'm prepared to do, um, it, however, I, I would extend the time period for it to be starting. I think that is fair. Um, uh, to look to mimic what the city did and, and give it six months. Um, I would be open to entertaining that, however. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that, uh, Patrick. Um, 
I mean, even the exemption for hookah. So, I mean, when you make a motion, I'll, I'll ask to make a substitute motion that would include the exemption for hookah. And, um, I guess we see where we go from there. Okay, Supervisor Desmond, anything further? No, thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, okay. All right, uh, Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Chair Natoli. I tried to organize my thoughts. I took notes as people were speaking. Um, there was a comment about how there was no outreach to retail, but in Sacramento City, there was outreach. And so I, I had, uh, I was sensitive to that comment um, that, you know, you hate to blindside um, a large part of the community. I am concerned, I, you know, I, yeah, I was listening to all of it. I get what, you know, the proponents are saying that this is not healthy. It, it may be uh, less damaging than other things and more damaging and then some things and more damaging for some, but um, I guess, I'm still in that place where if you ban it in the unincorporated Sac County, it doesn't really solve the problem because they only have to drive five minutes to get it somewhere else. And I really believe in equal playing field. I believe in free enterprise, um, the invisible hand where, uh, you know, I've read the books of Thomas Sowell and, and other books on economics where if you, you know, if you pull something out, it impacts something else. You know, there's always those unintended consequences. And I, I'm sensitive to the comments that people brought about how, you know, adults should be able to choose and make those decisions for themselves. And, um, and I also, you know, don't know if it solves a problem if they can just go online and buy it and have it delivered or just drive over the the you know to the next county or to the next city um, they still have access to it so by banning it in sac county we're just punishing the businesses and the people who need it who who could benefit by it it sounded like there were people that are benefiting by it um, in the unincorporated that county, um, you know, there was one person who made a comment about, you know, my question as it related to the loss of sales tax. And I just want to point out to that person that the amount of sales tax that we make on any um, business category is an indication of, you know, how it will impact those businesses in our county. It's you know, if, if it's a large loss, then there's a lot of businesses that are really going to lose a lot of sales because of it. So, you know, it, it, maybe it's not so much about the revenues as it is, how is it going to impact the, the local economy? And I think, you know, having, um, you know, the businesses represent 80, 80 or 90 percent of, they're the working engine of what makes our, you know, our freedom work, you know, without independent business, small businesses, we can't be free. We can't be independent. We'll all be on welfare and sooner or later we'll run out of someone else's money. I think that was a statement by Margaret Thatcher. So yes, I'm interested in knowing, you know, are there, is there a revenue loss? Cause that's an indication of how does that impact our local economy? The solution, um, I was trying to organize my thoughts so I'd be quick. The state issue, you know, this is coming, apparently coming to the ballot. Um, originally, when we discussed this a while back, I was in of the opinion that this would be, you know, really better managed at the state level because it would even the playing field for all the businesses and it wouldn't pick and choose who are the winners and who, who are the losers. If you live in Sac County Unincorporated, you know, you can't offer what you perceive is that service, that free enterprise. And so I don't think it's a bad idea or a bad thought um, if, you know, if 
at the state level, it's it's managed at that level, then it solves it for everyone and everyone's on an even playing field. I also think that rigorous um, secret shoppers sting, someone talked about stings and, um, you know, I talked about fines and revoking licenses. Um, even, you know, no matter how hard, one person brought a, up a good point, no matter how hard we try, we can even ask that person who the, are they buying it for someone else or are they buying it for themselves and why are they buying it and they you know you can't control what other people do we can't control everything um we just can't and so in order to do that you know we have to think about what kind of administrative resources it would require to enforce whatever policy that we're putting forward and you know good policy you know every policy has intended and unintended consequences and cost associated with enforcing it and so you have to ask yourself can you enforce it we already have laws we're just not enforcing them as well as we could um there were some people that said why can't we manage it like marijuana dispensaries i'm not sure how they manage it i don't know that we have those in sacramento county not sure that's valid for us, um, but there was a thought there that maybe there was a level of enforcement that could help the situation to keep this out of the hands of children. And um, I also heard comments around education. Um, I heard, uh, you know, you know, well, education, higher um, educating the public. Uh, an education campaign that talks about how damaging this can be and how dangerous it is and and so forth. I think, um, you know, I'm not going to support it because I'm not because I don't believe in health. I, I get the, I understand the argument about health. I'm not a smoker. I'm also not a perfect person. When I was young, I tried to smoke a cigarette. I've, I've done it and coughed and all that. Um, but um, again, I don't, I, you know, I am a, a strong proponent of uh, medical freedom and um, freedom, independence, free enterprise. That's what America is all about. That's why people want to come to America. And if we start micromanaging everything, people won't be independent anymore. And um, the other thing I wanted to uh, just touch on briefly was um, if you do pass it, there were some very passionate pleas uh, around some long time traditions, uh, things I'm not sure I'm well educated on, but the FDA approved, you know, use of products in the hookah lounges and you'll be shutting down businesses. Do you really want to do that in the middle of COVID? Um, do you want hardship in the middle of COVID when people are going through the hardest time? And also, um, Sacramento City apparently gave six months, but I wonder if it would be possible to just, um, I don't know, I mean, revisit this after November and see, you know, let this go to the, let this happen at the state level so that we can have an equal playing field for our businesses um, and um, so that you know we're not um, singling out the unincorporated county the unincorporated county is you know it's important they don't have the advantages that some of the cities do you know the resources or the support they don't always have we don't always have the best roads you know it's you know it's the unincorporated county that we're trying to help we, we should be helping those businesses and helping those people. And, you know, so I, you know, I wonder if there's a way that we could launch, you know, a, a rigorous, you know, spend money on an educational campaign and a secret shopper and, you know, pass something that, you know, if they get caught selling it to kids, it, their license gets revoked and they have a, a large fine, not 250 up to 10,000, but 10,000 or whatever. And, and I also think it would be good if we could do some more, have some more conversation with the retail community um, who are working with this and maybe with also 
you know, the, the proponents for, you know, against the, um, the flavored vaping so that they could maybe work together to figure out, you know, how can we tackle this together to solve some of these problems? I bet the retail community would be willing to have that conversation with them. So um, those are my comments. I, I don't really want to support passing it tonight, but I want to I want to have a conversation about solutions around this because I do believe in um, health and and well being and and all that. And um, so those are my comments. Thank you, Supervisor Foss. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I too want to thank all the callers for calling in. Um, that was probably one of the most civil uh, discussions over something that's uh, that, that, that is personal and means a lot to people that I've seen uh, in, in quite some time. So I, I, I truly appreciate the tenor of the conversation. Uh, I have a question of uh, County Council, if Lisa's there. Or anybody. I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Procedurally, Lisa, I mean, you know, because the 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 action item says to continue, but do, do we do we vote on something tonight and then continue it? I guess it depends on um, what you're proposing to vote on. Um, I I think if you're voting on the ordinance as written, then yes, you can vote on it. If you're voting to have further discussion, then you would just continue it um, without actually introducing the ordinance. Um, I've also heard the possibility of adding additional time for effectiveness. So I would um, say that if that was the will of the board that you would introduce the ordinance with whatever effective date um, you would like, whether it's six months or X amount of days, and then you would vote on that um, tonight. Okay, then I, 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 Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, that we um, I'm sorry, Supervisor Kennedy, this is Diana Reese from County Council, and I, I represent finance and that dra drafted the ordinance. And all I wanted to ask is if uh, the board is going to consider delayed um, implementation to allow uh, businesses to sell off their inventory, if that could also include a prohibition against buying new flavored tobacco inventory during that time. Yes, that would be certainly the intent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kenny. So with, with that, I would like to make a motion to approve uh, the ordinance uh, with that uh, change in that it would take effect uh, six months from adoption and uh, that no, uh, during that time period, no new um, products that are covered under the ordinance would be purchased. And, and that, that's my motion. Second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, and I see uh, a hand. I know Supervisor Desmond indicated he may want to uh, suggest a, a amendment. I wanted to, before we get to any more procedural pieces, I do want to just speak to the motions on the floor. I was going to speak before, but uh, it's fine. Um, I want to just say that, um, uh, you know, along with my colleagues, that hearing the, the testimony, the fact that folks took the time one to sort of prepare comments, uh, some who submitted them in advance, others who obviously called in today as word spread that we were um, considering uh, what's before us here this evening and obviously is now in the form of a motion. Um, I wanna just say too that um, I don't see what's before us as being um, a, a punitive as it relates to retailers. I think that as we, as we um, have heard from those, some of those are called in, but also, um, and again, I know um, <clears throat> Diane Ruiz and the County Council's office, when we've had violations have brought this to us in the past, we've had very few violations of the existing tobacco ordinance over the years. And I think it is because one, we have, you know, an effective uh, ordinance, but also we have, uh, you know, clear uh, commitment by those who are in the retail industry that uh, for the provisions that either provide for the sale of alcohol, I mean, alcohol, excuse me, tobacco products to those who are of age uh, and any restrictions that come under the county ordinance have, uh, at least as, as best we know, have, um, you know, tailored their, their business model and have committed themselves to, um, you know, working within the law. But 
I also want to just say that I think some of the testimony this evening from not only from organizations who have long advocated for stronger policies and, and uh, uh, certainly healthy approaches to um, the conduct of our daily activities, but certainly from young people and from others, in fact, those who spoke to the benefits, at least as they saw them of, of vaping. But this ordinance does revise an ordinance we've had in place has been revised a couple of times over the years. And I think the original ordinance goes back to the early 2000s uh, as related to some of the tobacco regulation. And I guess for me, it's, it, it boils down to, to do what we, what we can do, recognizing that we can't do it all and that we're not empowered to do that. And that when it comes to other um, uh, products uh, that are um, uh, considered for adult use, i.e. alcohol. The state has, you know, basically usurped local authority as relates to some of those regulations. And uh, I know that, you know, stories can be shared and certainly uh, impacts of uh, the um, forces that are work with alcohol and alcohol uh, abuse and so forth. But you know, as well as, you know, uh, when it gets in the hands of those who are uh, below age um, of the, uh, uh, sale to, to, to them, some very uh, uh, dramatic uh, impacts can, can happen. But so this ordinance basically, is, is, and I think staff characterize it well, is that um, what it does is it strengthens our current ordinance, uh, recognizing that there's things in play at the state level. Uh, and um, the effort here is to reduce access to the purchase of or use of tobacco, uh, flavored tobacco products, and thereby, I think it said in the staff report well that it reduces the potential for young people and youth to begin or continue using tobacco products. And I think, as we all know, addiction to anything uh, is 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 a tremendously devastating and, and terrible thing. And that um, again, people make choices in their adult lives to uh, choose to you know, pursue certain uh, use of products and or other activities. But uh, here, when we talk about our young people, and we saw some of them this evening on the video and heard from some of them on the call in. I think that, um, you know, that thought about experimenting at a young age um, and then having the avenues by which to do it. And, and granted, I, you know, I, I trust that there are different ways to get these products, but uh, by limiting them to some extent, uh, maybe at least a shortcut some of those avenues. And uh, I'm going to bring it back to what I said a moment ago. I think it's do what we can do, certainly with a uh, eye to fairness and and uh, trying to to balance our decision making as uh, one of my colleagues said a moment ago, but also recognizing that we have the opportunity to do something. And uh, I guess I would choose to do something rather than, than to do nothing or to to punt on this one to the um, to the state. And again, the will of the voters will be heard uh, in November. And again, I have confidence in the will of the voters. And if they choose to do something different, then uh, what we do locally may may or may not be impacted by that. But for the Time being, um, I believe we can do something more than we've done in the past and, and prepare to uh, support uh, with the amendment. I did think that the uh, ability for retailers to um, uh, be able to reduce their inventory, uh, particularly against small retailers, uh, was an important aspect. And, you know, be, not just because it mirrors the city, but I think it was an important consideration. And so I think that helps uh, um, ease some of the. Um, impact certainly to the retail community that will be felt by this ordinance uh, should we adopt it. So, but I'm prepared to support it here this evening and thank all of those who again, took time throughout the course of a long day for us, but certainly a long day for them as well to call and express their concerns and support, express their support and our opposition to what we're considering. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Now, Supervisor Desmond, I think you had your hand up. Yes, uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Yes. Chair. So I'd like to make a substitute motion if I might. Uh, to adopt the ordinance with the additional language that Supervisor Kennedy mentioned as far as expand, extending or delaying imp implementation for six months, but also adding um, an exemption for hookah that mirrors the language from uh, SB 793. Um, not exactly sure where that incorporation would be. It would probably put be put in um, at the end of section 4.07.110. Okay, that's, that's, that's my motion. We have substitute motion. Is there a second? Your nose. 
second to the substitute motion. So if there is one, then the substitute would die for lack of a second. Understood. No, I know. I just I mean, again, I want to be clear. There was somebody considering a second. So okay. You want anything else, Mr. Desby? You want to, anything else you wanted to give a shot at? No, I, I just uh, um, I appreciate the conversation. I, I am I'm going to abstain from the vote tonight because I, I certainly don't want to send a message that I'm against um, um, banning flavored tobacco products, uh, but I'm not prepared to go um, as far as this ordinance goes. I mean, I, I was hoping for a second because I think it's something we could revisit at some point in the future. But uh, um, if we proceed uh, with Supervisor or, or Supervisor Kennedy's, uh, we proceed with that motion, then I will abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other supervisor want to comment before we? Uh, Lisa, did you want to weigh in? I see you. No, I don't need to weigh in. Just the motion. Oh, I'm sorry, I just saw you. Okay, I didn't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Supervisor Cerna, you have your hand up. I just, I just wanted to briefly respond to uh, Supervisor Desmond and let him know how much uh, what he just said is um, refreshing and uh, very, very welcome. Uh, here's here's a situation where we have some respectful uh, disagreement and uh, the way he's handled or the way he's um, teed it up tonight. Uh, we may not be on the same uh, exact side on this one, but uh, to have it expressed the way he's done just now uh, as someone that's been on this board for a dozen years, almost uh, extremely um, respectful of it and uh, welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Are there any, any other board member comments? If not, we do have a main motion on the um, from the floor and uh, I will call for the vote here unless there's any further comments by board members. All right, um, seeing no hands, then I'll go to the clerk to, um, and maybe just for the record, so it's clear to those who've been tuned in all afternoon, um, Read the read the motion that's on the record, if you would, uh, Flo, before we actually call for the vote. So, thank you. Yeah, so uh, a motion was made by Supervisor Kennedy and seconded by Supervisor Phil Cerna to approve the adoption of the ordinance as it has been submitted, uh, also amending it to include that it would become effective six months after the adoption, and also uh, adding on that no new product would be purchased uh, in between this time. I might not have said it exactly the way he said okay. it, but that's my notes, paraphrasing. Sure, no, that's good. So, and that language will be uh, put in the proper format then uh, County Council, um, again, in, when this comes back, this would come back, come back to us, this is first reading, so this is introducing the ordinance, so it'll come back to us in two okay. weeks, so. Right. On the 25th, we'll have the revised um, language um, for your approval. Okay, thank you. That's the motion then. If nothing further than uh, flow, please call the vote. Supervisors Frost? No. Kennedy? Aye. Desmond? Not voting. I'm sorry, did you say abstain? Abstain. Okay. Sorry. And then Supervisor Cerna? Aye. And Supervisor Natoli? Aye. And the motion carries. Let the record reflect that Supervisor Fro uh, Frost casted a no vote and Supervisor Desmond abstained from voting on this. Okay, that's the uh, three o'clock item. <laughs> but uh, with that, uh, thank you all. And uh, again, good deliberation and uh, thank my colleagues for their patience as we took testimony. Okay, brings us down to not the last item, but the last uh, timed item of the day. And that's our um, discussion regarding uh, the, um, the 330 item on the Initial recommendations on the American Rescue Plan Act. So, uh, Madam Clerk, call that into the record, please, and we'll get the presentation and then go into discussion on this one. Yes, sir. So, item 60 approve the initial project recommendations for phase one of the American Rescue Plan Act, approve an appropriations adjustment request in the amount of $10,751,251, approve a salary resolution amendment adding one FTE term, limited term administrative services officer two in the Office of Economic Development, authorize the allocation of $64,000 for the purchase of one vehicle for emergency medical services. 
Approve resolutions authorizing agreements associated with the implementation of American Rescue Plan Act projects. And I will promise we'll take a, a break for breakfast between item 60 and 61, okay? <laughs> Good evening, uh, uh, Chair Natoli, members of the board. Um, I'm Amanda Thomas, the county's chief fiscal officer. Um, and I will be introducing um, this item to discuss initial project recommendations for um, the county's use of funding under the American Rescue Plan state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, I'll be joined uh, by the directors of each department with a recommended project to provide an overview of each project recommended for funding. Um, they are Siobhan Katari, Director of Health Services, Emily Halpin, Director of Homeless Initiatives, Michelle Callejas, Director of Child, Family, and Adult Services, uh, Sylvester Fidal, Director of Personnel Services, Marie Wooden, Director of Environmental Management, and Troy Gibbons, Director of Economic Development. Hopefully I didn't leave anyone off that list. Um, and I did wanna take this opportunity just to thank them and um, the staff within each of those departments for all of the work that went into getting us to this point. Um, I will also mention that we also have representatives on the line from Deloitte um, who has been advising the county on ARPA, should there be any questions that are best addressed by them. Amanda, if I could just one second. Did we have a changeover in our format, uh, Madam Clerk? Because I only see the presentation in the man in the past. We were able to see colleagues and that there was a, qu uh, a question. Is there, we have a cut over to cable or something? I'm sorry. So are you asking for them to close the present? Okay, there we go. Well, yeah, no, I just couldn't. Before, if, if a supervisor wanted to talk, I could see their hand come up. And it, what I was seeing a moment ago was, well, what? Just a picture. Oh, of the, I think uh, when the presentation is up, it uh, only shows the person who's speaking to the presentation. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's another it, format. It's a it's a different format. Than what no, Supervisor Tolley. This yeah, this is Supervisor Turner. Uh, yeah. I think what you're seeing is the broadcast uh, in our actual Zoom, and so that's why you're seeing kind of a stretched out image of whoever's talking. Yeah, a little different than what we saw after a new wall. Yeah. I am no longer seeing the presentation. Are others? Metro Cable, would you please bring that? There, there we go. Is. Okay. Um, go ahead, man. Sorry. Okay. No, thank you. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So um, just by way of background, and as, as you know, the board approved ARPA phase one funding allocations for the initial $150 million tranche on November 2nd, 2021. Um, these funding allocations included three strategic investments, housing and homelessness, health, and economic response. So each of the projects recommended today falls within one of these strategic investments. And I'll be providing some additional background on each of these strategic investments on the following slides. Um, it's important to note that this initial recommendation is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list of phase one projects, but rather represents the projects that are most fully scoped and ready to begin implementation. Um, and staff continues to develop and scope additional projects uh, within each strategic investment area. Next slide, please. So the next few slides will recap each of the strategic investment areas that were approved in November, with the first being housing and homelessness, including housing and support services for people experiencing homelessness and affordable housing. Um, the strategic investment is targeted toward helping people experiencing homelessness, as well as those who have fallen behind in rent or are in need of affordable housing. And the approved funding allocation is 39% of phase one, or $59.5 million. Next slide, please. The second strategic investment is health, including COVID-19 response, public health, mental health, and substance abuse treatment. Uh, projects in this investment area will help people experiencing health impacts from the pandemic, as well as communities with lack of access to healthcare. And the approved funding allocation for health is 13% of phase one or $19.9 million. Next slide, please. 
The third strategic investment is economic response, including addressing negative economic impacts to residents, communities, and businesses. Um, economic response investments are targeted to businesses and workers who have been impacted by the pandemic, including those in low-income in communities or who serve low-income communities. And the approved funding allocation for this strategic Im investment is also 13% of phase one or $19.9 million. Next slide, please. So before I turn it over to the departments to discuss each project, I wanted to provide an overview of this initial recommendation, which includes a total of 23 projects with total ARPA funding of approximately $54.5 million. Um, of that amount, it's estimated that $11.3 million would be spent during fiscal year 2021-22. And then you can see on the table on this slide how the projects and funding are distributed among the strategic investments. So for housing and homelessness, this initial recommendation includes six projects um, for total ARPA funding of about $17.5 million, leaving a remaining allocation of $42 million. Um, for health, there are nine projects for total ARPA funding of $17 million. For economic response, eight projects, total funding of about $19.8 million. Um, for, for ease of presentation, the remainder of the slides that are going to detail each project are organized by department rather than strategic investment. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Siobhan Katari to present the projects for the Department of Health Services. Good evening board, next slide please. So as Amanda said, we have nine projects that I'm gonna to present today. I just wanted to highlight, and I, she mentioned this, but um, these are projects that we feel were project ready or shovel ready, if you will. There are some other projects that have been proposed that we're looking at digging into more details. And so I just wanted to let folks know that if a project that's been proposed or pitched isn't shown here tonight, it doesn't mean that it's not being considered still. This first project is actually a project that's coming both out of the housing and homelessness tranche as well as the health tranche of 50-50, so 5 million out of each. And it's to build the Sacramento County Social Health Connect. And I've come to the board before to talk about the Social Health Information Exchange, which is a countywide data infrastructure that will link medical, behavioral health, social services, and housing information about the folks that we serve from multiple sources and data systems to really allow us to do more comprehensive care coordination and allow us to get a really good handle on population health for our community. This is a um, investment that not only will help all of our organizations, healthcare, social services, to do better on behalf of those that we serve, but it will also advance some of the initiatives I've been speaking to you about under CalAIM. The total project cost that we are anticipating is about $30 million for this project. However, what we're asking for today is an initial investment from ARPA funding of 10 million. The balance of that funding, we will be seeking from other sources, including our managed care plan partners through the CalAIM incentive funding. So we have already been discussing that with them and they're um, very willing partners in this. Um, this initial allocation of funding would allow us to hire three staff to get this started, two within the Department of uh, Technology, DTEC, and one within the Department of Health Services to launch the project and, and get it rolling this year. So that is our first project. Um, I, next slide, please. This next project is a community nursing or field nursing team of nurses that will go out, public health nurses that will go out to provide outreach, client advocacy, and case management to individuals experiencing homelessness within our encampments. So um, the board funded the encampment teams and this community nursing unit would really partner with the encampment teams to go out and provide that health care assessments and linkages. And so the total project cost is $700,000. And we anticipate that by the time 
we get nurses hired, uh, it will be next fiscal year, which is why there's no budget for this fiscal year. We're looking to hire a team of five for this. Next slide. This next proposal uh, is similar to the last proposal. It's a field nursing or community nursing unit to serve children and families at risk of homelessness through our Black Child Legacy Incubator sites. So we have seven of those sites. So this would hire a nursing supervisor and seven nurses to be located in those sites. And this team would provide assessments and interventions, care coordination, linkages to health resources and health education to pregnant and parenting families who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. And the total project cost is 1.5 million. Once again, we anticipate launching this in July. Next slide. This next slide uh, represents the investment into the SURE Sobering Center run by WellSpace Health. And this is a, a center that uh, we have discussed at the board before. We have partnered with the city of Sacramento and would like to continue this partnership to be able to fund the Sobering Center. This would provide uh, short-term recovery, detoxification, and recuperation from the effects of drugs and alcohol primarily focusing on methamphetamine addiction. One of the primary intents of this is to reduce the impacts on emergency rooms and the county jail. And the total cost of this for two years is $2.6 million. Next slide. This next proposal is for our medical services that we provide at Project Room Key, which are our hotels for uh, homeless individuals who are at risk of contracting COVID-19. This includes our, us providing health education, care coordination, harm reduction, wellness and supportive care, intakes and assessment, COVID-19 isolation, COVID-19 testing and vaccination to prevent outbreaks. So this would be a uh, total project cost of 1.5 million, which we're seeking 1 million through ARPA funding. Next slide, please. This next proposal is emergency medical- I'm Sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Back, back, um, sorry, Mr. Back Chair. Back one slide, please. Yeah, um, is, would this be applicable to just room key or home key as well? This is just project room key. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, this next slide is uh, for our EMS, our emergency uh, management services, emergency medical services equipment. Currently EMS is a primary responder during activations of our emergency operations center. They're also an integral component of the county's PPE and medical supply distribution network. So this funding would provide equipment and supplies to more safely and rapidly deploy the temporary medical mobile facilities that we deploy in events of either COVID-19 resurgence or other EOC activations or emergencies. Uh, the supplies we would get would also enhance staff and volunteer safety during an emergency. Total project cost is $107,000. Next slide, please. This next proposal is to um, get additional primary health clinic staffing through our registry services. So not hiring additional county staff, but being able to bring on additional registry uh, medical staff to provide uh, services to individuals through our primary care clinic, um, supporting the goal of increasing access to care. This, there's been an increased demand for these services as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, and the total cost of this is 2.4 million in ARPA funding. This next proposal is for pandemic technology needs. As a result of the pandemic, we've seen a need for increased IT services and staffing to support and deploy new public health and behavioral health systems and adjustments to our current system so that we can track data and provide care for the community. So this funding would allow DTEC to provide these increased services. Total project cost $350,000. Next slide, please. This next proposal is to hire a 0.5 um, half-time medical registry registered nurse for our youth detention facility, 
who will be dedicated to monitoring, infection control, providing immunizations, and patient and staff education, and assisting the program to keep up with evolving Cal OSHA standards in our youth detention facility. And the total request is $191,000 from ARPA funding. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it over at this point to Emily Halkin, our Director of Homeless Initiatives. What question before you leave, uh, yes. go, Siobhan. Back to the community um, nursing children families unit. Are they gonna be stationed out at the Family Resource Centers? I heard you say it's about seven locations, but we have the resource centers. Is that where they're gonna be working out we of? We have the resource centers and we have the Black, Legacy, Black Child Legacy incubator sites. They will be housed at the incubator sites, but work very closely with the resource centers as well. So yes, they will be serving uh, the resource centers and the incubator sites. And so I wanted to ask on the, the FRCs, because again, those are in place. We've obviously found funding through realignment or general fund. And I know they ran into, I think, a shortfall here <clears throat> uh, mid or late part of last year. But in addition to the incubator sites, those sites have long been established as you know, hubs for uh, provision of services for folks that we know are at risk. I'm curious, have we looked have we had conversation with our partners in the family resource centers about any needs they might have? And again, I know this isn't an all-inclusive list, but as I think about it and, and heard your presentation, I'm wondering, you know, what are we doing for those that are already our, our partners? We're helping ourselves as a county internally, but what about the external pieces of this? So. Yeah, so the, these are certainly um, our partners, existing partners that we intend to continue to partner with to amplify this. I don't know that I could answer your questions um, and maybe Bruce or Ann who know more about the family resource centers can, can answer that, um, but I can get more information for you about that by the end of this presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, Ma. And again, I'm just saying to my colleagues, I cannot see on the screen right now. Um, I know Flo's working on it. I can't. So if there's any board member wanted to weigh in before we went to Emily's presentation, speak up. I think, I think Supervisor Desmond was ahead of me. Oh, thanks. Okay. So. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I can't see you. Okay, that's fine. I, I can only see you. Well, that's why I, I, I was teed up earlier. You didn't notice me. I thought yeah, I can't see you. Excuse, <laughs> me. Excuse me, board members. This is the yeah. clerk. I just wanted to let you know that something did happen technically between the video, uh, something about the presentation feed, and there, we are trying to work that out without disrupting the meeting in the background. So I apologize that the same screen is not available to you, Supervisor Natoli, my apology. It, it, it's okay, I don't wanna miss my colleagues. And so Flo, you can help out, you're very good. If you can see it all, if you see hands, uh, while we're still trying to work out that, you know, we've got Supervisor Desmond and then Supervisor Cern in the queue, but um, I know Supervisor Kennedy weighed in. So you can you can help me with that flow. You've been helpful all day long. So okay. I'll let you kind of help guide it. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Rich. Okay, so um, Siobhan, I think on the, um, um, the community nursing, the encampment unit pilot, that was a few slides back, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So I had a question. I know most of these, they're, they're health related, and so they'll be countywide. We'll be operating in the unincorporated county and in the cities to provide these, these kinds of supports. But this one, I'm, so I'm assuming this one, since it's gonna be working with our encampment teams, this will be primarily unincorporated county, these efforts for this item? That's what we're looking at at this point is them being embedded with our unincorporated, our county encampment teams. Great. And then um, the, the one to support uh, the Shore Center, which I'm, I'm a big fan of and I know Supervisor Cerna is largely responsible for this. Um, and I just hope that we're going to be considering in terms of um, future funding for ARPA that we consider expanding. This does not include an expansion of it, right? It just include makes it uh, what? Correct. It's 24 seven. Okay. Yeah. It's not an expansion. We're uh, paying 50% of the co overall cost of it. Uh, with the city is paying the other 50%. So this is looking at this current fiscal year we're in as well as next fiscal Got year. It. I mean, it's such a great model. I would love to see it obviously expanded, replicated in another part of the county too. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. And I see Supervisor Cerna's hand is up as well. Yes, <clears throat> thank you to the chair. Um, so uh, 
I have a specific question that uh, tees off of uh, what Supervisor Antoli mentioned a few moments ago about FRCs. Um, and I know we're gonna get some more uh, specificity from, from Bruce, I guess, offline uh, about um, uh, whether or not, I think it was, uh, was it nursing family? Um, the community I, nursing? Yeah, the community nursing. So uh, if you actually, if you can go back to that, slide that would be helpful sure yeah it's about five slides back i believe it's the my second slide i think it oh, is. no i thought okay well whatever slide it was okay. um slide nine slide so, nine thank you so um i just wanted to point out that i know there we have you know several frcs obviously scattered across the the county um the one that um uh i've worked uh, my office has worked uh, very closely with and continues to do so uh, is the one at the FRCC, the Fruage Community Collaborative. Um, and um, as I think uh, most know, um, Syria Health Foundation is in the process of um, taking over the responsibility uh, there in terms of kind of the property management and uh, overall kind of oversight of activities um, at the former Fruit Ridge uh, Elementary School. Um, and I'm just wondering, <clears throat> uh, in the, the course of answering the, the question for uh, Supervisor Natoli, have we um, looked at <clears throat> kind of maybe the, the uniqueness of um, how this allocation might work at that particular um, FRC, given that there's uh, a significant amount of uh, BCLC activities that go on there, um, even pre-COVID uh, relative to, you know, uh, you know, a dozen or so um, nonprofits that are housed there. So I guess I, I would just ask that you add that to the question slash consideration of, of uh, you know, specifically providing some resources for this intended purpose at that particular FRC is, is what I'm same. Great. I, I appreciate that. And I know Michelle Callas is on uh, on the call right now. So if she has anything she wants to add, certainly she can. But yeah, we'll take all of this into consideration um, and definitely choose sites based upon this discussion tonight. So the goal is really to reach to reach out to those communities. Uh, how we do that is still uh, flexible. Okay. And then thank you. And then um, generally and overall, when, especially when it comes to homeless and housing services, have we, has our staff in coming up with these preliminary uh, recommendations explored what, um, not just the city of Sacramento, but um, some of our other uh, uh, cities as well, what they're doing on that particular front with their uh, ARPA allocations? Because as I think was discussed um, uh, pretty exhaustively at the beginning of the whole ARPA conversation months ago was let's be smart about how we might uh, look at um, uh, merging resources from both the unincorporated county and various cities that are also eligible and receiving ARPA funds so that we can maybe have something greater than the, just the sum of the parts in terms of um, you know, the various um, allocations that are coming from the federal treasury. Yeah, and I'll have to ask Emily as she speaks to her part to really talk about that. Some of the services that I'm talking about today, public health, uh, behavioral health, those are really things that the county provides. And so um, I don't know, I, I can't speak to what the cities are doing in those realms, but from the housing and homelessness, is that what you? Well, no, you, you, you kind of just nailed it on the head, though, when you say it's something that just the county provides. Um, I, I think there's there there continues to be a lot of focus and concern that um, you know the county has certainly its fair share of uh, homeless challenge in the unincorporated county, but there's certainly a great deal of what goes into effectively addressing homelessness. Um, that yes, you you know the county uniquely provides those services, whether it's public health or or, or uh, AOD or what what have you. And I'm just wondering because of your response to Supervisor Desmond about 10 minutes ago that uh, I think he said, no, this is just gonna be for 
uh, the unincorporated county. And so that's what kind of piqued my interest was, are we just talking about what is being preliminarily recommended in terms of homeless response just for the home, for, for the unincorporated county tonight? Or is some of this both unincorporated and within some of the cities as well? Yeah, and I would say it's both um, for some of the proposals. So if um, for some of the proposals, it may, for instance, the encampment teams are currently, um, uh, and I'll let Emily speak to this, but currently the encampment teams are serving the unincorporated county because there is a similar mechanism in some of the cities, like the Department of Community Resources. And that's, and I get that, and I appreciate you saying that. I think in the future, though, I, I'm, and, and there may be others. Um, on the board as well. I'd like to have a really clear understanding of, you know, what we see as kind of the countywide service delivery intent with this, these recommendations versus just the unincorporated. Great, will do, thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Kennedy has his hand up now. Thanks, I can't see you. <laughs> thanks, Ed. I think Supervisor Desmond was before me. Oh, I, oh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Kennedy. I, I just wanted to uh, echo Supervisor Cerna's sentiment. I, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, there are obviously there are things that, that we will be providing countywide and, and to the extent it's something where it bleeds over to have that kind of clear understanding of, of who has what role and responsibility and where we have those opportunities to team up with the city. So um, that's why I asked, was asking that question specifically about the encampment team. So yeah, thank you, Supervisor Cerna, for uh, for bringing that up. Yeah, and I, I was uh, going to actually say the same thing um, because you know we keep we keep saying, you know, to the city that these are the services we provide countywide. So um, we 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 want to be crystal clear that this isn't just unincorporated uh, for the services that we traditionally provide. And and the Sacramento Bee continues to remind us too. Yeah. <laughs> If I could add, um, Go ahead, Ed. I think that um, much of what Siobhan is talking about are the traditional services that county public health and primary health provide. Um, you know, we do have some distinction on the encampment team, uh, but as you know, um, we do go out uh, to encampments um, that are not in unincorporated county from time to time as well. In fact, very often, but I think these health and public health uh, programs are designed to serve the entire county. Yeah, I think uh, if I may, Supervisor, um, I was just going to echo what Ann just said. And I think as Emily goes through these proposals, we can speak to the dialogue we've had with the other jurisdictions. We are in regular contact with them about their plans and ours. So uh, as Emily goes through this, perhaps we can speak to that more specifically. Okay, so can we, um, good evening, slide 16, I think is what it is. Okay, uh, good evening board, um, Emily Houck and your director of homeless initiatives. Um, and in addition to some of the collaborative projects that Siobhan already detailed that are partnerships between homelessness and healthcare, I'm gonna go through three of them, but I wanted to really quickly address Supervisor Cerner's question about some of the other jurisdictions. And certainly the work with the city is ongoing and, and very detailed. We have had some really preliminary, really good conversations with the city of Elk Grove, who similarly took some of their ARPA allocation and dedicated it to housing and homelessness, kind of in the same vein that you guys did. And we're looking at a potential partnership with them. Um, we, I haven't heard a similar sort of allocation methodology for some of the other cities, but we certainly can reach out because I would anticipate some of them would want to prioritize funds into housing and homelessness, and, and certainly we need to make sure that we're partners with them. So, um, uh, the first project that I wanted to talk about um, is a recommendation for landlord engagement and rehousing support. The recommendation is for a $10 million allocation. This is really intended to be complementary to a lot of the investments you made through your budget process uh, back in September, where you really focused a lot on outreach, engagement, and sheltering for folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness, and really with the intent to make a demonstrable difference in the crisis of unsheltered homelessness. But as you have recognized many times, and we all know, the other side of the coin is to make sure that we have sufficient, available, affordable housing opportunities for folks who are exiting homelessness, both directly from the streets and from shelters. 
Um, so the intent of this program is to increase those housing outcomes, um, working with existing housing programs to supplement, not supplant the things they do. We know that in our community, we have a lot of housing programs, but many of them are restricted by funding regulations or targeting certain subpopulations. Um, the, program, this, the goal of this program is really to be agnostic to who the person is, what other funding they might be receiving, and breaking down some of the barriers that are preventing those programs from being as successful as they should be. Um, with approval today, we will um, enter into a full scoping pro process with this, this, is why you don't see any expenditures this fiscal year. We think we need at least a few months to engage the community, housing providers, the continuum of care, and others to really design what this should look like. But some of the intentions behind this investment, as I said, are to break down um, barriers within existing programs to provide those critical rehousing services that some of them can't do or aren't able to do as efficiently. Um, two examples, and one that you guys just discussed today, earlier Siobhan talked about the new allocation through CalAIM that will allow us to access some um, tenancy supports through managed care, which is a great resource and we want to tap into, but CalAIM can't do the rental payment. So marrying these two programs will help create efficacy um, through the CalAIM and, and allow us to leverage those dollars much better. Similarly, we all know that we have a lot of folks in, um, experiencing homelessness who are accessing our housing choice voucher program through SHRA. It's a great resource for ongoing stable affordable housing, but it can't do all those one time things like pay a rental application, pay a deposit, and it certainly can't pay the ongoing tenancy supports that help landlords become comfortable and engage with the program. So that's what this program is intended to do is fill in those gaps in some of our existing programs to make them more effective. Um, secondly, we think it's really important that this program will do, and there's been conversations at the Katim of Care and, and with other jurisdictions about this, and we think we can bring it to scale, is developing a real dedicated line of work here in our community um, and funding for ongoing engagement with landlords, apart from case management, apart from all the social services that we do, that really is dedicated to identification, identification of avail available units, supporting with lease up efforts, um, ongoing tenancy supports and provision of rental assistance, again, with the focus on having landlords be engaged in the programs that we have. And then finally, um, as I mentioned with the example of CalAIM, is scaling up some rental assistance resources that truly are flexible and can be used with any population agnostic to, to who they are, what other programs they're engaging in. And again, this would be countywide. So we would be working with our partners in different shelters throughout the community, different outreach programs, certainly with SHRA and the, the Kachim of Care to, um, to, to help use these resources um, most effectively. Emily, if I could ask you again, I can't see if other supervisors <laughs> have their hands up, but on this one, I mean, we received a tremendous amount of money for uh, rental assistance for both tenants as well as landlords. And if I last recall, we still were undersubscribed for, you know, the many, close to $100 million countywide, if I'm not mistaken, in that last tranche. And I know that Michelle, certainly working with you and others, uh, have been, you know, looking to see to it that that rental system was there. I, this is this differs. I get I get the distinctions, but I'm just curious. We're putting another $10 million in um, for this, and this, I guess, will carry this through the next year, but um, we still have money. We, we still have money on the table, if I'm not mistaken, for rental assistance that was provided under ARPA under a different funding uh, uh, silo, right, or stream. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen, I think you're talking about the ERAP program, which is emergency yeah. rental assistance right. program. Um, there, I believe there's still some funding unused. The difference there is that that is a targeted to folks who are currently housed and at risk of losing housing. This is intended to focus on folks who are currently homeless. And the second thing with the ERAP program is that it's limited to one-time costs. So they can fund you know, a down payment, but they don't stay on board. They don't case carry. They don't stay supporting the client. Um, the goal here is to have somebody who, if the client doesn't pay rent, you can call, or if there's a loud party or, or something goes awry and the landlord's nervous. So it is a different um, intention, a different subpopulation. Certainly, um, we can work, I think working with SHRE is critical um, and, and potentially leveraging some of the resources they have, but this is, this is a different focus. Well, let me ask one piece about this, though. If memory serves me correct going back now four years ago, but when we did the the county's homeless initiatives, and we talked about vouchers and about guaranteed um, 
you know, uh, basically deposits. For, you know, it, it said the event that there was damages and so forth. I thought we had that tailored under what SHRA um, was already reaching out to landlords with. We, had, we obviously had some, you know, uh, upper uh, limits on what we could pay as far as the vouchers and so forth. But I thought we already had that in place. And, you know, and, and maybe this is more of that or different in some, of, some ways, but we spent a lot of time talking about how we could assure landlords uh, that if they took on a, you know, a housing subsidy or a voucher, that they wouldn't be left holding the bag when it came to either deposits or damages and so forth. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can. Yeah, and and to be fair, uh, you know, and I should have been a little more specific here, is that the, the amount of the 10 million going towards actually subsidy payments, like a damage fund or or a, a double deposit, is pretty de minimis. What re, what evidence has shown is that many land you don't landlords want that assurance that it's there, but they don't often draw from it. The vast majority of these this funding is for the staff to provide the 24 seven support to both the clients and to the landlord and for actual rent subsidies for folks who don't have access to a voucher. So there is a small component of this that is sort of like the one-time assurances or damage funds, but it's it's definitely not the vast majority here. Um, and I would anticipate that it, it, you know, having it there is important for an assurance, but um, it's, it's not typically drawn upon. And I'm okay. happy to provide a breakdown into what builds up this 10 million, if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it might be useful. Again, I know these are summaries, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Now I can see the full screen. I see Supervisor Desmond, his, his yeah. hand up. So thanks, Emily. Go ahead, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Natoli. Yeah, and thank you, Emily. I mean, this is great. Uh, this certainly, to me, strikes me as one of these things where it could be a partnership with the city. I guess my, my question is, I the, the, the cities get ARPA allocation to handle this kind of housing assistance as well. Is, is that correct? Or well, is this, this something is that's unique to the county? I'm sorry? Or is this something that's unique to um, the county as far as a county service? No, certainly this is something we are building. It doesn't exist currently. So a city could, cer could certainly choose to use some of their ARPA allocation to build a similar program. What might be more appropriate is that um, if we build the infrastructure, then cities could buy into it if they wanted to dedicate a couple million from their ARPA and expand it. Um, we've talked quite a bit at the continuum of care level of trying to sort of um, uh, have a sort of central hub so that not everybody is fighting for the same landlords. Um, I do think that it makes sense for the county to be that hub. And I do think reaching out to those cities if they want to participate, I don't think it would preclude us from helping somebody who's homeless, for example, Absolutely. in Rancho Cordova, um, yeah. but it would be something that they could expand with investment. Okay, great, thank you. I don't see any other hands, Supervisor Tolley. So no, I don't either. Go ahead. Okay, Thanks. you can see it now. Okay. I can finally so, see it. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Go. So next slide. Okay. So the second program, while much smaller in scale, um, I would is just as critical. And uh, I don't have to tell any of you guys. You know that the River District community, including a lot of the the portions that abut immediately abut the American River Parkway, is home to a disproportionate number of folks experiencing unsheltered homelessness in our county. And the city and the county certainly provide a lot of resources and outreach in that community. And many of the shelters in that community prioritize. Um, folks who are living on shelter in the River District for services. Um, but there's still a great need. And so this proposal would dedicate two full-time contracted outreach navigators to a county contract using a community-based organization um, to specifically work in the River District, focusing on outreach, engagement, and rehousing strategies. Um, DHA currently holds contracts for navigators that work throughout our county, so this would expand those contracts to add an additional two FTEs. Um, this would be an addition to, so this is not this is not taking existing navigators off the streets, and we'd be working with the city, of course, the river district, the providers in the river district, to really scope uh, how those. FTEs will be deployed to target the greatest need in the River District, and also to ensure that data is collected to, um, to demonstrate the efficacy of, of this very geographic targeted outreach. The chair. Yes. Sir, uh, go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Desmond after you, I'm sorry. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Um, Emily, uh, I uh, appreciate you kind of prefacing uh, this with, um, um, most, if not all of us, knowing kind of the unique uh, trials and tribulations the River District has faced during the pandemic, especially, um, and also uh, having uh, 
uh, one of the Project Winky um, uh, hotels located in the district. Uh, is there is there anything uh, specific to direct assistance working through the city with the city to uh, to to help the district economically besides just and I don't I don't mean to minimize this it's important the the two navigators but um, I I could easily see uh, River District uh, leadership uh, saying what about us and of course you know the uh, the knee-jerk response might be, well, you're in the city, let the city worry about it, but that's not the way I can look at it as the county representative representing that part of the city. So are we open to the idea of perhaps assisting um, through the other, uh, the other uh, pot of funds that we've identified for economic assistance, uh, helping places like the River District, which I would argue all day long has really taken um, you know, uh, more of a, um, a hit or a challenge, uh, given the nature of the pandemic and um, the services required there that, um, um, you know, are arguably uh, countywide service related. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think we ought to be thinking about, again, to kind of erase or, or make fuzzy the line between the city and the county when it comes to uh, these different, you know, pots of, of ARPA funding. Well, um, perhaps Troy would want to speak to the second part, but what I can add, I believe there have been conversations, and Anne may also want to add, um, about um, additional supports for the River District related to street management that the city is entertaining. So this is this is probably going to, I, I would anticipate, is a component of, of some larger investments in, in the River District. I don't know if Anne or Troy want to yeah. add anything. Yeah, I will. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Cerna. The, um, this uh, project came from um, a direct request from the River District, and this portion is half of what the original request was. The City of Sacramento is picking up the other half of, um, of the request from the River District uh, to do more um, garbage management and, and, and other things related to supporting that community. So we are okay. uh, working in partnership with the city on this project. No, that's that's a, a really important part of this, uh, at least for me to know, is that this it sounds like came at their request, correct? Yes, and I've spoken with, go ahead. I came at their request and Howard and I uh, talked and agreed that we would split the, the cost of the project. So we're doing this together. Terrific. And Jesus, I've spoken with Jenna Abbott about this, and, and yeah. I, I certainly want to speak for her, but I believe she's supportive and appreciative and would um, is looking forward to working with us on, on scoping how this looks. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. I think Desmond, Rich. Thank you. And, and no, I, I agree. The River District is unique in terms of the, the impact um, that they're facing from, from homelessness, the amount of homelessness there. So completely support it. I, but I, I, yeah, as I read it, I saw that it was associated with the, with the PBID specifically. And I, and I just had a question, does this kind of um, signal that we're going to be having a, a new approach to how we handle um, navigator contracts throughout the city? And I'm just asking, because I know we, you know, we have ours in the unincorporated area and I could certainly um, anticipate getting calls from from other P bids, even though they're not in the situation the River District is in. Mm -hmm. um, but they already, I already hear complaints about the, the lack of navigation services available in, in mm -hmm. some of these other uh, uh, commercial corridor areas. So the request certainly came through the P bid, but the contract and the management and the oversight of the actual navigators will will stay at the county. We're going to work with them like just like we would with any other community. So, for example, when we deploy. The um, parkway navigators will work closely with folks who have investment in the parkway, including our rangers, but others. So the funds are not flowing through the PBID. I, I know this isn't exactly answering your, your question. Um, they are a critical partner here, um, and they certainly will um, want to provide some input. Um, but this is, is a contract that will live at the county, be managed similar to our other outreach contracts. Got it. Okay, thank you, Emily. I, I just anticipate a lot of kind of me too's. I, I could see that happening. And then just in terms of the other navigators, you know, are, are we still set up? We have the Parkway Navigator, a north of the river navigator, a south of the river navigator, all through Sacramento self-help housing. Is that still where we are with the, in the unincorporated areas? 
Yeah, currently our contracts for um, outreach navigation, including the parkway and some of the ones in the unincorporated areas are through SAC self-help housing. Um, DHA just completed an RFK request for qualifications, and I believe they're bringing the qualified list to you in early February, um, for, for which we will draw the expanded navigator resources. The additional 10 navigators will be adding to the parkway, potentially these and some others. So the, it, the expanded contract, depending on the outcome of that RFQ, may continue to be SAC self-help. It may be them plus others. It may be somebody else. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. I think next slide. Um, and the final recommendation that I'm going to talk about is a request for an investment to expedite some work that's already underway that DTEC has taken on to develop a database to track and report out on our collective countywide efforts to um, engage with folks living in encampments, provide services to those encampments. Um, DTEC has created a prototype for this, um, which will allow us to track the size of the camps, how camps grow and shrink and move, um, how we as county staff um, and, and our contractors engage in those camps, debris removal, all those types of things, um, as well as movement of people out of encampments into shelters and housing. Um, what this proposal is doing is recommending shifting that work from DTEC um, to a consultant um, simply because of capacity and timing needs. Um, that consultant then would fully build out the prototype. They would work on integrating with existing county database and departments. They would um, be involved in the testing and training and the development of reporting functions. DTEC would oversee the contract and my office um, would provide some input on the content, um, how it's gonna be used um, and, and reporting requirements and our, goal of this um, shifting it to a consultant is really to expedite the availability of this, this, this critical resource. Question, Emily, but I'm still a little vague on what it is if we're going to spend 160000 So you're going to develop with the contractor, track and manage response to homeless encampments. So what do you mean? You're going to, you're going to like GIS so you know where they're going to? Or I mean, I don't, What's, what's this do? I mean, we know we can go out there visibly and see in any moment in time and see what's there. I mean, so what do you mean you're gonna track them? Yeah, so I can tell you my non-techie response to that. And then I think Romney might be on the phone. We can provide maybe a little bit more detail, but the prototype, for example, tracks um, our, when, when the county is notified of encampment, whether that be through your offices, through 311, right. through the public, it, uh, it details what that camp is. Is it enclaved vehicles? Is it tents? Is it structures? How many people are there? Where is it? Is it in the public right of way? Is it in private land? Um, what kinds of activities have, have we sent out the DHA social workers? Has DHS gone out of the public health nurses? Um, what offers of services have been made and accepted by clients and, and where are clients um, in the process of moving out of shelters. Um, as you know, we get a lot of, and the camps change a lot. So this will help us um, be more responsive to constituents, to your offices, um, and to frankly, to the people in encampments so that we can better prioritize the resources we have and, and um, get out to the encampments quicker. So it's, um, it's probably uh, technolo te technologically much more complex than I made it sound, um, but it's a pretty robust um, tool that will also allow us to pull out regular reports to share with, with you and, and the public. So it's an open page where county departments, our contractors, other partners can go in and input on particular locations. So if it's 10,000 home way, you're gonna have uh, data regarding that and all the things you mentioned and maybe others, is that? Is that right? Yeah, I think that's fair. It's web-based. It would be limited to county staff and county contractors, but we'll be able to extract data and report it out. Okay. Supervisor, the only thing I would add to what Emily said is, yeah. you know, as we've increased our effort with encampments, we've been recording information about our activities, but it's been very clear as we do more and more of it that we need to have a stronger approach to that, be able to record what we do, who we've contacted, um, it's really important to document those kinds of efforts. So that's really what this is all about. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Emily. Okay. And I think that completes my slides and I was gonna pass off to Michelle Cajas, I believe. All right, thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michelle, you're up. Chair, Chair hey. Anatoly, can I just say one, make one? Sure, yeah, yeah, Super Desmond, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, and I, I know it's okay. late. So I, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I'm talking to our, our county exec and, and Emily here a little bit. You know, we've had a lot of discussions about 
improving our, our coordinated entry and just coordination in general. And it seems like we're, we're creating a lot more programs, great programs. These are all great things, but I just, I hope we're looking at, at uh, avoiding more silos and fragmentation and, and hopefully everything we're doing, both us and the city of Sacramento, we will see more coordination um, as a result of this, right? I mean, as we're going through this process, I just want to throw that out there because I know that's a, a major problem we face. Emily, I know you and I have had many conversations about it after our trip, during and after our trip. So thank you. Yes. Just one follow on though. So we're going to do this with ARPA money in you, but maintaining the database beyond the budgetary timeframe for ARPA. So and maybe I heard somebody say it earlier on that we will evaluate because, you know, some of this isn't just one time. It, you know, maybe initial expense is just covered here, but um, these tools will have to be maintained and housed in somebody's department. So I would hope, again, maybe to your point, uh, Supervisor Desmond, that, you know, as we're putting these things in place and certainly seeing their efficacy and their good outcomes, uh, that we don't get caught up and well, the money went away, so we can't do that anymore. Um, we, you know, county's been there and had that discussion innumerable times. And, and I, um, so I, I guess maybe I just turn to, to Ann. Are you looking at that context? Are we going to come through the lens that you know, some of these things we're probably going to mean, you know, if they prove out and do what we want them to do and help us do better, uh, that we're going to, you know, consider them for future funding? Yes, we will absolutely have to do that. As you can see from the projects before you today, not everything is a one-time fund. Right. Some of these things are ongoing expenditures and we will definitely have to address, address that in future budgets post ARPA funding. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? If not, Michelle, it's uh, 8, 10 p.m. You didn't know you were gonna come on so early, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Chair Natoli, board members. Uh, we've got a couple of projects. Um, oh, could you go to slide 19, please? We've got a couple of projects coming out of Child, Family, and Adult Services, the first being academic supports and school readiness. And this project addresses the negative impact of the pandemic on the academic achievement of foster children. As you all know, foster children have historically been behind their non-foster peers in educational outcomes and are less likely to graduate from high school, which impacts longer term outcomes. While the pandemic and resulting school closures impacted all children in our community, we believe it further exacerbated the unique challenges that children and youth in foster care face. These kids who've already experienced the trauma of abuse and neglect, experienced increased isolation, uncertainty, and anxiety brought on by the pandemic, as well as disruptions to normal routines, including visitation with family members. While our team did everything possible to support children, youth, and families during this time, we know that there were challenges with technology, as well as, as, well as helping our kids navigate through the remote learning environment. Of significant importance is the fact that remote learning also did not replace the supportive environment of school campuses, as well as connections with friends, teachers, and other school personnel. So this project will fund services and supports for, for these kids, including um, uh, initial academic assessments to determine where they are, uh, tutoring services, academic reassessments, referrals to community supports, and uh, enrichment activities such as after school programs, um, homework clubs, school, uh, sporting events. This project will also engage and support parents and caretakers. Our hope is that by the end of the project, we will have assessed academic performance of foster children in grades one through eight in five, in five districts that have the highest number of foster children and provide the services and supports needed to help them perform at or above grade level. The total uh, project cost is 1.2 million. Michelle, Next slide. Oh, go before ahead. Before we leave, yeah, this is Don. Um, so, a couple of questions. One is you only look at, you know, we've got nearly full six months remaining in this uh, fiscal year and certainly you know, uh, half of a school year. And you only look at expending $100,000 uh, for the first six months. I don't know, when does the other 1.1 uh, 1 million, you gonna spend all, all in the following year or is this a three or four year project? What is, what, what's the term of this? 
It will go uh, as soon as we can get started because we will have to engage in competitive bid process uh, through the end of ARPA timing, which December of 2025. So you're looking at this being a, <clears throat> roughly a three year uh, plus uh, yeah. timeline. I'm curious, we talk about foster children. What about homeless children uh, that may still be with parents, but are uh, not necessarily in the foster program is, is there some consideration, and maybe there is later in what you're presenting, but uh, I think about uh, kids that, you know, for example, the, the, the families of St. John's, the families that um, we've got, I know, other small organizations that work with, uh, you know, foster families, foster children, but also those kids that are at risk. You look at, you know, Mustard Seed School and some of the other uh, providers of service. So how does this fit in with that? Because, again, you know, the foster is a, you know, a particular segment. And it's got you know thousands of kids uh, that we touch, but what about homeless? You know this. Well, this one addresses uh, uh, primarily foster children. There are a number of existing efforts to help with educational achievement for kids. So we will certainly reach out and partner with other efforts currently taking place, including those that are already in existence for foster children. But also, um, we know that many school districts provide services and supports to uh, homeless children and families in their districts. So, so they would be eligible for, would they be eligible for this funding pot or no? Uh, not for this one. This one's specifically targeting foster children. Um, you know, and, and we'll assess to see, you know, we've been uh, continuing to reduce the number of children in foster care, which is yes. a good thing. So we can also assess as we move forward and, and if there are other opportunity, opportunities to serve other children, we'd be happy to consider that. All right, thanks. Next slide, here. please. Thank you. So this project would fund community-based family support navigators to connect parents and children to critical services such as home visiting, health, mental health, dental services, transportation, and address basic needs with the goal of supporting and strengthening families in geographic locations hit hardest by COVID-19. Navigators will work with families to complete a family needs assessment and determine the extent to which COVID impacted their health, mental health, housing, financial status, and overall resilience. <laughs> Navigators will also use a closed loop platform called uh, a closed loop referral platform called United Us, which will allow them to track families and confirm whether or not they actually ac access and uh, receive the services that we connected them to. They'll use um, other resources and referral services available in Sacramento County, including 211, sacfamilyhelp.com, Help Me Grow, and the county's multidisciplinary home visiting coordinating collaborative. We wanna make sure we're not duplicating services. Uh, child and family serving agencies across our county should see an increase in the number of families reaching out for their services, increased overall participation in everything from home visiting to housing assistance programs, nutritional support, early education programs and, and, and other services. Funding is limited to the three years covered by ARPA, after which it's anticipated that agencies will have reached and connected high-risk families to connect them to safety net services, concrete supports, and, and other areas of need. Total project is uh, just about $3.9 million. And that is the end of uh, my presentation. Okay, questions for questions Michelle? See any hands, Michelle, that you get off easy right now. Stand okay. by. <laughs> Great, happy to provide any additional information. I'm, I'm passing this on to Sylvester, Adal Director of BPS. Okay, Sylvester, you're up. Thank you, Michelle. Um, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Yeah. Sylvester Fadal, Director of um, Personnel Services. Uh, my presentation tonight essentially covers um, the funds to augment human capital support for county COVID-19 vaccination and testing program administration. Uh, while the impact of COVID is very well known, the kinetics of the pandemic is candidly uh, unknown in view of the various 
mutations we've seen over the last few years. Currently, DPS has one staff member who manages the COVID compliance and general administration. This temporary support that will be provided by these funds would help ensure compliance with governmental regulations, increase customer service support to employees, supervisors, managers, and also assist with auditing our records that is required by governmental regulations. We also will be providing support to other department coordinators in the enrollment, disenrollment, and the managing of leaves of absence, reporting, and a variety of other related functions. Over the past uh, few months, uh, we've had an increase in number of uh, requests for support from the departments, and we really haven't been able to meet those demands. So hopefully with the, with the addition of this temporary staff, we should be able to uh, meet those demands and be able to meet the level of uh, compliance required by the government. Uh, we have Cal OSHA emergency um, temporary standard ETLs. We have the CDPH. We have changing governmental regulations that seem to evolve by the day. And there seem to be a variety of areas where compliance is required. So hopefully with this, with this um, fund, we'll be able to uh, not only meet those compliance requirements, but be able to at least uh, place most of our county employees at ease by increased um, support in their efforts to help mitigate the spread and, um, of COVID. I only have one presentation tonight, and, and that essentially wraps up my presentation. OK. Thanks, Sylvester. Any questions of Mr. Padal? Thank you. I believe the next presenter would be Marie Wooden. Okay, Marie Wooden. Marie, you're up. Okay. Um, good evening, Chair Natoli and members of the board. I'm Marie Wooden, Director for the Environmental Management Department. As part of the economic response category, I'll be presenting the retail food permit fee waiver. This project would bring economic aid to the retail food businesses by waiving the annual operating fees from the Environmental Management Department for one year. The amount of $6,820,000 would help approximately 7,161 businesses in Sacramento County. Eligible retail food businesses include restaurants, bars, school cafeteria, cottage food operators, caterers, food banks, mobile food trucks, snack bars, and retail markets up to 15,000 square feet. An automatic fee waiver would be applied to each future invoice when the fee becomes due, providing a credit equal to the fee when the program is implemented. This project will focus on assisting the retail food businesses that have been disproportionately impacted economically by the pandemic and ensure that these businesses maintain the necessary environmental health operating permits critical to safeguarding public health and safety. In response to the local and state COVID-19 health orders, these businesses have been directly impacted by restrictions to their operations while trying to adapt to the many layers of change. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have documented 594 permanently closed retail food facilities. This project would provide much needed economic aid to the owners operating retail food businesses, which are vital to Sacramento County communities and the economy. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Marie. Uh, we have questions about this um, from board members. I don't see any hands. Uh, Marie, what's the average? Again, maybe that's tough to know because you have different categories, but what would be the average benefit to one of our 7,000 plus uh, permittees? Well, a restaurant fee typically runs about $1,600 a year. So they would benefit that much uh, oh. regarding a, a fee waiver. So just real quickly to you show the FYI, or FY 2021-22 is being 2.1 million. And then uh, overall, I guess the other 4.7 or 4.6 something would be in the following year. So this would go from what, January to this January of 22, all the way through when? Through January 23 or June of 23, when would it? It would go for, it depends on when the program would be implemented. So for instance, if we 
received the funds in March of this fiscal year, it would go through March the next fiscal year. So each retail food facility gets one bill, one invoice per year. So we would just cycle through for a year, whatever the program started. And if you had a business that had a particular hardship, but what, you know, say that they were supposed to pay next month and they were having a hardship, might not be around. I mean, 600 bucks might be a difference between them being making another month and getting there till next year or not. So are you going to have some ability to kind of sort that out or is it just um, basically whenever you get the money, you'll start to, from that period going forward? That's what we plan to do. Whenever we receive the money, it would be, that's when they receive their bill. So it's, it's that time period. We have to apply it to the present fee that comes due. But if the board were to approve this tonight, you're only in the second week of January. So you really haven't got much into the fiscal, to even to the calendar year. Correct. And the money's already on deposit with the county. So I'm just curious if we could, I, you know, I think some of these folks are going to need it sooner rather than they are a year from now. Um, yeah, it, it's whenever we can implement the program, whenever they transfer the funds to our department, then we can begin. So I, I would just note, this is more for Marie, maybe for, for Ann or whoever, but, um, you know, it seems if, if we're looking for immediate uh, impact rather than March, we've got the money on deposit. Obviously, there's some floating uh, revenues within the departmental framework. It would seem to me, you know, if the board were to approve this tonight, that the money is available. So, and, you know, it's a matter of transferring to the department. You could even go back a week or two. I mean, we're only, you know, January 11th, maybe we January 12th when we're done here. But um, so I guess, Ann, I would just ask, it might make sense rather than have this, you know, it's going to span a year, but let's start it out right at the beginning of this of this calendar year. Why not? Make it from January to January versus March to March. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's feasible or not, but. I don't know if you're on mute, Ann. I don't know. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. I said, I don't know if that's feasible or not, but I will commit to you that we will look into that. But we do have to pick a date, um, <clears throat> but we can look at. Okay. I, I just think earlier implementation. Yeah, and if we have the money and there's sure. enough float within the department for a few weeks or whatever. So, okay, I guess I'd like to take a look at that. But anyway, all right. And if, in, in, as I'm thinking through this a little more, um, if we, if you do approve this today, uh, we would likely, Lisa might want to weigh in, but I, we would likely need retroactive approval if we were going to go uh, prior to today's date. Lisa, I, I mean, we go, go, go back just 10 days, basically. Right. Well, I mean, the board can direct staff that um, anything paid by X date can either be refunded or um, credited for the next year, however you want to do it. I don't have an issue. There's nothing legally wrong with a retroactive situation. It just the board has to approve it or direct staff. Right. Yep. I guess I just my, my colleagues, any thoughts about that? Again, you know, that was just my thinking is that we implement this as soon as possible. And if we're if we're going to go forward with it and that you know, January of 2022 is a whole lot different than January 2023. So Phil, you get your hand up. No, I'd, I'd, I'd be very supportive of that. I think it makes a lot of sense. Anybody else? I concur, absolutely. All right. Very good. I would just ask from an operational perspective or situation if Marie and your staff can refund people that have already paid. For instance, if we do make it retroactive to January, first or whatever the board decides um, if there's any operational concerns with that. Um, I'd have to discuss that with my finance manager, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it doesn't seem unfeasible because it's just a short time period. Right. Okay. All right, well, I'll take that as some general direction for at least from consensus amongst the board members have spoken out. So if we can do that, I think, uh, again, the earlier relief, the better, and appreciate the, you know, I know this could probably be a little bit of scrambling on the administrative side, but um, I think it uh, will be greatly appreciated. All righty. Anything else on that one? If not, Marie, did you have any other? Oh, 
sorry. Um, no, I don't have any anything else. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Bree. Who's who's following you? That would be me. That would sorry. be you. Okay. Troy, you didn't get an introduction, so it's going to be you. Good evening, it's Mr. Givens. Troy Givens, uh, director for the Department of Economic Development. Uh, thank you, Marie. Marie introduced the first item of eight in the economic response component of our funding mechanisms. Uh, if we could get the next slide, please. Thank you. So the first component of uh, this next tranche, uh, which is item two in ours, uh, we have uh, projects, an amount of $325,000. The project will provide direct grants in the amount of $25,000 each to 13 chambers of commerce for operations dedicated to supporting and advocating for local business recovery and success in the unincorporated area. This is really a hybrid, uh, Supervisor Cerna, to your point. We have several chambers that are countywide that we're supporting with this effort, as well as geographic, uh, uh, geographic chambers within the unincorporated area. This is really in recognition of the critical services that the chambers provide and can be used for business support, staffing, marketing, and outreach for COVID-related needs, supply needs, and other federally qualifying uses. Boy, right, question for you. Um, yes. So the 13 chambers, I don't have a list, and so I'm not, but for example, I'll, I'll give you two examples, maybe three, but um, you know, in the city of Ialton, you have Ialton Chamber of Commerce, but it's not just in the city. There are marinas and other businesses that are outside. And in fact, Ialton is getting ARPA money. So I wanted to ask about that later this evening. But um, in the Gall Chamber of Commerce, yes, it you know has probably the primary membership in the city of Galt, but there are businesses in the Herald and outlying west of Galt that are part of that, uh, small businesses. And even though, you know, I think about Elk Grove, uh, not dissimilar, maybe Ranch Cordova too, where there are businesses that lie in the unincorporated area. So are all those chambers on your list or are they all excluded? So as I had mentioned earlier, it was a, a, a hybrid. We had the methodology of, of focusing on the geographic areas that were predominantly served by the unincorporated area. So the geography base were Carmichael Chamber, Fair Oaks Chamber, the Greater Arden Chamber, the North Sacramento Chamber, the Orangevale Chamber, and the Rio Linda Alberta Chamber. It also includes uh, constituent specific groups as the Greater Sacramento Vietnamese American Chamber, the Sacramento Asian Pacific Chamber, the Sacramento Black Chamber, the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber, the Sacramento Metro Chamber, the Sacramento Rainbow Chamber, and the Slavic American Chamber as well. So that would be 13 out of the total 23 chambers. Uh, Supervisor Natoli, the two you mentioned were not on that list because of the primary geography that they serve. Uh, if you opted to include all 23 based on this amount of funding, it would drop each uh, allocation by about $10,800. So if we could fund all 23 at $14,130 a piece uh, based on your, uh, if I understand your potential proposal and what, uh, based on uh, kind of surmising Supervisor Cerna's uh, uh, earlier comments about addressing both city and county related P bids and chambers, uh, that would be 23 at 14,130 a piece. Well, you know, and maybe a reverse of that would be that, again, you've got these, you had general allocations for the, you know, for the um, categories here, and you're working within that. But you know, I guess one of the things I would look at, assuming that you know, they met the criteria would be, you would provide $25,000 to those chambers as well. Because again, or, you know, whether it was Galt or Ialton or uh, Elk Grove or Ranch Cordova, or I guess there's still um, another six, five or six that, you know, someone could, could rattle off for me as well. Um, that if they're, you know, as long as they meet the criteria, because, you know, they're not exclusively just serving the incorporated areas that they may be, you know, based in. And, you know, I, I can tell you for a fact, I know the couple that I mentioned uh, have businesses, small businesses that are, you know, in the unincorporated areas, I would, you know, be willing to, you know, you know, bet on that uh, strongly that they do and, and, uh, and, you know, and, but have a network again, assuming they can meet the criteria. So I just raised that because again, I think this is a good idea. I think it's important. And, uh, 
you know, the small business supporting programs, but, you know, just to call out the 13 and leave out 10, um, even well, and we have, for instance, those located in the city of Sacramento, and we know that the city is going forward on their with their yeah. funding potentially on the 25th, uh, and we expect our partners and the the cities to be providing some ARPA options for those uh, entities as well. We want to make sure we're coordinated and perhaps not overlapping, but that may or may not be a policy consideration for your board. Well, again, I would be interested in us. Taking a look at those, the other again, I didn't know the list until you just read it, so uh, I probably should have asked in my briefing yesterday. But I, I think it's worthwhile parsing this a little more. And again, I would certainly argue from the standpoint of Ialton, where they got no ARPA money, so they're not getting any money from the city. Uh, and we have businesses that are clearly in the delta, up and down the delta, uh, that are part of that chamber. And uh, and so I think you know, looking at the allocation increase to the pot of money here, commensurate if we add six or seven more back in, you know, rather than cutting the allocation for those that were already contemplated, just to add this amount. So that would be my thought. Uh, Supervisor uh, Desmond, I think, and then Supervisor Cerno looks like have a hand up. Thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Tola, or Chair Natoli. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, it requires some parsing. I, I'm, I'm, I am always really sensitive to if we lowered the allocation to each of the chambers in yeah. the unincorporated area, yet we find out the ones that are and incorporated cities got both this allocation and an allocation from their city, right? I mean, that's they're, they're at a disadvantage already at times being in the unincorporated area. But like with Ialton, you're right, that's a different story because they're not getting an ARPA allocation. They don't have an opportunity. So, you know, I, I, I'd be willing to have that discussion as well to uh, to maybe up the amount uh, totally and, and, and parse it out a little more, like you say. Thanks, Mitch. Anybody else? So Troy, just to, uh, you're going to keep moving through this. Would you be able to then determine that? I guess you could, you know, you're in contact with those chambers to see if they got money from their respective cities, you know, like Elk Grove or Rancho Cordova, Folsom, obviously Citrus Heights, they all have, uh, um, you know, their own city governments. But uh, uh, I'd be, you know, curious to look at those chambers and see if, again, if they're serving you know, maybe it's and maybe it's a it's an apportioned amount too. Maybe they got some already, but they're still serving, you know, portions of unincorporated area, you know, business communities. Uh, you know, whether it be in rural or suburban or outlying areas. Um, again, without giving you too much work on top of what you're already doing here, uh, and I don't know how twenty five thousand dollars was arrived at as to be the right number. So I mean, it was done in concert with the rest of the uh, allocations that were proposed. Uh, part of the methodology was, again, we have some that are focused on the unincorporated area and some of these have uh, impacts countywide, like the EMD component of this on the retail food side, obviously those restaurants and uh, other food service uh, entities are located within the entirety of the county. So that includes all of our incorporated areas as well. It, it's a benefit to uh, businesses, uh, those retail food establishments countywide minus the exceptions that Marie had uh, identified. Uh, some of these that we have, in addition to this, we'll, we'll cover an arts component here in the, uh, the arts area, which would be countywide as well. And then we have some that are more specific to the county's unincorporated geography as it's proposed now. I, uh, if I'm understanding your concerns, you have stated that you, have, you would like to potentially look at a different methodology that would raise up all of these uh, to an equal amount, it would require some shuffling of some of the potential allocations here tonight. Well, let me be clear. I wasn't suggesting you cut anybody's allocation. No, uh, not, I, I, I don't, yeah. I, I didn't perhaps okay. communicate that correctly. So what it, what it would do is require, a, it would require a shuffling of this or we would have to work with Amanda's office to see if there are additional funds out of the the percentages that you had allocated in the previous meetings. And those percentages, I would assume are targets. If, if you added a couple hundred thousand dollars to the pot here on, on the order of magnitude of a total of $150 million and we do it for economic piece, I mean, they're kind of splitting hairs here a little bit. I mean, it's significant dollars to whoever might be the recipient here. And that, you know, that's just a board decision obviously, but I mean, if we're so married to those percentages that if we're having this conversation that 
looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars that would go to another, you know, half a dozen chambers of commerce if that were justifiable, that seems a little bit. Um, I'm not suggesting that we don't have the ability to do no. that. I think we would just need to understand what your direction is on that. Okay. So I don't know if, if again, I don't want to bog down a presentation. I know the hour is late, but if before we conclude tonight, you know, my colleagues, uh, I heard Supervisor Desmond weigh in if others have any thoughts on this, but so that you could have some direction, Troy, going back on this, uh, through you and the county executive, obviously. Uh, but I, I think I made my point, and I'd like to have us take a closer look at uh, those that weren't included in this uh, funding recommendation. And I'm not looking at cutting anybody's allocation here or taking anybody off of this list. I'm just looking at adding to it potentially. So, understood. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Supervisor Natoli, could I yeah. uh, make a comment? Sure. Um, I think what Troy is also getting at is, you know, of the 19.97, excuse me, 19.795 million dollars that was allocated to this um, economic recovery out of this tranche of money, with the programs that Troy is going to be presenting for to you today, there's 51,176 dollars remaining out of that allocation. So we can absolutely do what the board wishes, but the because we do have these um, funding allocations that the board approved, we would have to reallocate from one of the other strategic areas to, to cover this. And we can absolutely do that, but it, it will be necessary to do that. Okay. Well, and maybe I can make this easy for everybody involved then. If, if we get down to, and there are chambers that are in, in large part, you know, serving areas that are in District 5, you can take it out of, you know, after you spend the 51000 if that goes into the pot here, uh, I will commit to do that, but get it as a part of this so it doesn't get delayed. So I'd be happy to do that. I mean, we're, I'm talking about a very limited number, and I think, again, if we can make the, you know, justifiable uh, determination, uh, then I'm fine with that. That would help, you know, the, the problem you decided. I have no problem with that. So, okay. Understood. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Troy, go ahead. You're on mute, Troy. I apologize. Next slide, please. So this component is a projected total project cost of $250,000, all to be proposed from ARPA. This project will provide direct grants in the amount of $50,000 to the five PBIDs located in the unincorporated county. It was developed under the same methodology that we had just talked about before. Uh, based on our recent assessments, those county PBIDs support uh, 1,870 businesses and about 803 property owners. Uh, this is in recognition of both the change in work and the volume of work related to COVID-19, uh, including property maintenance for businesses that had been closed during portions of time of the pandemic, uh, uh, increased security needs, uh, inability to raise funds, uh, and to assist businesses and property owners with the pandemic uh, as it related to health orders and the changing health orders and their earlier parts of the pandemic process. Um, businesses can use this for, uh, our PBIDs can use this for business support, for staffing on COVID related items, marketing and outreach again, supplies and other federally qualified uses. Now, this uh, particular piece uh, along, again, I, I had mentioned the same methodology. So, uh, uh, we had five that are located in the unincorporated area. It includes the 80 Watt District, the Antelope Business District, Carmichael Improvement District, Florin Road Partnership, and the Fulton Avenue Association. Um, there are 18 overall PBIDs uh, based on anticipating perhaps some of your questions as it relates to some that are located completely within incorporated cities within the county. Um, but again, our methodology was they would be coordinating with their uh, economic development partners within those cities and looking at uh, the potential of tapping into ARPA funds related to funneling through those cities and their economic development departments. And because our timing is different when they're going to their various jurisdictions and their bodies for approval, we don't have a full slate of who's going to be receiving funds and who's not going to be receiving funds. President Kennedy, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is similar questions as you've been peppered with already. Yes. Uh, so, so at least three of the P bids that are in District Two, for example, are in the city and the county. 
So how, how does that work? That's correct. So the, the same methodology that I had described earlier about the preponderance of the properties and businesses, if they were within the city and it was uh, administered by the city, we didn't include it in this list. If they were administered by the county and the majority of their properties were in the county, then we included it on this list. What do you, what do you mean by administered by the city or by the county? So if the taxes were collected and administered through okay. the, the city jurisdiction, then we left it off this list for consideration and would be coordinating with the cities and seeing that and they would be moving through the process in and allocating potentially ARPA funds to that jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Any other questions that were at this point? Okay, all right, Troy, continue. Thank you. If I could get the next slide, please. So this particular project is a partnership with the city of Sacramento for arts and nonprofit cultural grants. Uh, this is a $2.2 million total cost, budgeting about 2.1 million of that in fiscal year 21-22. This is to provide direct grants in the range of $5,000 to $100,000 to up to 300 arts and nonprofit cultural organizations throughout Sacramento County that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. So this is really a, a situation recognizing that we've had a number of arts and cultural groups that have been impacted with uh, the inability to provide programming, the inability to open, uh, they had shuttered venues, and that has uh, been a significant impact to this segment of the economy. So uh, in partnership with the city, and the city will be putting in a matching amount of funds, we would be providing these funds through a, a, a grant process that would be administered through the city uh, countywide, including all the incorporated cities. Uh, arts groups would be eligible to apply for these funds. Um, and again, we would be partnering uh, with the city of Sacramento on this particular component. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes, uh, Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor, oh, Supervisor Desmond and Supervisor Kennedy, I'm sorry. That's what I got to order our hands. Is that, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Troy. No, I, this, is, this is great to support these organizations. I just, I, in the detail, I saw there that it's going to be a contract with the city of Sacramento's Arts Council, I guess, to administer this. Is that, That's correct. Is that accurate? You would be establishing a panel that would have county representation as well uh, to review proposals. And, and okay. uh, again, this would be countywide. So, county -wide. Be so and the city's uh, uh, putting matching the, the, the funds, I think you said. What about the That's other correct. cities that are going to We've have approached other cities and, and have not been successful in securing funds up to this point. So how do we handle something like that? I mean, are, are we going to, are we going to, are the city of Sacramento and the county going to team up to fund arts organizations and other incorporated cities who elected not to contribute towards this effort? As the proposal stands now, they're not precluded from participating, but as it stands now, and as we stand up the program, we would certainly re-engage with them and invite them to participate and would welcome their participation. But as it stands now, uh, it's just the city and the county uh, looking at this countywide effort. No, I get that. But I'm saying, you know, so if, if an, art, an arts organization in Citrus Heights uh, applies for this, they'd still be eligible for the grant, even though their city elected not to participate. That's correct, as it's proposed now. Well, I'm not sure that seems fair. <laughs> If it's being funded by the city and the county, the city of Sacramento and the county, I don't know. I don't know what my colleagues think, but because they they have the ability to do that with their ARPA allocation if they elect to do it, is that right? They would. That's correct. Okay. We have a, any other questions, Rich? I think you, you, your question you put forward though is you know is that fair? I, I think some of this has historical background with a cultural awards program that used to be the city and county, but anybody was eligible in the county. We kind of got a divorce on the Arts Commission with the uh, city a couple of years ago. We really don't have any parallel organization that rests in economic development. And we now piggyback with them to do the cultural grants program, uh, which are eligible uh, organizations throughout the county and city. Uh, we put money into that through our TOT. So I don't know if this is- uh, That's correct. Similar. So that may be what, how we get to this point, but 
fair question. So, okay, so yeah, I, I, would, I don't see the I don't see the city or city of Citrus Heights being willing to you know fund an arts organization in the unincorporated county. You know, <laughs> that's just how I look at it. I know we have this city county tension all the time, and, and this certainly it's on it's on a stark display in this in this conversation. All right, thank you, Chair. That's all we have. Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor Frost. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for this particular one, and I, I thank you for doing this, um, did, did you give any consideration to utilizing or going through Friends of the Arts, which is a nonprofit countywide, um, but already has those relationships? As far as engagement with the other jurisdictions, or I'm not I'm not sure I understand that. Well, I mean, we're, just we're kind of letting, I mean, we're, we're having, the city's going to manage this for the most part, right? That's correct. We'll have participation. I, mean, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my my thought was and just was that Friends of the Arts would be a countywide. Um, granted, a lot of their reach is in the city, just because the nature of the arts. But um, uh, would, would, in, instead of going through the city, I was asking, did you give any thought to going through Friends of the Arts? Now, this was a partnership that we developed in concert with the city, but we can engage and reach out to that group as well. Okay, I'll give you the contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, uh, Sue. Well, I was just gonna say, um, for many years we had, you know, been working in partnership with the county and the city on arts, on the arts, which serviced the entire county and that was part of the conversation like Folsom has the Harris Center and, and there's all these wonderful um there's other areas outside Sac City and I think Sac City knows that they've met they've met and extended um, themselves to be a part of you know growing the arts in the um in the in the entire county but I'm assuming this is going to be based on the quality of the projects and who it serves, you know, something that service serves as, you know, serves the county as a yes, whole. Yes, I, I would uh, describe it that it will be a competitive process and um, there will be, um, we suspect we will be oversubscribed. So we'll be working on an equitable process that would allow us to, to reach as many of these organizations as possible. Thank you, Troy. So is the to total point uh, pot is 4.4 million? That That's what you correct. said? The city will be matching our contribution, correct? That's how you get to 300 potential parts. And That's correct. That's the target. We'll, we'll have a better sense of once it's once the actual applications hit the street and so forth. But I'm guessing with the number of organizations that we have, that there's the potential that we will be oversubscribed. All right, well, some good good comments here. Um, Supervisor Kennedy, Supervisor Desmond as well. Okay, let's keep moving then. Thank you. Uh, if we can get the next slide, please. So this particular project is a small business and nonprofit grant. It's total project cost of $7.5 million. Uh, this is uh, in order to provide direct grants of $5,000 to 1,500 <clears throat> small businesses and nonprofit organizations in the unincorporated Sacramento County that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. This would be eligible for supporting payroll costs, costs to retain employees, mortgage, rent, utilities, other operating costs that are consistent with the uh, consistent with with the federal requirements. This is, as we all know, small businesses have experienced some of the most significant challenges due to the pandemic, including periods of shutdown, declines in revenue, increased costs and workforce challenges. And this is to help bridge that until they're in recovery mode and hopefully in full recovery mode as we advance through the pandemic and hopefully get out of triage mode and into recovery mode. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. You just received notice from the state with almost $2 million in micro grant monies. 
That's how does right. that, so if somebody got qualified for that money, they couldn't qualify for this? No, they would not be mutually exclusive. They would not. To potentially qualify for this. The micro grant component piece uh, is not part of this program. It is separate state monies. It is five, or five employees or fewer, $50,000 in revenue or less. So it's a very uh, niche component of that. And we'll be providing about 700 of those grants countywide through uh, a process as well that the state will require us to run concurrently to this process because we can't mix and match the monies. It would seem to me that it would make sense. We talked about helping chambers out, but the chambers are part of that network that, you know, and you've got some, you know, some of the larger chamber uh, efforts uh, on your succeeding pages here, but it seems to make sense that you would take that micro grant and this program and work with those chambers of commerce, not necessarily task them because you're going to give them $25,000 to assist them, but there are natural partners in this. They have contact with those small business people uh, as part of their, their chamber network. If nothing else, they have a, probably a better reach than we have. Uh, I would agree with your assessment, and that's exactly what we've done. In this process, the state requirement, to set aside the ARPA for a second, the small business component of that requires us to have three partnerships, including we have uh, the Metro Chamber, the SAC IEDC, and one additional partner through the Cal Hispanic Chamber. So we have those requirements uh, as part of that grant program. Uh, they have the outreach and competitive piece of that. Uh, we also have CalCap included as our fourth partner on the, the state small, the micro business component of that. As you'll see in the next couple of slides here, to your point, Supervisor Natoli, the funds that we're recommending to uh, be granted to the Sacramento IEDC and to the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber will be used as partnership support to go out and do the outreach that you're just describing and make sure that we can utilize those networks and help get a broad reach into uh, this program in addition to providing technical assistance and other things for some other potential funding sources and other things that we'll be contracting with those partners for to provide that type of additional support as well. So it's not only to feed businesses, particularly in, in some of our most impacted communities, uh, into this program where we'll be granting seven, we're proposing to grant $7.5 million out, but it will be identifying other needs that they may have and providing additional assistance as well. So we will be utilizing, it, the, that is the intent, is to utilize those networks and those organizations that have specialized in this type of work for quite some time. Okay, very good. Hey, see no other hands, let's continue. Thank you. So uh, as I was saying, if we could get the next slide, please. In order for the county to successfully implement these and the proposed grant projects, staff recommends that we partner with these organizations that we're, that we're just outlining. So it was a, a very good timely transition <coughs> to Resident Atoli, appreciate that. Um, the first is a component for the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. As we were mentioning, this will be a, a $1.3 million contract in total. Uh, 660,000 of this is proposed to come from ARPA. The remainder will come from other funding sources. But this is really, uh, as I discussed earlier, small business has experienced some of the most significant challenges. This, the SAC Metro Chamber and the other partners we're gonna talk about here in a minute have extensive support uh, experience supporting the county's business community and an existing team of skilled staff who have been providing technical assistance and training to businesses in need since the beginning of the pandemic. So we want to leverage those resources and that expertise. Uh, they also have a broad network of nonprofits and community partners and a wide range of businesses that are members uh, within those organizations. And we view them as an invaluable asset to supporting our community de development at this point in time. Uh, so areas of focus would be business assistance, one-on-one -on -one counseling, county program outreach, as you talked about earlier, marketing and communication support, in-language services, workshops, uh, a variety of different things to help not only triage, but advance to recovery, as I've mentioned. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't see any questions. The next... Uh, is the uh, funding, if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. 
This is for the Sacramento Inclusive Economic Development Collaboration. Uh, this is a, a, a coalition of entities that include uh, a, a number of different chambers uh, that would, it's 15 community-based organizations with extensive business support and experience that would receive a $1.84 million contract. Uh, this is to fund operations dedicated to providing assistance, counseling, again, in language support services, uh, county programs and outreach for other business services that have all been negatively impacted by COVID. This is within our region. The SAC IEDC has uh, expertise and specializes in reaching uh, some of our hardest hit communities and our underserved communities. We would be leveraging those resources and leveraging those uh, leveraging those networks to help make ensure that we get these businesses into this program and eligible for these potential grant funds as well as the other services that I had outlined earlier. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? See any, Troy? Thank you. Can I, if I could get the next slide, please. And then this is the Business Environmental Resource Center, which I believe most of you are familiar with. Uh, this target population is to serve small businesses and nonprofits as well. It's a total funding cost of $200,000. Uh, this is really funding dedicated services to provide counseling, county program outreach, as we had mentioned before. And we host a, a large number, a series of webinars uh, that outreach to a variety of different um, business sectors within the county, um, un the unincorporated countywide actually. So the restaurant association, other specific business industries to not only continue to update staff and uh, businesses as to the changing environment as it relates to the public health orders and all, but also changing environments as it relates to the regulations and funding opportunities to help get them in to a um, more a ready position to hopefully compete for these funds. And I'm happy to answer any questions as it relates to this as well. Okay. Questions? So just one or two closing remarks. This would really provide, uh, before I'll hand it off to Amanda, uh, direct financial to relief for over 9,000 small businesses and nonprofit organizations if we're uh, specific to the allocations here. So uh, again, if there are any overall questions, I think we've heard your feedback on the earlier slides. Um, and if with that, I'll hand it off to Amanda. Thanks, Troy. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Um, so, so just uh, in terms of next steps in our ARPA process, um, we will continue to roll out projects throughout 2022. And um, based on the timing, these projects may be grouped or may come forward individually. Uh, also, the county's website will continue to provide information on the county's ARPA efforts, um, including quarterly reports to the, to the U.S. Treasury. So our first of those um, will be due on January 31st. Um, and in coordination with the quarterly reporting to Treasury, we also intend to provide regular reports to the board for ARPA project status updates. Um, and you know, based on the projects that have been brought forward today, um, we expect that, that probably um, the you know the first um, meaningful reporting period would be the reporting period ending June thirtieth of uh, this year. And then finally, um, we will be um, continuing to plan for and develop recommendations for the second phase of ARPA funding. So that second tranche that we do expect to receive in May of this year of another approximately $150 million. Um, I did want to note here, I think it's important that um, the U.S. Treasury released the final rule for the use of ARPA state and local fiscal recovery funds just last week. Um, and it will really be important for us to understand um, you know, some of the new guidance, including additional flexibility um, that is included in that final rule. Um, looks like there might be a question before I move yeah, on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to get the formula. I just, Amanda, on that, it would be yes. helpful once you get the, 
you know, the interpretation, I think, to circulate that to board members, please, as to what that final rule, how you, um, you know, will apply that, uh, you know, may be technical in some sense, but I think make it understandable for us so we can explain to folks as to, you know, if there are questions that come up regarding some of the things we've talked about this evening or, you know, as you bring future projects, it would be useful to know what flexibility, if not, um, you know, is included in that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. A uh, couple things. One is, and, um, this might go back to Troy, but I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm, it's, it's germinating in my head about the approach we're taking with the P-bids. Um, just again, because, you know, we have three P-bids that we're discounting in District 2 because they have city and county. And um, so I, that, that's a concern to me. Um, uh, also, we, we've received some proposals in the past for uh, surrounding food insecurity. Are we still considering uh, um, some of those proposals uh, to date? I was waiting for somebody so to chime in. Uh, I'll jump in and Bruce, you can add to it. Um, yeah, there you go. Sorry, we Ann. are not. We are not considering food uh, insecurity proposals today. We are, in fact, considering them, but the ones before you today uh, come from the community survey and really trying to focus on the highest priorities as identified by the community. Uh, but we will be considering uh, food insecurity proposals. Okay, that's that's what I meant. I didn't mean today. I mean, but it, it is okay. still in the hopper. Yeah, Supervisor, we have yes. a couple that we have a couple that have come in. Okay. That we're actively looking at uh, for bringing forward in the future. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gavis, I concur with you. That was one of the questions I had too about food security and just some of the various proposals that are out there. And uh, I would just offer one other suggestion that this regular reports with, with the, the um, 25 million that's been set aside uh, in the first tranche for, uh, you know, guided projects in <clears throat> various districts. I think it would be important to have at some juncture a status report on that as we're working through those. So, you know, again, we're gonna be working with individual supervisors, maybe RFP processes and so forth. But I think that's an important component and I wouldn't wanna lose track of that. And again, certainly recognizing um, uh, the work that's gonna go into, uh, you know, the various aspects of meeting the criteria that we've outlined, but also seeing how that plays out in other parts of the, you know, in the county itself. So, yeah, and I think it would be helpful to, at some juncture to have, you know, an update on that as well. So people know, um, you know, in full disclosure, how we're using those dollars, so. Well, we, thank you. And we will not only be updating the board, but we do have to bring all projects to the full board for approval. So we'll be doing that as well. Okay, very good. Um, yes. what, go ahead, Amanda. I was, just, I was just gonna add to that, that yes, I mean, I, I think we would anticipate reporting for those projects along with all of the other projects. So we can certainly identify, you know, the, the allocation category that they're related to, but we would report them just as we would any other. Okay, and if there are actionable items, again, as I, you know, I certainly have been working with staff already on some of those that we're looking at uh, um, in district five. So um, I'm glad to see, you know, I'd be glad to see them show up on the agenda so people would know exactly what we're working on. Um, one last thing, what about training for vendors and contractors and so forth? Because again, you know, we've got all of the outline we heard here this evening and working with county departments, agencies, we'll have partners. Who's going to be providing that technical assistance so that, and you know, whether they be other public agencies, nonprofit partners, not for profits, um, who's going to be responsible for making sure that people get a clear understanding besides handing them the rules and say, this is what you have to follow. So, so your question relates to training sub-recipients and other recipients of funding on the use of the funding? Yeah. Yes. So um, so we did anticipate, you know, having some, um, some staff um, added within the Department of Finance that can assist with developing those sorts of programs. Um, I think that the model that we're sort of rolling out um, for for these projects, there's a there's a department, you know, primary department associated with each project. So I think the departments will have a role, and some already have this role with with um, you know 
existing federal funding that they have will have a role in providing that training. But I think overall, from a, a county perspective, we want to make sure that we're providing those resources um, for departments that may not have them. Um, and sort of looking at that and starting that process right now, I think we would see that as being, you know, an administrative cost associated with um, implementing ARPA, and we may have some additional recommendations coming forward with regard to that. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, do I trust we have some folks that have called in and waited for hours? Uh, I do have just one last slide. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> and then I will conclude my presentation. Yeah. Um, and so, and th so this this slide is really just showing the uh, recommended actions associated with this item. Um, I'm not going to read them all out, but but I, there is a correction to the third recommendation that I would like to read. Um, so that should read approve the attached salary resolution amendment, including an amendment to the Sacramento County Conflict of Interest Code, adding one FTE limited term administrative services officer two position with disclosure categories A, B, C, D, and E in the Office of Economic Development. And that just relates to the, the necessary um, disclosure categories uh, to comply with the Political Reform Act. So I wanted to add, read that correction. Um, and Thank with that, um, I, my presentation is over. I'm happy to take any additional questions. I don't see any additional questions, so let's flow, go to you. And do we have uh, folks uh, in the queue? We do have a couple of callers, and I will okay. ask uh, Lydia to transfer those calls, please. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, supervisors. This is Clay Nutting with Family Meal. Hi, Happy to see some ARPA funding expenditures. I know there are many worthy projects and urgent needs. I appreciate that programs like ours that address food insecurity may be in consideration for future funding, but I wanted to underline the urgency of our efforts. As you know, the restaurant industry has been one of the hardest hit over the last two years, and unfortunately, the hits keep on coming. Family Meal has submitted a proposal to the county that not only helps restaurants save jobs and stay open, but also supports local farmers and purveyors while feeding the most vulnerable people in our community. We're not looking for a handout. This is an investment in small business and addressing food insecurity. It's clear that our initiative is aligned with two of the three strategic investment categories of phase one, health and economic response. Family Meal has 20 plus diverse restaurant partners with businesses in every single supervisor district that are ready to cook for people in need as soon as tomorrow. These restaurants are vetted, experienced in feeding programs. We have transportation, insurance, standard operating procedures. We are ready to go. Our program is scalable the more resources we can secure, the more people we can feed, and the more businesses we can save. The need is urgent. People are desperately hungry and businesses are suffering. Pushing this out any further would cause great hardship to many in the middle of a pandemic. The surge is wreaking havoc on the restaurant industry, our hospital systems, and affecting our most vulnerable citizens. An investment in family meal to feed our community is not only prudent, but imperative. I'm respectfully asking the county to reconsider funding our program in phase one. Thank you, Clay. Appreciate your, your uh, Thank you for your honor. Okay, can you send the next caller, please? Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, um, uh, Chair Ntoli and supervisors. This is Brenda Ruiz from the Sacramento Food Policy Council. Um, I want to ditto uh, comments from Clay. Thank you, Clay, for chiming in the importance of food security. Um, at the end of October, there was a letter uh, of by more than 70 organizations and individuals that, you know, uh, really uh, asked 
for there to be equity across all program areas. Um, included in that letter uh, of asks was also uh, funding to advance equitable food security to build a sustainable, resilient food system. And a resilient food system would support local farms, BIPOC food businesses, garden nutrition and culinary education for youth and families, community gardens, nutritional support for families and seniors in need, advanced strategies to increase fresh foods availability, such as new farmers markets and increased use of CalFresh, and implementation of county policies EJ12 through EJ15 through funded partnerships with BIPOC and BIPOC serving CBOs. We are concerned, um, dismayed, and disappointed that the food security and components that would uh, support a resilient comeback for those that grow, prepare, um, and serve food um, in a sustainable way for future generations is not included in this first uh, round, um, and I'm encouraged that there's a promise uh, in the future, but um, it's, again, a promise, and we'll see what happens. There's also, you know, from some of the comments um, that I've heard this evening, uh, you know, supervisors have been actively meeting with community members and community members with supervisors, and so you know, if there is an RFA process or if there is, is an RFP process, if there is a pathway by which uh, uh, food security advocates and sustainable farming and resilient regenerative farming, um, climate smart agriculture and equity in food security uh, organizations and individuals and business should be taking, let us know what that is because from what I heard today, it's, you know, who you know the sausage making of what it is to, to have access to dollars. If supervisors are speaking to projects, then, um, you know, I, I'm concerned that on the equity end, those that are not connected in these traditional ways of, 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 you know, what it is to play politics and get access to dollars are being left out of the system. And when a grant is announced, then it's, you know, the gladiator death match of everyone trying to, you know, and, you know, get a couple thousand dollars here and there. So it just, um, I'm encouraged that there will be allocations in the future, but today, you know, the food system is left unfunded. Um, and we hope to activate uh, the food system to be more vocal and more proactive um, in reaching out to you and as well as the various offices reaching out to us. Um, so that we can be more transparent about these conversations and access to important dollars that are needed in neighborhoods and, and for farmers and the organizations that um, support, um, support them and uh, for not only for food security, but also for regenerative climate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda, for your comments. The other callers? Okay, uh, and then do we have one more caller to transfer? Yeah, this is our last caller. Okay. Hi, caller, please start with your comments and you have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Mike Jasky, representing Homelessness and Housing Community with Insact Act. I'm a resident of District 3. Today I'm only addressing six housing and homeless projects proposed by staff on pages five and six of the board letter. Some general items first. SAC Act is concerned that the projects proposed for funding generally lead to multi-year ongoing expenditures rather than one-time investments that will pay off in the years to come. For those projects with multi-million dollar funding levels, which are projects one and two, there are only quite terse descriptions which provide much less detail than would commonly be the case for projects coming to the board for approval. It's really unclear what precisely will be done with the funding of the two big 10 and $5 million projects. Supervisor Cerna's questions about uh, some of these projects and then the other uh, supervisors that joined in show there's a lot of ambiguities about what's really going to happen. 
as the county, now let me turn to some specific uh, concerns. As the county implements Cal AIM and becomes an ECM and community support provider for Medi Cal insurers, some of the expenditures on landlord engagement and rehousing appear to be precisely what Medi Cal insurers are supposed to pay for and be reimbursed from the state. The county needs to increase the total revenue flow into the county via state reimbursements of Medi Cal insurers and not use its own ARPA funds for something the state will pay for. The Sacramento County Social Health Connect seems like a good idea, but the basis for assigning 50% of its costs to the housing and homeless ARPA budget seems dubious. There are plenty of housing projects that need the funding that would be drawn down by subsidizing this health effort using the housing and homeless budget. On a positive note, we're glad to see the foreshadowing of housing and shelter projects that page six of the board letter says are coming up in the future. So in summary, SACVAC proposes that the two largest program project proposals under the homeless categories, numbers one and two, be deferred pending further information from county staff that actually explains how these monies are going to be used. The four smaller projects uh, uh, could be approved tonight. Thank you for your consideration. Good evening. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Is that any other public comment, Madam Clerk? Uh, we do not have any more public comments. All right. Then we'll close public comment on this and take it back to the board. I see Supervisor Sermon has his hand up. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so, uh, like I think some of the other offices uh, received in recent uh, days and weeks <clears throat> from the likes of uh, <clears throat> Clay and others involved with trying to minimize uh, as best they can the, the impact of the pandemic uh, relative to food insecurity, which I think uh, we all appreciate greatly and certainly applaud um, the ingenuity that's been applied to, um, to work swiftly to, to see that one of the most important aspects of uh, a crisis like this is making sure people don't literally starve. Um, when, when I hear um, uh, members of the culinary um, field and restaurant um, um, owners uh, say that it's, it's who you know when it comes to something as, port, as important as food security, I get very itchy. And um, it, it's not, you know, I don't know if it's the lateness of the hour or, or what, but um, it's very concerning. It's not, I'm not bringing this up to criticize Brenda. I'm, I'm bringing it up because it's a legitimate concern of mine that uh, tells me that uh, there's at least a perception out there that uh, somehow the process is more ad hoc than uh, it should be. Um, and so while I too am encouraged as others have mentioned about uh, the future prospect of funding insecurity uh, efforts. Um, granted, the, the amount of work that's gone into this first, uh, uh, you know, round of preliminary um, allocations, um, and kind of regardless of, um, and, and I say this respectfully, regardless of what community surveys tell us and everything else, um, I believe it still is this board's prerogative if we wanted to on the spot um, you know, declare that uh, food insecurity is of the utmost importance and does deserve to be immediately uh, addressed. Uh, and if, you know, if there's a good reason why we think that regardless of who's providing which services or applying which creative approach to it, um, it, it that it's, that it's somehow satisfying to us for the time being that people are getting fed and, and restaurant workers are uh, being taken care of, then great. But I don't know that I've heard that tonight. And it's not, again, it's not to, uh, to, to criticize our own staff, uh, but I, I, I want to feel comfortable at the end of this evening knowing that um, that angle of what um, has happened with much success, um, uh, you know, is going to happen um, quickly. Uh, no guarantees, I understand that. But um, I think what we have in front of us is we have a clear successful program um, who has 
been patient, who has certainly um, advocated um, strongly and clearly, respectfully with the, the members of this board, with staff over several days and weeks and months uh, to continue doing the great work that they've done. And, you know, I for one would like to see it um, continue without, um, uh, without a pause, without uh, there being a break. And I don't know if that's even too late at this at this point, but you know, having had um, seen some correspondence in, in the last week or two that um, tells me that uh, it was kind of on its last legs unless the county responded, um, I'd like to know um, specifically if we're not going to we're not going to have the the will as a board to to, to do it tonight. Um, I just don't want to push it off and say it's going to happen later. I'd like to know when it's going to happen. When is there going to be something that comes before us, regardless of whose program it is, that is addressing specifically food security and specifically addressing uh, the plight of our restaurant workers? Ann, you want to fill that? Yes, yeah, so I just making sure I was unmuted. Um, well, we can make a commitment to do that very quickly if that's the will of the board. Um, it, we can work on a, an, R, an RFP process to address uh, food insecurity, and um, I, I would have to check in with staff on how quickly we could get that out. Uh, those things do take uh, some time, but um, we could certainly do that, um, tackle it starting tomorrow. Okay, when is our next uh, board meeting, Flo? 25th. Our next so board? Two weeks. Yeah, on the 25th. Okay. Um, could we have something, um, I assume then uh, by the 25th, if not, to, if we don't act tonight? Uh, when you say have something, what do you mean by that? We, we would not have, have an RFP completed in two weeks, but, okay. but we could certainly bring forth a, uh, a plan or what we're proposing to put in an RFP. So what? <laughs> So what is the what is the outside date then of the what is the soonest I guess and that you think you could go through this RFP process and get something back before the board? Well, that generally takes six weeks. So yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the I mean it's again not a reflection on you, not a reflection on your staff. It's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, that that's yeah, not we we could go. Yeah, it's we just not go back and look at. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ed. We could go back and look at all of the we I believe we have a number of proposals um, in the queue related to food insecurity and we could certainly go. I mean, I, I would have to check in with Amanda staff and, and Damon staff around the um, The appropriateness based on Treasury rules on you know just moving forward with a project but we do have a number of projects related to food insecurity that we could pull back out look at and see if there's something we could do very quickly okay i you know w without calling for a, a you know a, a vote tonight because i'm not sure the votes would be there but maybe they would uh but if, if that's not likely and we can't do it based on treasury rules because we didn't go through a certain process understood but i'd like to see us even if we need to have a special meeting on this i think it's that important um i'd like us to see us work at hyper speed um in the coming days and hopefully not weeks uh to get something accomplished on the food security front and i'm not i'm not and i say that without identifying favorites without identifying friends who are in the restaurant business. Um, I think, Ann, you, you and your staff are well aware of all the various options out there in terms of uh, food security, but um, that's kind of been a, a missing theme to tonight, which I didn't hear a lot about. Um, and, and it's, again, there's so many different things that we have to be responsive to when it comes to this pandemic. Um, I know we have to kind of bite off small chunks of time that we can that we can swallow, but no pun intended. The, but food security is is just something that is up there with oxygen and water and shelter. 
So um, I don't know how other board members feel, but I'd like us to really step on the gas on this one. Bill, um, as Supervisor Frost, I'm certainly I can wait to it. Sue, go ahead. I just wanted to say that in regard to the food insecurity, I think it, it's sensitive because there were a lot of companies involved in the program that we had and then it we had to shrink it down and some got left out. And I think it's really important to try to find, to, to carefully work through um, identifying a program that can include as many of the restaurants as possible that want to be part of that program. Um, you know, I, I think the food insecurity is important and the restaurants are important. So I just think it's important not to rush it to the point where it might not be as good as it could have been. That's all. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. I, I would just, thanks to, I, I would just say, Phil, I think there is urgency to this again, you know, how we only decide uh, how we might allocate resources to either support efforts that have already proven their uh, viability and or our new efforts. I mean, there's a lot of components beyond just food preparation and delivery there. You know, I, I think there's a general awareness we're talking about and I read the reference to the comments, but we've seen, you know, local farmers, it's the focus, you know, the folks that work in the industry, it's the, the recipients and whether they be uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, and or seniors, or, you know, there's just a, a lot of components here. Some are more urgent than others though. And I um, I know that I certainly have had conversation with Anne. I've asked her about where we were and understood what she said early in the evening that it wasn't a part of this package. But I think to your point, um, is certainly as we're still in the midst of this pandemic in this fourth surge and folks are, you know, struggling with, the, you know, what they're seeing in the marketplace as it relates to cost of food and um, you know we've patched a lot of things together we've learned some things and again I certainly want to commend our staff I know that you know Bruce and others have been on the front lines of this but um, I, um, I, I, do, I do think that it warrants our attention and focus and again if it means us making some other decisions about the you know additional direction regarding dollar allocation and or processes I would like to see us do it sooner rather than later and you know, again, not with any particular favorites uh, in this. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of providers, and I think Sue makes a good point as well that they're, you know, this is a big county, and there's a lot of need. But you know, how can we, uh, you know, best address at least some of that need in a way that's fair but also timely? So I would I would concur with, the, with your thoughts about trying to get something before as quickly. So. So why don't you uh, let. Uh, myself and staff uh, work on this and bring something to you in, uh, at the next meeting on the 25th. We'll look at the proposals we have. We'll look at what we can do as quickly as possible um, and, and bring something to you. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what that will be, but we will put our heads together and work fast <laughs> and serious to uh, figure something out on how to address the food insecurity. And to Phil's, yep. Phil's point, just I say we may need a special meeting because uh, earlier this, this afternoon I heard that that agenda was worse than the one we had today. So we've already been at this 12 hours. So if we need to have an opportunity to set aside either a Wednesday session or whatever, working with board member schedules, just so you don't get, because again, it might be something that requires a lot of, you know, a, a lot of input. So anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Phil. No, you beat me, you beat me to the punch on stressing <laughs> the, the import and uh, at least. For, I guess it sounds like 40% of the board here that's willing to <laughs> uh, go for a special meeting, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's that important and I, you know, I won't beat this dead horse any further, but I appreciate the response, Ann. Okay, Sue. I just wanted to say thank you to all the staff for the thoughtful proposal that you put forward. I know there was a lot of work that went into it and it, I'm excited that we're getting a good start. Rich, Patrick, anything else you wanted to weigh in on? Well, I'll just I'll just tag on with Supervisor Cerna yeah. and you, Chairman Tolley. I agree with the, the food security insecurity discussion, and and also as part of that discussion, scoping what the problem is and how hmm. size and scope of the problem and and the different approaches. Um, so I, I absolutely agree, and and, and am absolutely supportive of if need be having an, uh, a separate meeting just for that. 
And Patrick. I'm on board with that as well. All right. <clears throat> so any other thoughts or comments? We have the recommendation before us to act on it. I think we've got different direction. And thank you, Ann, for being responsive on this. I know it's going to require some additional work uh, in a quick amount of time. But then if there's nothing further than we do. Uh, we have an actionable item here this evening. So do I have a motion on the? Second. I move and second in to approve staff recommendation with further direction to come back uh, uh, on the discussion about uh, food security and uh, related uh, uh, items uh, at the uh, next meeting. And uh, with that, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. I need some clarity because we had yeah. a lot of discussion about the chambers and the PBID. And um, are you making a motion or is it thought to make a motion to approve as staff recommended or did you want some modifications um, on the chambers and the P bids? I just want to make sure I'm understanding your direction. Mr. Chair, as the yes. as the maker of the mo or uh, yeah as the, the yeah. Uh, motion maker. Uh, I want to be respectful to the concerns that um, especially Supervisor Kennedy's expressed uh, um, regarding the geography of various pea beds that do stretch between unincorporated and, and uh, incorporated areas. And uh, also, I think uh, to Supervisor Desmond's uh, earliest uh, points about just making sure that, you know, we're, we're being equitable about it. And this is coming from someone that represents a very small portion of the unincorporated area. So, but I think it's, I think, I think that has to be part of the, the understanding with the motion uh, for our staff that um, we need, I think we need some clarity on that. What about the chambers, Phil? Yeah, sure. um, chambers of Commerce. Yeah, and I, well, I think that the same could be said for, uh, for the chambers in terms of um, seeing, you know, understanding a little bit clearer, at least, um, from the discussion I heard about uh, uh, what is what's e equitable in terms of where the um, you know which size of businesses are being uh, served uh, through which chambers and based on kind of their service shed, if you will, uh, geographically, I think that that needs to be um, clear. Uh, at least that's my judgment from what I heard, not being a huge part of that part of the conversation. Does that help, Ann? That's make the motion, or do you want further direction? Um, I don't, Troy, does that is that clear to you? I'm a little unclear, but it might be because it's late and. Uh, no, I, I I think if I understood the original remarks, um, that my interpretation was that there was an interest in peeling back support for any of the PBIDs and there was interest in looking at making it equitable and equal across the board, uh, particularly for those uh, entities, if I understood Supervisor Kennedy's direction or request was to fund those that were split amongst those between the cities and the counties. Okay. So I interpreted that as a request to fully fund those that were split between the cities and the counties. Um, and I'm, I am also lacking a little clarity on the others, uh, to your point, Ann. Yeah, so I guess, let me, let me just make it. So if you to fully fund all of the chambers, which is not what we propose, but to do that, we would need, an, to, it would be an additional $250,000. And to fully fund the, the two P bids that Supervisor Kennedy was talking about would be an additional $150,000. If you wish to fund all P bids, it would be an additional $650,000. And I would offer up one clarification on that. That was all chambers. Okay. So we've talked about P bids and chambers here. Oh, so all of it together. That's so the P bid component of that. It depends on whether the board would be advocating uh, just those in district two that are split between the city and the county or all P bids. And then on the chamber component, if we were going to fund the chamber component piece of that to the same amount uh, city, regardless of jurisdiction, that would be an additional 650. 650. 
You had 13 at two, 325, you only had- So on the chambers, Supervisor Natoli, there are 23 chambers. Right, and you're funding 13 of them. At 325, how do you get to 600,000? 600, to fund all, to fund all 23, it would be, excuse me, I'm sorry, I, my math was fuzzy. To fund all 23, it would be 575 at the full mark. But you were going to parse that. You're going to take, take a look at that. That was the part, the part of the question. I need to take right. a look at it. So maybe come back on the 25th with that then. I don't know. I'm, uh, a bunch of hands here. Uh, Supervisor Desmond, Kennedy, Frost. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I, I just want to go on record to, to say that I, I hope that this change doesn't result in the PBIDs or chambers that are, are exclusively located in the unincorporated area from getting a, a smaller apportionment. And I also, I mean, it just it just appears to me, just in the interest of interest of equity, I thought the discussion was around when we when we talked about the parsing, Troy, you would look at, for instance, if there's a um, a PBIT or a chamber in a city, it, it, it is part of the city's ARPA plans to to also fund those those business interests. Um, in which case they wouldn't be relying on us, right? I mean, it was kind of in the context of what's going on in IELTS. Right. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking that you would, it would be it would part of the part of, and, and same with the P bits, for instance, if they're formed and administered by the city of Sacramento and the city's going to be providing support to those P bids, maybe there's an apportionment or something. I don't know what Supervisor Kennedy's thoughts were, but that, that's just what I was thinking. Yeah, I, the, the only not the only nuance to that is um, uh, the unique circumstance of like a, a river district where you have that. Um, uh, project uh, turnkey um, hotel and you know there's an argument can be made and has been made that uh, there have been some unique challenges there that uh, are somewhat county involved right and and that was a specific ask yeah. from the city and partnership yeah no I, I agree with you okay um, Patrick and then Sue yeah Thank you, Chair. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, agree with uh, Supervisor Desmond, um, and that's, I think I'm going to agree with you. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, it, in those P bids that are, well, the specific ones in District 2 that are city and county, if the city is already contributing some of their funds, we can augment it and don't necessarily have to carry the full fare ourselves. But but I do think that they should get, you know, something. Okay. I, I believe I understand the direction. Um, it would require us to wait and coordinate with the city to yes. understand what their funding priorities are, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yes. Uh, and we have, uh, if that's the motion, we can certainly follow through on that direction. Um, okay. If I'm tracking all of that, the city of Ialton, who does not have a, an ARPA designated uh, component to this, it sounds like Supervisor Natoli was advocating that re they receive a full uh, funding allocation. If well, I it, that correctly, I yeah, just want to make sure I'm understanding. Yeah, I, again, but but uh, you know, what would they do with the money? It needs to be qualifying too. So you know, maybe, absolutely. Yeah, if there would be a template for uh, qualified expenses and so forth. Right. And, and, and if I could, just real quick, I know Supervisor Frost is up, but I would just say that you could reach out to City of Gall. Did the City of Gall, the ARPA monies, did they fund their chamber? And if so, did it include businesses that are outside the city limits? I don't know. I mean, those are, I mean, they're simple calls. I don't know if they're easy to parse out on paper, but um, that's what I was suggesting. And I think to what, Pat, what Patrick and Phil and Rich have all said that, you know, it might require a little bit of finessing. Again, we want to be careful with our dollars, but I think be supportive where we can, where there is that either overlap and or, um, you know, a, a, a realistic expectation that they're providing some service either in the unincorporated area or to folks that uh, are doing business, uh, you know, maybe dually, but a part of those chambers and or PBEDs. So I, I believe I've, I have some clarity on that now and it will, we will be coordinating. And I, sent, I sense a matrix in our future. Yes. <laughs> Been looking at it all day long here. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think I have some clarity on whether we'd be augmenting to get up to a full component, uh, a full funding component, if uh, various jurisdictions within the county, incorporated cities, 
who are participating through their ARPA process. And then we would be augmenting that uh, to get parity across the board, the, the, the goal to get parity across the board, if I'm understanding it correctly. So we'll be coordinating and doing that outreach. I think I understand that. Thanks, Troy. Okay, very good. Sue? And then we're probably, and Amanda, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're probably going to have to come back unless you're ready to bank a recommendation to us this evening about um, which bucket of money this comes from. We have fully allocated the uh, economic recovery allocation uh, that you approved some months ago. Uh, so we would need some direction from you on where I mean, there's plenty of money. I'm not suggesting there's a problem there, but we would want your direction as to where that would come from. Yes, Anna, I agree. I think we, we just for accounting purposes need to know where that's coming from. Yeah. And we don't have to do that this evening. If you would like, we can come back and make a recommendation to you on where that would come from. And, and we can do that uh, on the 25th. Yes. So that's the motion is to compartmentalize that portion for the 25th. Okay. Motion is second, but Supervisor Frost, you still had a hand up. No, I, uh, Supervisor Kennedy made the point that I was gonna make. So I withdrew my um, raised hand. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Uh, so uh, I want to make sure that um, I want to make sure that the clerk understands what the motion is, and I want to make sure that I understand it as well. Um, because we're going to come back on the 25th, hopefully we'll have time to work with all the cities before then um, on the chambers and PBEDs that are not weren't included in our initial recommendation. Um, so. Is it acceptable to have the motion be to approve what we have put before you today, and then we'll come back on the 25th, hopefully, to address the other chambers and P bids and where that funding will come from, just so that the motion is really clean. Correct. Okay. Flo, does that make sense to you? Do you? Yes, do you have it that? does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's the motion in the second, and then we'll also come back on the whole nutrition piece, and then. Yeah. All right. Um, anything further, Ann? Is that everything's clear on the motion? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. So here we go. All right. If there's nothing further, uh, Flo, Flo, you've got the motion, and we're going to go ahead and call for the vote. Okay. It's uh, Supervisors Frost. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Desmond. Aye. Cerna. Aye. Natoli. Aye. And that's a unanimous vote. And I just want to double check that that was a motion by Sue, uh, excuse me, by Supervisor Cerna and seconded by Supervisor Frost. Correct. Thank you. Okay. All right. Got through 60 items so far. We still got 61. So <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thanks to all of our staff that stayed with us. Uh, certainly, Ann, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of presenters and a lot of work that went into it. Thank you for our callers as well. I know that SAC Act wrote a letter and certainly heard from both Mr. Nutting and uh, Brenda Ruiz uh, and other organizations that weighed in. So, um, you know, moving, moving forward. All right. Um, that brings us to nominations and uh, both our ranks. We can do that this evening if people still have enough gas in the tank or we can, I guess, could potentially hold that over, but um, you want to do it? Okay, let's, let's, let's do it, Flo. Okay, so for I, item 61, this is your own ranks appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, you did receive a memorandum that does uh, outline the action that is required. Um, I'm going to be referring to your spreadsheet and everything that's highlighted in yellow. The first Board is the Adult and Aging Commission. Um, this is a chair or chair designee appointment. So um, previously it was with District 4 and they made an appointment. And so now that it's with your office, Supervisor Natoli, um, I'll let you can, can, I, can I designate the vice chair to do this? <laughs> Rich, are you paying attention? <laughs> I'm happy to, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We could hold it over. I think we've actually had folks in the past. So again, um, it's um, 
again, we don't because of the lateness of the hour. I don't want to make any jest of this. So if you if you wanted to look at that, we can we can we can bring that one back and let let Supervisor Desmond because um, uh, of ex officio, and I know they do meet uh, regularly, but it might be that you know there may be a staff person that was. Who had been doing it this past year, Flo? So it, before it was with District 4, so it was one of District oh, 4. Right, Vance Vance so it needs to either be your district or... or okay. Because that person will be sitting in there until you guys make the appointment. All right, all right. We, well, Vance is there, and I can talk with Rebecca in my office uh, in all seriousness of Budget Desmond. So if you'd be interested as a member... Oh, I'm interested. No, I, actually, I'm actually am interested in that. Okay, all right. So we'll we'll hold that over until the 25th, uh, Flo, come back and then... Do, are we holding all of the appointments, uh, no. or, do, or just uh, adult and aging? Okay. Adult and aging, unless he's interested, but let, let him find out what's involved there if he'd like. Under, and, okay. Understood. All right, area four. So then, area for agency on aging uh, for the governing board. Um, the these are one-year appointments, so I just need to know uh, from each district. Supervisor Cerna, are you reappointing? Maxine Krugman, my vision is literally departing from me right now. Uh, to my knowledge, I am. <laughs> okay, and then Supervisor Kennedy, Miko Sawamura is in there right now. Reappoint. Thank you. Uh, and then Supervisor Desmond, uh, you have a Carl Burton sitting in that uh, seat as the alternate. Good point. Thank you. And Supervisor Frost, do you currently have Felicia Bay or B? Oh, I'm not sure about Felicia Bay, and I do not have notes on this. I, I'm sorry. We can hold it over, hold that over till the 25th, and then you can talk uh, about uh, I'm not sure about uh, Felicia. Point of, point of order through the chair. Sure. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Flo, but I thought in years past, maybe Don, you know this. Yeah. I thought we kind of gravitate towards where we see vacancies on this chart. And so we don't have to go through each. Right. No, we name, actually right? go, if the terms are expired in a year, then we go through them at this time every year. So if it's highlighted in yellow, there is some action that needs to be required either because the term expired or it just changes because it's designated by the chair or the chair designee is right. it is it possible to do this at our next meeting so that we have a little bit more time on this sure yeah. there'd be more preferences if there's yeah. fine but i asked earlier so if you want to hold this till the 25th we can come back and go through this um i would like to but i don't know how everyone else feels no the hour's late i'm with me yeah Okay, all right, so Flo, we'll stop with that and uh, we'll come back to this uh, on the 25th. Okay, can I have a motion in a second, please? I'll move to continue it to the next meeting. Second. Okay. Seconded. All right, no uh, further comments. Uh, call the roll, please. Uh, Supervisor Frost? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Desmond? Aye. Cerna? Aye. Natoli? Aye. And uh, unanimous vote. This is continued to uh, January 25th. And then the next item is item 62, which is your uh, nominations. You're continuing to February 8th, the County Planning Commission, Delta Citizens Municipal Advisory Council to February 15th, Adult and Aging Commission, Area for Agency on Aging Advisory Council, Civil Service Commission, Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Casonas Area Community Planning Advisory Council, Disability Advisory Commission, Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee, Human Services Coordinating Council, Natomas Community Planning Advisory Council, Sacramento County Employees Retirement Board, Sacramento County Treasury Oversight Committee, and the Veterans Advisory Commission. For your matters today, Arden Arcade Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Desmond. February 15th, please. Thank you. California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, Chief staff recommend holding this to January 25th. Thank you. Carmichael Old Hill, Old Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Desmond. Continue to January 25th, please. And Supervisor Frost.
Sue, did you have any nominations for? Sorry, Sorry I was muted. Continue to February 15, please. Thank you. Community Review Commission, Supervisor Frost. Nominate Thomas Scott, please. Thank you. And you have uh, another seat, so what do you, would you like to continue the balance or the remaining? Yes, I guess so. Uh, would you like February 8th or February 15th? 15. Okay, thank you. Likewise, District 5 would continue February 15th. Thank you. And County Service Area 4B, Slough House, Wilton, Kasumnis, uh, Supervisor Frost. Continue to February 15, please. Thank you. And Supervisor Natoli. Yes, I would uh, nominate the incumbent, Gary Soto, for reappointment, and uh, also uh, nominate uh, uh, Patsy Nimitz, N E M E T Z. And continue the remainder? Yes. To what day? Uh, February 15th, please. Thank you. Developmental Disabilities Planning Advisory Council. Chief Stag recommend reappointing Patty Pacheco and then continue remainder to February 15th. Thank you. Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Advisory Board. Chief Staff recommend continue this to February the 8th, please. Thank you. Mission Oaks Recreation and Park District, Supervisor Desmond. Please continue to January 25th. Thank you. Uh, North Highlands Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Cerna. February 20th, uh, sorry, February 15th, please. Thank you. And Supervisor Desmond. February 15th, please. Thank you. Public Health Advisory Board. Recognition is to nominate to Bakalu Amare and then continue the remainder to February the 15th. Thank you. Sacramento County Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board. Okay, recommendations are to nominate Maria Padiga Castro as the public representative and reappoint uh, Paul Tanner as the technical representative and to also nominate Alexis Sanchez as the technical representative. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Sacramento County Mental Health Board. Supervisor uh, Cerna. Yeah, I'd like to reappoint uh, Maria Pedillo Castro and thank her for her continued service. Thank you. Okay, and then the last one is um, Vineyard Area Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Kennedy. Please continue to February 15th. Yes, and Supervisor um, Chairperson Natoli. Yeah, I would hold mine to uh, January 25th, please. January 25th, okay, got it. We have two, two um, applicants, I just, we just need to complete the interviews, I believe, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, that concludes your nominations and your next item is um, county executive comments. Okay, Ms. Okay. Edwards, you've been waiting all day for these. Go ahead, yeah. It's been a day, um, and I know it's late, but I just want to take a moment to thank um, Flo, and all the clerk staff and the DTEC staff and the SAC Metro Cable staff who made this meeting happen today. It um, was fairly short notice and they pulled this off well. We didn't have any glitches, which is um, pretty amazing. So um, thank you to all of them. Thank you. Okay. And then your next item would be your Board of Supervisors comments, reports, and announcements. Okay, everybody signed up, ready to go? <laughs> no, nobody's rushing to the floor. Let me pull out my 15 page script there. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Desmond has a hand up though. It shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. Very um, good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, quickly, you know, it's something I just wanna bring, I know it's late and I hate, hate to do this, but I just wanna bring it up. I, right now, I know we're, we're evaluating a lot of different sites to get more capacity online for, shelters and safe safe uh, uh, camping spaces and, and, and other places for immediate help for folks who are unsheltered on our, our streets and open spaces right now. I know looking at a place in District 2, a couple of places in my district, one on the border between District 3 and 4 and, and, and some in the city of Sacramento, um, it's frustrating to me that, that some of these things take a, a long time, Anne, and I, I've, I've expressed this to you multiple times 
Um, I think we're losing, certainly losing opportunities to help the homeless, especially the most vulnerable um, because of some of these delays. Um, I also understand that just, you know, county bureaucracy sometimes moves very slowly, but I just wanted to bring it up in, in public session here and express um, my desire that maybe we look at ways we can be doing this better and, and doing it quicker so we can not only take advantage of these opportunities as they come up, sometimes from private property owners, but to help people quicker. Um, we are, as you know, in such a huge acute crisis right now, and uh, I'd, I'd certainly welcome any innovative ideas, even uh, engaging more with maybe the private sector to help. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. And yes, we have talked about that and uh, Mr. Wagstaff and I have been talking about it and we are certainly looking at ways to uh, move this along more quickly. It's, um, there are a lot of moving parts to it, but um, I hear you loud and clear. It is an emergency. Thank you. Thanks so much, Devin. Okay, Bill, 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to um, add to that, that um, when, when and if we do hear something back in the not too uh, distant future about how to do it better as uh, Supervisor Desmond, I think rightfully points out, um, I would just respectfully ask uh, Ann and Bruce and everyone else, be super, super forthright and candid uh, with us about what it is you need. Um, I don't think there's any of us that expect, you know, any aspect of county service delivery in the middle of a pandemic, um, especially after almost two years of it, uh, to go out and pull off miracles without a really honest um, understanding between the board and executive staff about uh, what resources, whether they be human or, you know, budgetary, whatever it is. Um, this is the time to kind of, you know, just be um, very, very candid with us. And even if it, you know, it gets uh, met with some white eyes on occasion, um, uh, we, we can't expect you to uh, be magicians. Uh, I think we can only expect you to be, you know, the humans that you are and um, as dedicated as you are. I know sometimes it gets frustrating that uh, you hear from us uh, as a collective board and individual board members, you know, saying do more. Um, but the the whole the old adage of, you know, continue to do more with less, I think has been exhausted. So we just need to know what you need. Will do, thank you. Okay, any other comments? Uh, if not, then I'd bring just to the close of a fairly lengthy day. And I wanna thank my colleagues for their patience. Uh, you, you might have voted for a different chair if you'd known what we got into the rest of the day. But at any rate, uh, thank you for uh, bearing with it. And uh, thank you, Ann, to all our staff. Flo, very much appreciated. And uh, you've uh, kept things going, you and DTEC and Cable 14 and all of your staff. So kudos to all. With that, everyone have a safe drive home um, and uh, sleep in for an extra few minutes tomorrow morning. To, uh, you earned it all. So take care. Thank you. And we'll be back. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Urgent. <laughs>